Marrying the Star Written by Bree Livingston Copyright 2018 Chapter 1 Callie Chapman pulled her car to a stop in the Country Music Weekly's underground parking garage. Her editor, Gil Spracker, had called at dawn Monday morning to tell her there was an emergency and she needed to meet him at his office. She pushed out of the car and locked it before walking to the elevator. Once inside, she let herself hope that Gil had something special for her. Oh, man, she said as her gaze dipped to the two different colored shoes she wore. Maybe Gil wouldn't notice. Or if he did, hopefully he'd suck it up. After all, he was the one who told her to hurry. And at 5 a.m. with no coffee, mismatched shoes should be a given. As soon as the door slid open, she strode down the hall until she came to Gil's office, where she heard him on the phone. He held up a finger, halting her before she could enter. Who could he be talking to this early in the morning? Holding the man's gaze, she tried to understand the conversation, but nothing gave her a clue as to who he was speaking to or what he was discussing. Hey, Callie, Gil said, finally putting the phone down. She looked up. Hey. What was the big rush to get down here? Oh, you aren't going to believe this, but I've got you an in with the most difficult to interview country singer to hit the scene in years. Uh, okay. Great. Difficult didn't necessarily translate to a great article, just a lot of magazines sold which Callie loved. But no one knew it was her, so it made for a bittersweet victory when her articles went viral. Still, this could give her the ammunition she needed to tell her mom she wasn't a CPA. She was tired of the charade. It was one thing to be single, but it was another to be single and working for a tiny no-name accounting firm. A firm that didn't exist. Gil steepled his fingers in front of his mouth. What do you know of Tucker Hawk? Tucker Hawk? Ha. Huh. Like everyone in her circle didn't know she was his biggest fan. She'd loved him ever since hearing him sing six years ago in Nashville during her last year at Vanderbilt. The first weekend back after summer break, she and a few friends had ducked into a little club called Tax and Song. Tucker was there performing, and from that moment on, it had been love at first melodious note. A smile spread on her lips as she remembered following him around, cheering him on. She'd been twenty, and he'd been twenty-four. It felt like forever ago. They dated briefly at the end and even shared a few kisses. But he was focused on his career, so their actual dates had been spotty. It had taken no time for her to fall for him. But fame had called, and they'd gone their separate ways, both agreeing it was for the best. Of course, she didn't tell him how hurt she was, because she knew how much singing meant to him and didn't want to stand in the way of his career. She wasn't mad at him, not even now, but she had spent a lot of time wondering what would have happened if things had been different. No way was she telling Gil that. He'd wield that information like a sword. Besides, she wasn't even sure Tucker would remember her. It was a long time ago, and a lot had changed since then. Most likely, he wouldn't even remember her. She'd never been able to forget him, though. Um, just that he's had it pretty hard recently. That was an understatement. In the past year, Tucker Hawk's clean-cut, all-American image had taken a huge hit. His nasty public breakup with his girlfriend, Petra, and subsequent spiral had been the focus of more than just a few of the country's gossip magazines. Everyone was desperate for the inside scoop as to what had really happened between him and the up-and-coming model. It had been completely out of character for him, and Callie kept her knowledge of the situation limited. She hated seeing him hurt. What if I told you I could get you an exclusive with Tucker, but you'd have to keep it hush-hush? Her brain froze. Another chance to see Tucker? She chew used gum if it meant FaceTime with him. Not that she still cared about him that way, but as a reporter, he'd be a great subject. Uh, well, I'd say sign me up. Gil smiled. That's my star reporter. Callie narrowed her eyes. Her weird o meter was hitting a million. Okay, 
But you know I'm leaving the day after tomorrow for my sister's wedding. It'll have to be after that. If she missed George's wedding, Callie wouldn't have to worry about exclusives or anything else because her mom would kill her. Didn't I hear you say you needed a date for that? Seriously? She didn't remember telling Gil that. How did he find out? More than likely he'd caught her on the phone with her mom. Not that it'd be hard to figure out there was a wedding and she was dateless. And what does that have to do with an interview with Tucker Hawk? Gil stood and walked around his desk to perch on the corner facing her. She'd seen this look before. It usually meant he had something up his sleeve. Fantastic. She took a deep breath, waiting for the bomb to drop. My best friend, Derek Underwood, is the president of Tucker's music label, Reckless Records. They're working on a plan to polish Tucker's image that includes him getting married, Gil said. Married? I didn't even know he was dating anyone. Why did it feel like her lungs were suddenly lacking oxygen? According to Derek, he's not. Gil's lips twitched into a wider smile. It took her brain a second to catch up, and her eyes widened. A fake marriage? Gil nodded but didn't speak. Almost as though he was afraid someone would overhear. Okay, and what do they want from me? First, does your family still believe you're a CPA? Yeah, why? Gil knew that. It's why she used a pen name to publish her articles. Good. You'll need to keep it that way. Callie crossed her arms over her chest. What's going on, Gil? We thought maybe you'd be an excellent candidate to be his wife. Hold the phone. His wall wife? I'm sorry, what? Callie asked, blinking. She could see Gil's lips moving, but the words were making no sense. Tucker is on board, if that's what has you worried. He is? Yeah, he's all on board. Only, you can't tell him you're a reporter. Her mouth dropped open as she tried to get her brain up to speed. What do you mean? He's avoided all media this past year. Well, as much as a someone fall down drunk can. Anyway, Derek said we could get exclusives over the next year, and I know how much you've wanted to come clean to your mom. With a story like this, she'd have to see how great a reporter you are. No more fake CPA office. Only, we can't tell anyone the marriage is fake. They've even been working up a story the past few days, and everything is already set to go. They just need a wife. That's where you come in. Faking a marriage? Callie shook her head. No. No way. I won't do it. They're offering a $500,000 incentive. Like she needed the money? The only reason she had kept her writing career from her mom was because, well, there wasn't a great reason other than Callie didn't want to disappoint her mom. Plus, she liked being anonymous. Another reason not to marry Tucker. There isn't enough money for me to do that. She shook her head. Gil shrugged and straightened, walking to his chair and picking up the phone. I guess I'll just call Derek. He's got Petra on standby if they can't find someone else. Callie held in a gasp. That woman? According to Callie's sources, Petra Veslovsky had used Tucker to further her own modeling career by leaking information about Tucker's family to the tabloids. Things about his mom's illness and other little intimate details that shouldn't have been leaked. She couldn't let Petra near him again. Wait. She sighed. Gil, still holding the phone, paused as his finger hovered over the buttons. Yes? They're going to do this no matter what. He snorted. Oh yeah, he said, still holding the phone. And Tucker is willing to do it? He nodded. Yeah, but you can't, and I mean this, you can't tell him you're a reporter. The only way we're going to get to know the real him is to keep it from him. Callie scoffed. 
As soon as the press finds out Tucker Hawk is married to me, they'll start digging into me and my past. They'll find out who I am. Gil shook his head. Derek and I are working to bury it. Don't worry about that. Okay, but I want it in the contract that if Tucker finds out, and not from me, I won't be penalized. Man, she sure wished her dad could read the contract, but there was no way she'd let him know she was doing something so crazy. All right. I'll make sure it's in the contract, and throughout the year, you give the magazine juicy details about Tucker Hawk. Of course, being under your pen name, no one will ever know you're the insider. And if I don't? Gil's normally carefree, friendly demeanor disappeared. I'll out you as Jamie Pearson and make it my job to make sure you never work for another magazine. We'll sue you until you have nothing left. You'll be lucky if you get to keep your mismatched shoes. What should she do? There was no way she could write tell-all articles about Tucker without his knowledge, and she couldn't let Petra near him either. But if she wanted Gil to think she was trying, she was going to have to act like she was trying. What if Tucker doesn't reveal anything? asked Callie. He lifted an eyebrow. You're a reporter. Surely you can think of a way to entice a celebrity to dish something juicy. Callie exhaled sharply. I get that, but with as guarded as he's been, who's to say he'll ever warm up to me enough to spill anything? Besides, if I'm under pressure, I'll be putting pressure on him. He'll know something's up, and the whole thing will explode. That sounded convincing, right? Gil tapped his fingers against his leg. Fine, but I want regular check-ins. A text or something. Yeah, and he finds my phone and sees a text to my editor Gil? Great plan. It was quick thinking, and true. No better way of having a cover blown than that. He groaned. Why do you have to be so difficult? I'm not being difficult. I'm being cautious. All right. No texts, no calls. I'll set up a fake email. You can write it up and send it to that. Does that work? And no pressure? Callie asked mentally crossing her fingers. Could she help it if the difficult country music star didn't give her anything to report? No pressure. But you need to produce. I should see something no later than a couple of weeks. Even if there was no pressure to produce material, there was still the issue of having a fake relationship. How was she supposed to have a relationship with someone, fake or otherwise, and lie to them the whole time? Besides, she had her sister's wedding. It'll have to be after my sister's wedding. No, it happens tomorrow. You'll be flying into Vegas this afternoon, having a get-to-know-you date, and getting married tomorrow. Before my sister's wedding? No way. My mom will kill me. He held her gaze until the silence in the room became uncomfortable. Hold on. He picked up the phone and dialed a number. Hey, yeah, I think she's on board, only she wants it in the contract that if the press finds out she's Jamie Pearson, she won't be penalized. And she's got her sister's wedding. She doesn't want the press finding out before then. Gil spoke to whoever it was on the phone a few minutes longer and then hung up. He flicked his gaze to her and smiled. You'll get married tomorrow but they'll keep it under wraps until your sister's married. As soon as the ceremony is over, you'll fly to Los Angeles where Tucker lives, and they'll make the announcement. Where's your sister's wedding being held? Carolina Beach, North Carolina. It's my family's vacation home. While you're there, your apartment here will be packed up and moved into Tucker's home. Her eyes went wide. Move in with him? You'll be married to him, so yeah. Kaye's stomach flipped. This was a horrible, horrible plan. How long will I have to be married to him? A year, during which you'll secretly be sending the magazine articles about him. We want everything. All the details of his breakup with Petra, what really happened, seriously, everything. 
The world gets their exclusives on Tucker, and your bank account will be a half mil richer. Why, all of the sudden, did it seem like she'd become the lowest of the low? Even she thought she was gross. Paid to get married? No. I'm not going to do it for money. If money exchanges hands, then I want it to go to something else besides me. Gil's eyebrows darted into his hairline. You don't want the money? His eyes narrowed. Are you a Tucker Hawk fan? No and no. I just don't want the money. Send it to the NICU at the Wilmington's Children's Hospital. My niece Mary was a preemie, and the more money they have for equipment, the more babies they can save. I'm sure they won't care as long as you sign the contract. Callie stood and whirled around. This is beyond insane. Really? Like crazier things haven't happened? No, but it was the craziest thing she'd ever even thought about being a part of. I don't know, Gil. A relationship is hard enough. Pretending to have one, what word would adequately describe just how strange this whole plan sounded? Look, Callie, would you prefer someone marry him that doesn't care about him, or would you rather it be you? When he put it like that, she couldn't let someone hurt him like Petra did, but being fake married to him? This was a big deal, and not something to jump into. How long do I have to decide? Gil looked at his computer screen. Your flight leaves at 2. So, no time at all, really. No. They were afraid if they gave too much warning, someone would leak the details of what they were doing, and they can't afford to allow that happen. With one huge breath, Callie looked Gil in the eyes. Fine. I'll do it. Awesome. I'll tell Derek, and we'll get the contract together so you can sign it. In the meantime, go home and pack. Okay. And take something nice to wear to your dinner tonight. Energy pulsed through her, but she did her best to hide her excitement. Despite herself, butterflies fluttered in her stomach. No, she reminded herself. This was all fake. The Tucker she met tonight would be the world-famous singer. She didn't know that Tucker. Her Tucker was gone. That was the only way she was making it through a fake date and fake marriage with Tucker. Chapter 2 Tucker Hawk paced in his hotel room. In only a few short minutes, he would be meeting his future wife. When he begged for another chance, he never imagined he'd be forced to get married as a last-ditch effort to save his career. If only he hadn't let himself get into the situation in the first place. Relax, Tucker, said his manager, Stacy Goodman. It's all going to be fine. As soon as your marriage is official, you'll have your recording contract back and everything will fall into place. Besides, it's just for a year. When the year is up, it'll be over. His manager talked about marriage like it wasn't a huge deal. But in his family, it was a major life event. It was something you did once and committed yourself to. He could only imagine how disappointed his parents would be that he was about to go on a date with a woman he'd never met in the hopes of getting to know her well enough to fool the press into thinking they were madly in love. And he couldn't even tell them. When Derek had come up with the crazy scheme, he'd made Tucker sign a contract. If Tucker told anyone or said anything, Derek would come after him. Then, not only would he lose his recording contract, but he'd lose everything he'd ever worked for. Even Stacy signed a contract, which seemed odd, but as she put it, with so much on the line, Derek wanted to be extra cautious. I know, but marriage? Why marriage? What makes Derek think anyone will buy this? Especially since I've been so vocal about never being in a relationship again, Tucker said. Stacy had spent the last three months working to get Tucker back into the good graces of Reckless Records. What she didn't know is that when Derek approached Tucker, he'd been given an ultimatum either enter rehab, get married, or end up getting sued. And by sued, Derek was including Stacy. She knew about the ultimatum, but not that the equation involved her. Tucker couldn't let her pay for his bad decisions. 
She didn't deserve that. That's exactly why he thinks it'll help. If she was able to change her mind about marriage, she'd have been able to change her mind about other things, like drinking and women, and partying. It's the whole package. We need your good guy image back, and the public is a sucker for a love story. Yeah, a love story. Until they found out it was as fake as Petra's hair extensions. His ex-girlfriend was the phoniest person he'd ever met. Not that anyone knew the extent of her betrayal. Most of what the public knew was from her perspective because Tucker was unwilling to even talk to a reporter. Yeah, so Derek says. Tucker grimaced. Stacy stepped in front of Tucker, stopping him. Listen. I know this isn't ideal, but unless you want to reconsider rehab, this is your only option. Rehab. He snorted. He knew how strongly his family thought about marriage, but to Tucker, even a few months of rehab was too much for him. With a fake marriage, at least it was one person, and he didn't have to get close to them. No, I'm not reconsidering. I'm not sitting in a circle, discussing my feelings with a bunch of strangers. Maybe it would help. You haven't told anyone what happened. Not even me. I know something happened. Tuck. Petra leaked information and then claimed you cheated on her. You've never set the record straight. If you had, maybe you wouldn't be forced to do all this. What if you just came out and told everyone the truth instead? Right, and let everyone know what an idiot he was? Yeah, it might be easier, but he just couldn't do it. It went beyond Petra. He'd let himself down, his family, and his fans. Offering an explanation would only be giving himself an excuse for his behavior, and he wouldn't do that. After spending the last year making false promises to both the label and his fans, Tucker wasn't sure anyone would believe him even if he did explain it all. He shook his head. My chance to tell the truth is gone, and Derek doesn't care about the truth. He was pretty clear what my options were. Yeah, I know. But if you were honest, maybe he wouldn't need to. We both know that's not true. Once Derek has his mind set, there's no changing it. That was an understatement. Derek was known for being ruthless when it came to his artists. Although Tucker had never been in the man's bad graces, he'd heard rumors when he was first starting out. Now that he'd seen firsthand, Tucker wasn't about to test the man. Why do I feel so disgusting? This is all kinds of wrong. Paying someone to get married. If this does come out, my fans will never forgive me. I mean, I've already let them down. Stacy grabbed his hand. I know, and if I could have talked Derek into going a different route, I would have, but I couldn't. This was the only way he would even consider giving you another shot. Tucker sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose with his free hand. Yeah, I know. I just wish I could go back and change how I handled things. But you can't. You have to deal with the here and now, and this is reality. Tucker dropped his hand to his side and let out a slow breath. Oh, he knew. He just didn't like reality at the moment. What do you know about this woman? What's her name? Callie Chapman. Wait a minute. Callie Chapman? He briefly dated someone named Callie Chapman. There was no way it could be the same person. What were the odds that Derek would find the one woman his what if centered around? And if it was her? Why would she agree to do this? Would she be like everyone else and want to use him too? Do you have a picture? What does she do? Stacy shrugged. Nope, no picture. I just know what Derek's told me. She's 28, cute, and smart. She's an accountant. Her family is well-known and respected in Wilmington. An accountant? Yep, she's a CPA in Nashville. And she's not a model? That was a point on the pro side of the column from Tucker's perspective. Nope, 
she's just a regular woman. Derek seemed to think she was just average in the looks department, but he thought that would work in your favor. Your female fans will relate to the homely girl getting the famous singer. Homely? Great. But he didn't need to be attracted to the woman. It would make faking the relationship harder, but it'd be easier when it came time to walk away. Whatever. He tugged at his collar. Why didn't you just book her a room here at the Bellagio? That didn't seem like a good idea. The way Derek's team has the story going, she's an old friend who knew you before you hit it big. You've been hiding out in Vegas, and you just happened to run into each other there. The two of you struck up a conversation and sparks flew. An old friend? Could it possibly be his Callie? No. Derek said she was homely. That definitely didn't match up. And tomorrow we're getting married. You said she signed a contract? Yep, all done. She can't say a word to the press, and if she does, when we get done with her, she'll spend the rest of her life living under a bridge. He nodded as the gravity of the situation hit him. He'd never felt so empty in his life. Even after all the bad decisions, this was the lowest point he could picture. Paying someone to marry him and pretending to be in love with a stranger. And I have to go to her sister's wedding. I'm sorry, but Derek thought it was a good idea. That way when it comes out you're married, it'll seem like you went there to meet the family. It'll look less scripted. Tucker blew out a puff of air. Marrying a woman he didn't know and then being thrown into the middle of her family? Would rehab have been that bad? Should he call Derek and tell him he changed his mind? A vision floated to mind of people in bathrobes, sitting in a circle. He shivered. Nope, marriage would be just fine, just fine. He was definitely not changing his mind. Stacy tugged on his tie again, straightening it. At least it's on the beach. Maybe you can use the downtime to write a few new songs. The beach? He must have spaced the first time Stacy went over the details with him. A few days at the beach didn't sound horrible. Carolina Beach, North Carolina. Her family has a vacation home there. The rest you should probably talk to her about while you get to know her tonight. That's not so bad. Stacy grinned. See? Just focus on the positives. A fresh start for your career, a nice week of vacation, and then who knows? Everything's looking up for my favorite country music star. Yeah. I guess. So, why didn't he feel like things were looking up? And the restaurant is rented out? It'll just be me and Callie? Just you and Callie Chapman. Okay, he said and walked to the door, tugging on the collar of his dress shirt once more. As if that would help him breathe easier. He grimaced, thinking the whole situation felt like a noose. Stacy smiled as he cast her a glance over his shoulder. Try to have a good time, or at least act like it. I will. He opened the door and walked to the elevator, dread bubbling in his stomach. The last thing he wanted to do was pretend to have a relationship, but he didn't have a choice. When the doors to the elevator opened, Tucker stepped in and then let his mind wander further as the doors closed behind him. How had he let himself get into such a mess? He'd spent his entire life making the right choices. No drinking, no drugs, no women, and then he'd met Petra. She'd turned his life upside down with just a smile. From that moment on, he was on the path of no return at a rate of speed that would put the bullet train to shame. He loathed the fact that he'd allowed himself to be led into a sordid lifestyle. But, no, he knew he couldn't blame everything on her. His drinking and partying, they weren't her fault. Sure she'd encouraged him at first, but he'd embraced it willingly. The press only had bits and pieces of the full story. They didn't know how she lied about his cheating to cover for the fact that she leaked sensitive information to the press about his mom. What was worse was that was that all of it had been a lie. From the very beginning, Petra had played him, and he'd never seen it coming. 
With a faint swish, the elevator doors slid open as Tucker stuffed his errant thoughts down as far as he could stomach. The last thing he needed was to carry his heart on his sleeve while meeting his future wife. Besides, the best thing for him was to have it behind a wall so thick and tall that nothing or no one could get close. Tucker slid inside the limo and rested his head against the back of the seat as the lights down the strip blurred in his peripheral vision. Although it didn't take long to make the mile-long trip from the Bellagio to the Luxor, it had given Tucker the time he needed to put everything in perspective and ready himself for his date with an unknown destiny. He was going to play along and be a gentleman, just to keep Derek from suing Stacy. Once the year was up, he and his wife would go their separate ways. Chapter 3 Deep Breaths, Girl Deep breaths, Callie said as she turned one way then the other, checking her strapless pale blue dress in the mirror for the hundredth time. Any minute, Tucker Hawk would be knocking on her door, and her nerves were as frayed as they'd ever been. Her crazy Monday began too early. Starting with agreeing to marry Tucker in the first place, then reading through a series of contracts that seemed like the fate of the nation rested on her shoulders, and then flying into Vegas for a date with a man she'd be marrying the next day. What kind of person marries someone they she almost said didn't know, but she did know Tucker, and the butterflies in her stomach wouldn't let her forget it. Her reflection stared her down as if she should know the answer. This is all kinds of weird and wrong and wild. She pinched the bridge of her nose and took a deep breath, trying to calm herself. A small knock came from the door, startling her. Her hand flew to her chest where she could tell her already jackhammering heart had sped up, making everything hurt. Okay, girlfriend. It's just a date. No spinach, no beans, and no funny business. This is just a mutually beneficial arrangement. She walked to the door and slowly turned the handle. All rationale went floating out of her ears when she saw him. Tucker Hawk was even more gorgeous than she remembered. Tall, way taller than her, with olive skin and dark hair that curled around his ears and rested on his shirt collar. His eyes. She could never forget those eyes. They were the bluest eyes she'd ever seen. Hi. The word rushed out softly. His lips twitched up in a half-smile, the kind she'd not been shy about loving. For a split second, she thought she saw recognition in his eyes, but just as quickly, it was gone. Hi. Are you ready? He asked in that voice that made her insides feel like goo. How on earth was she going to keep it together for the next year? Uh, why was she so disappointed that he didn't remember her? It wasn't like she'd expected it. Yeah, I'm ready. Let me grab my purse. Why couldn't she stop her voice from sounding so breathy? He smiled, and the rest of her nearly puddled in her heels. Okay, he said, holding her gaze. Purse. She needed her purse. Dragging her gaze away, she hurried for the far corner of her table to retrieve her clutch. With her back to him, she pressed her palm to her stomach and deeply inhaled. She needed to find her footing, or she'd look like a complete idiot. That is, if she didn't already. She squeezed her eyes shut and steadied her breathing while giving herself a mental pep talk. He didn't remember her and had no interest in her whatsoever. This was all fake. His record label had set it all up, and he was just playing along because he needed his image fixed. As long as she remembered that, she'd be okay. When she finally turned around, okay seemed to be flung out the window. Was he always so broad-shouldered? Had his arms always looked that huge? She didn't remember him being so solid all those years ago. Good grief. Her grip needed some gorilla glue. Already, she said as she walked back to the door. Thanks for picking me up. No problem. He held out an arm to usher her out the door. As she slipped her hand into the crook of his arm, tingles erupted and ran the length of her body. The warmth of his nearness nearly made her trip as they walked to the elevator and stepped in. When the elevator doors closed, the uncomfortable silence loomed as Tucker pulled at the collar of his shirt. She bit her lip to hide a smile and glanced at the floor. 
so much had changed, but not that nervous habit. When she'd been with him in Nashville, she'd seen him do the same thing just before entering the stage to perform. With as many times as he'd performed since, she figured he'd be over it. When he did it again, she giggled. What? he asked, jerking his fingers from his collar, which pulled his tie askew. Callie shook her head as she ducked again to keep him from seeing her smile. Uh, nothing. No, you're laughing at me. Why? Should she tell him who she was? She was already keeping her job as a reporter from him. She looked up, and his normally western sky blue eyes were clouded. No, they needed to get to know one another a little better first. I'm not. It's just that this whole situation is a little weird, she finally said. I'll give you that. Weird seems to be an understatement. His voice was thick, and he rubbed the back of his neck. She needed to fulfill her end of the bargain and make this work. The hospital would get a huge donation if she pulled it off, and maybe she could convince Tucker to give her rights to some exclusives. They needed to start over, and she needed to see him as just a person. Sticking out her free hand, she said, Hi. I'm Callie Rayanne Chapman. I'd like to apply for the position of Tucker Hawk's wife. I'm an excellent secret keeper, friend, and all-around pal. I don't have a lot of friends, but the ones I do have, I'm fiercely loyal to, like a bulldog. Tucker dropped his hand from his neck and chuckled as he held her gaze. He shook her hand. Hello. I'm Tucker Ryan Hawk. My closest friends call me Tuck. I love to sing and perform. I don't have a lot of friends anymore, but I wouldn't mind a new one. New one? Why did that hurt a little? Okay, now that we've properly introduced ourselves, we should set some ground rules. Ground rules? She shrugged. Well, yeah. That's how it is in the romance novels I read. There are always rules. Of course, they're never followed, but this is real life. That won't happen with us. Right, he smiled his brilliant smile again. So, ground rules. What's rule number one? You can't fall in love with me. She'd heard that in a movie somewhere and always wanted to use it. Plus, she'd heard his stance on relationships, and she didn't want him thinking this was anything more than fake. Maybe if he didn't feel any pressure, there was a chance they could be friends. And maybe she could use it to keep her own emotions under control so she didn't get hurt again. For a second, he just stared at her, and then his lips quirked up at the corners. Okay. No kissing or anything physical unless we have to. That makes it easier to follow rule one. Holding hands is okay because that's simple. I mean, who falls in love while just holding hands? I guess no one. She grinned. Exactly. Then she grew serious, waving her hand between them. Oh, and no, you know. He nodded. Okay, I'm on board with that. Um, I can't think of any more rules. Those are the most basic. If we think of any, we can just add them. Unless you have some. No, I can't think of any better. I mean, the contract is pretty thorough. We're exclusive, we show up for label functions, and if either of us tells anyone this is fake, we're sued. Yeah, the lawyer that wrote it seemed to think of everything. But if you do think of something, just tell me, she said, tucking a piece of hair behind her ear. She'd left it down, and now it was bugging her. If only she'd been able to pick the restaurant, she'd have picked something much less formal. With the stuffy clothes and uneasiness, a fancy dinner just added to the discomfort. Once the elevator doors opened, Callie eyed the four hulking men standing just outside. Huh. She hadn't thought about Tucker needing protection, but she should have. Was this what it would be like to live in his world? She clung a bit more tightly to Tucker's arm as the bodyguards surrounded them. When they got to the limo, two of the men got in first, 
followed by Callie and Tucker, with the other two filing in behind them. Callie didn't know if she felt safe or insulted, but she kept her thoughts to herself. Again, the silence stretched between them the rest of the ride and then didn't stop, even when they were seated at the restaurant across from one another. The restaurant was empty, which only added to the awkwardness. Maybe his label president was worried about something leaking and didn't want anyone to see them together yet. A waiter stopped at their table, taking their drink orders and leaving them menus. Tucker ordered a water until Callie told the waiter she wanted sweet tea, and then he changed his order to match hers. Callie wanted to say something to break the uncomfortable silence, but she had no idea what. Is this what being fake married would be like when they were alone? Awkward meals and uncomfortable silence? Shouldn't they be chatting it up by now? If not, how would they present themselves as a new couple in love? Callie blinked at the menu. An entire year of this? She knew it wasn't going to be simple or easy, but she hadn't figured it would be excruciatingly hard. Finally, the waiter returned to take their order. She glanced over her options and was glad to see the restaurant had a simple chicken pasta dish, but what she really wanted was a cheeseburger. Not the fancy kind they listed on the menu, though. Her idea of a good burger didn't include duck fat or some weird foam. Tucker took a sip of his tea and sighed. I guess we get to know each other now. Phew. She was so glad he was taking the lead. It meant she didn't have to feel like she was prying. I guess so. Where do we start? He shrugged. Well, tell me about you. Okay. My parents are Clementine and Francis Chapman. My mom is an accountant, and my dad is a lawyer. I have four sisters, Rachel, Vivian, Michelle, and Georgia. As far as age, I'm in between Vivian and Michelle. My sister Georgia is getting married this coming weekend, and then I'll be the only spinster in the bunch, my mom's words, not mine. Wow. Big family. Yeah. Are you sure you want to go to my sister's wedding? I mean, there's even a schedule, complete with family talent show. And believe me, if you show up, they'll expect you to perform. Georgia will also demand that you sing for her wedding. A small laugh trickled out. It'll be fine. Does your family always do weddings like that? She shrugged and rubbed her thumb down her sweaty glass. Well, it's more like my mom and my sisters just dealt with it. How about you? Not that she didn't know quite a bit about him. They'd talked about a lot of things when they dated, but it seemed easier at this point to pretend she didn't. My parents are Elise and David Hawk. I have a best friend, Chris. He's touring as a guitarist for the Howling Rednecks right now, so I haven't seen much of him lately. It's nice when I go home because they all treat me like a regular guy. So much so that I get the privilege of picking up after banjo. Banjo? My parents' great Dane. Yeah, she remembered something about a huge dog. Whoa. That's a lot of pickup privilege. He laughed. You have no idea. We had a dog when I was little. His name was Muddy. Muddy? She nodded. Yeah, he was a mutt we got from the pound, and we're a family of unoriginal thinkers. Tucker tipped his head back, and the laugh that poured out was throaty and warm. Callie's insides bubbled like they'd been heated with actual fire. Good heavens, what a laugh. Was his laugh that great when they were together eight years ago? That's funny. And I thought banjo was bland because I play the banjo. You play the banjo? she asked pretending like she didn't remember. It wasn't something he did in public, and most people who didn't know him wouldn't know that particular little detail. They also didn't know the twinkle he got in his eye when he talked about it. Those blue eyes of his would light up, and it was like he was nine and talking about his favorite superhero. That wasn't something she could ever forget, and she could see that sparkle again. Yeah, I've played it since I was a kid, but not in public. It's something I only do for myself. 
I love the banjo. Well, I love bluegrass music. He tilted his head as though he was surprised. Really? Would he remember her now? I've loved it since I was a teenager and heard Alison Krauss in Union Station play. Far Away Land? Do you know that one? I love Ron Block. She sang a couple of lines and teared up. Wow, you're pretty good. The heat in her cheeks ran to her ears as she waved him off. No, I'm not, but I love Ron. He's a brilliant lyricist. Tucker nodded. I rarely meet anyone who knows his songs. He's the one who inspired me to first start writing my own songs. She knew that. Tucker's songs were deep and soulful and touching. They came from the heart, and you could feel it all the way to your core. I'm not shocked at all. I could tell on your last album that the songs were written by other people. The songs from your first two albums were wonderful, and the newest ones didn't have your typical depth. She slapped her hand over her mouth, realizing she just spilled more than she wanted. He crossed his arms over his chest and smiled. It was the smile she was used to seeing when he was playing a part. I take it you're a fan? How could he not remember her when it seemed like she had a photographic memory? Had he meant more to her than she'd meant to him? Should she tell him? Nope. If he didn't remember her, then she must not have meant that much to him. It would only make things that much more uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm a fan, she said with a soft nod. At least you know my music. That's good. Her shoulders sagged. It's fantastic. His arms dropped to his lap. That doesn't sound fantastic. I just don't want to be relegated to fan status. I've followed your career since you performed at Texan Song. It was my last year at Vanderbilt, and I was out with some friends when we ducked into the bar. The words had poured out before she could stop them. Tex and Song? He sucked in a deep breath as he studied her. His eyes narrowed before he said, I know you. Callie? She shrugged. Uh, yeah? Why didn't you remind me? I didn't want to bring it up and make you think I was just telling a story if you didn't remember me. He smiled and seemed relieved. Oh, I remember you. We'd hang out after my concerts. Talk about a knife to the heart. They hung out? That's it? Yep, that's me. And you're still a fan? He leaned forward with his arms on the table. Sure, why not? Oh yeah, you were, are great. I think you have the best voice ever. And you were so different than other artists. You had the sweet nature about you. I don't know. I just, she squeezed her eyes shut and clamped her lips closed. What was it about him that made her mouth run on autopilot? Just what, he asked in a silky smooth tone. It was then that she realized how close she was to him. His spicy cologne enveloped her, making her dizzy. She leaned back, giving herself some space to hopefully clear her head enough to think. Um, just, what should she say? That I thought you were really talented. It was easy to see that you'd be famous one day. Is that all? Whoa. When had he learned to smolder like that? And that smirk? Wow. Yep. She squeaked. She desperately needed a subject change. So, is it different, performing for bigger crowds? A lot different. Sometimes, I miss performing for those small venues where I could see everyone. It's easier to read whether someone likes something when you can see their eyes. Callie nodded. I can see that. It must be hard when you can't tell if someone is being honest or not. It is. He caught her gaze and held it. I wish you'd told me who you were when I picked you up. Admittedly, it's still a little fuzzy. Well, if he needed reassurance. The first time I saw you perform, you were wearing a green plaid button-up with jeans. 
You had these old snakeskin boots too. That night, the sole of one of them came off, and you tripped. She giggled at the memory. His cheeks had turned a blistering color of red, but he'd smiled and played it off like it was nothing. I remember that. You really were there. Yeah, I was. That night you were so fantastic. You sang the song you'd written. Wild Love. His lips parted, and he looked at her like he was seeing her with new eyes. That's right. I wrote that about my first love from high school. We dated my senior year, but she decided she didn't want to be tied down, so she broke it off with me. Oh, it was just beautiful and poignant. I carried those words with me for a long time. I would use your performance schedule as a study incentive. If I got my work done, I could go wherever you were performing. If not, I had to stay home. Did you ever not get your work done? Never. She smiled. He returned her smile with one that was so dazzling she nearly wished she had sunglasses. I'll take that as a huge compliment. She waved him off. Like you don't get tons of compliments. I'd be lying if I said I didn't, but that was the best I've received in a long time. He paused. Thank you. His voice was soft, and the way his eyes sparkled made her glad she was seated. Inwardly, she checked herself. They had one thing in common, and now that he sort of remembered her, she was sure he was just being pleasant. Once the marriage was over, he'd want her to have good things to say about him. As long as she kept that thought in the forefront of her mind, she'd walk away from this thing unscathed. Chapter 4 Once the waiter returned with their meals, Callie glanced down at her plate. Nothing about her had changed, except maybe her hair. It was longer when they dated. Derek had called her average? The man was insane. She was gorgeous back then and even more so now. Callie and the word homely weren't even in the same solar system. Why had he pretended they'd never dated? The second she opened the door, he remembered her. She wasn't a woman a man forgets. Her smile was the sweetest, and her legs were a mile long. But he'd had to make a choice back then. His manager at the time had convinced him that a girlfriend would hold him back, and like an idiot, he'd listened. By the time he dumped his manager, his career had taken off, and things always seemed to get in the way. Why had he let her get away? The pale blue strapless dress she wore complemented her tan skin. Softly curled light brown hair flowed around her shoulders and looked like satin, so silky and touchable and her dark eyes were intense and expressive. And beyond looks, she was a fan of Ron Block. He'd remembered that too. Talking about Ron had broken the ice when they first met and led to really hitting it off. Having her on his arm and then sitting so close to her on the ride over made him dizzy. She still used the same body wash, the grapefruit kind that he'd loved. The smell had filled the entire limo, and he had to resist the urge to lean over and smell her. Talk about awkward. He'd seen the disappointment in her eyes when he acted like he didn't recognize her, and he hated that, but he'd learned to be cautious. People only saw him as a means to an end. Derek used him. Stacy used him. Petra had used him. It had been a long time since he'd seen Callie. What if she changed? What if she wanted to use him too? She cut into her chicken and took a bite. When her eyes closed, it seemed like she was savoring it. Oh, well. I didn't know chicken could taste this good. Doesn't beat a well-cooked bacon cheeseburger, but it'll work. She lifted her head and smiled at him. He returned her smile, remembering she always did like the simpler things in life. You'd have preferred a burger joint? Guilty as charged. This situation is already uncomfortable. Let's throw an expensive dress and some heels into the mix and dial it up to eleven. Tucker laughed. She was witty, and humor had always been his weakness when it came to a woman. One of the reasons he'd like her so long ago. 
I'd have preferred that too, but I think they wanted to keep it fancy and upscale because they could control it easier. Yeah, cause nothing says control like an empty restaurant and duck fat basted chicken, even if it is tasty. I didn't say they were right. She chuckled and set her fork down. After holding eye contact a moment, she sighed. Can we be friends? Like, not famous person and crazy fan, but real friends? I don't know how I'm supposed to get through the next year just existing with someone. I'm not saying we have to lay our souls bare, but I've got your back, and you've got mine seems like a good compromise. Friends? He didn't have many of those anymore. Well, none, if he really thought about it. And as great as he remembered things being with her, he wasn't looking for anything more than that. He did wonder why she didn't hate him like everyone else, especially after he left her like he did. Why don't you despise me? Although, from what Derek said, she was getting paid. A half a million would go a long way to bridging the hate gap. She shrugged and chewed her bottom lip. Why would I hate you? Because I ruined my image. I may as well have stolen the baby Jesus out of a nativity scene with as horrible as I behaved. I'm not fishing, I promise, and you don't have to say anything, she paused a moment, locking eyes with him. I think something happened to you, and like most people who have been hurt, you did stupid things to cope. Tucker's pulse jumped. It felt as though she was looking right through him. What could he say to that? You were right. He'd gone this long, keeping everything bottled up, and he wasn't about to share what happened with anyone now, no matter how drawn to her or how at ease he felt. Smiling his best fake smile, he said, well, I guess it's good you don't hate me, since we're getting married tomorrow. Maybe she'd take the hint that he wasn't willing to talk about it and let it go. Her smile was tight, and she nodded. Right. So, can we? Be friends? Just a little? My favorite color is pale pink. I'm not afraid of the dark as long as my feet are under the covers. I like long walks on the beach, as cliche as that sounds. I love Dr. Pepper, oak trees, the angel oak in South Carolina is amazing, Rainier cherries, and I love the simple things in life like books and chaise lounges and movie nights with popcorn. He remembered all that too. She drank more Dr. Pepper than he thought humanly possible. What could go wrong if he told her he remembered them dating? Like tick marks, a list of reasons formed in his mind. Maybe she'd expect to pick up things where they left off or want more than he could give. After Petra, his heart wasn't ready, and he wasn't sure how long it'd take before he was able to think about another relationship. He glanced at her dress. Pale blue seems to be more your color. I'd have to see pale pink to know if it works. Her cheeks turned a soft shade of pink, and he had to admit she looked good in pink too. Uh, well, um. Oh, don't tell me you aren't used to getting compliments. Not from anyone who matters. She spoke so softly he was sure he heard her wrong. I do, but, thanks. She took a long drink of water. How about you? Likes? Dislikes? Was it possible she didn't remember their time together as well as he did? I do like movie nights, but if I'm having popcorn, I like mandoms and junior mints tossed in it. Both? See, I like Reese's Pieces and Cups in there. Tucker leaned forward, memories continuing to flood back, and his mouth watered. Wow, she really hadn't changed much. I've never tried that. Is it good? He should just tell her he remembered. It would make things easier. Why couldn't he make his mouth work? Life-changing. He tipped his head back, laughing. What's your favorite movie? That's a good way to reconnect with someone, right? P.S. I love you. Well, that one and music and lyrics. She smiled, and something flashed in her eyes. They'd watched it together. Did she remember too? If she did, why wasn't she saying anything? 
But what right did he have to judge her when he was doing the same thing? Maybe she had her reasons for pretending too. I like music and lyrics too. You do? He shrugged. It's music and lyrics. Plus, I like Drew Barrymore. She's always seemed a little crazy, but the good kind. Like she'd be fun to have a beer with and maybe play pool. Okay, I have to fix that wonky tie, she said as she quickly changed seats and leaned over. His heart raced as her scent filled the air around him. She was so close, and the electricity was so fierce that it felt like he could actually see it arcing between them. Fixed. Her voice was soft as she dropped her hands from his tie. Did she feel it too? If only the rest of me was that easy to fix. He gave her a lopsided smile and held her gaze. What was he doing flirting with her? Yeah, they'd be spending the next year together, but if he didn't watch himself, no, he was doing what they'd both signed on for. There had to be chemistry, otherwise, no one would buy the relationship. She returned to her seat, and he saw a slight shake in her hand as she picked up her fork and began eating again. Maybe he was having more of an effect than he thought. Inwardly, he gloated a little. The conversation continued through dinner, and he found Callie to be even more intriguing than he remembered. By the time the night was over, he actually found himself disappointed. He'd liked when he was a nobody and she'd liked him. Of all the women Derek could have found, Tucker was glad it was her. He considered the coincidence, or was it? Once they'd finished dinner, he dropped her off at her hotel. He was even tempted to give her a good night kiss. The desire caught him off guard, but he'd reeled himself in before he let anything happen. Of the things he remembered, her kisses were the easiest to recall. The next morning, as he stood in the waiting room of the little chapel of burning love, he pulled at his dress shirt collar, dreading what was about to happen. As much as he remembered liking Callie, it had been a long time, and he didn't know her well enough to marry her. Just the thought made his chest tighten. When Tucker pictured his wedding day, he'd never pictured it at a Vegas wedding chapel with contracts and ground rules about kissing and other things. He'd always envisioned being surrounded by friends and family in a church as he watched the love of his life walk down the aisle. And he especially envisioned a honeymoon, a great one. Hey, Stacy said as she stopped in front of him. You look a little pale. He wasn't about to let Stacy know he and Callie had a past relationship. I'm getting married to a complete stranger. How am I supposed to look? She pushed his fingers from his collar and straightened his tie. It's only for a year, and for part of that, you'll be touring. She smiled. His mouth dropped open as his heart started racing. Touring? She nodded, and her smile widened. North American tour, baby. It's being put together as we speak. When we announce that you're married, we'll be announcing the tour. It's all coming together. I guess. You said she was nice, right? She's okay. If he was honest, she was more than okay. He had a connection with her. When he touched her, zaps of electricity hit him so hard that it took effort not to check his hair to see if it was standing on end. The minister's assistant popped her head in. Ah, uh, we have a problem. The bride is having second thoughts. Stacy's lips pinched together. I'll take care of it. Tucker touched her shoulder. Let me do it. Are you sure? Yeah. He nodded and walked out of the waiting area, following behind the assistant. When they reached the room where Callie waited, he stepped inside, and the assistant gave him an apologetic smile before closing the door. Hey, he said as Callie spun around. Her face was as pale as his felt and was streaked as if she'd been crying. Is everything okay? You did sign a contract, and you're being paid well. This is marriage. I'm marrying someone I, she stopped and let the sentence die. Someone she what? If it was any other time, he'd ask. I know. He slowly approached. 
she whirled away from him, wringing her hands. I mean, I know you want your career, and I hate that you could lose your contract, but marriage? This was the best idea they could come up with? The fact that she was having the same reservations made him feel better. I feel the same way. She faced him again. Really? Yeah, this wasn't my first choice. Then why marriage? He shrugged. Because it sounded better than rehab. Rehab? I mean, I've seen the pictures, but I never saw you touch anything alcoholic. I guess you could have changed, but she clamped her lips shut as her gaze found his. Sorry. I didn't. Touch the stuff, I mean. Not until, he wasn't talking about Petra. Not today. I haven't had a drink in months. I don't need rehab, so marriage was the path I took. He stepped toward her and placed his hands on her arms. Listen, I know this is big, but we just need to hold it together long enough to get through the ceremony. You'll get paid, I'll get my contract back, and we'll just have to smile for the cameras when we get back from your sister's wedding. Right, this is just for a year, and then we'll go our separate ways. I'll get my, she stopped short, and her eyes went wide. Tucker eyed her as a weird feeling settled on him. Get what? I just mean I'll have a date for my sister's wedding, and I won't have to deal with my mom trying to set me up with Edmund. And I'll get paid to boot. He held her gaze a second as he studied her. She was hiding something. Or maybe he was just reading too much into it. Yeah, that was it. All of this craziness was making him antsy. As he forced himself to relax, he smiled. Exactly. We'll handle this like pros. We'll say, I do, and we'll be done. The assistant stuck her head in the room. Did I hear that everything's okay? Tucker turned to the woman and shot her his best convincing smile. You bet. Great. The minister is ready, and the next couple has arrived. We need to stay on schedule. Tucker and Callie followed the lively assistant out of the room and into the sanctuary where the minister was waiting at the front of the room. The woman smiled and beckoned them forward with her hand. The ceremony was short and sweet, which was what they paid for. Long and dramatic would have cost another couple hundred dollars. It seemed like a waste of money to pay more for something so fake. Once they'd exchanged vows and rings, the minister declared them husband and wife. You may now kiss the bride. Kiss the bride? Oh, right. He'd forgotten about that part. Actually, that was a lie. He'd thought about this part of the ceremony since he dropped Callie off the night before. He didn't have an excuse to kiss her the night before, and now he did. This was how you sealed the whole marriage deal. He had to kiss her to make it look real. Tucker slipped his arms around her waist and pulled her close as her palms flattened against his chest. The tingles from her touch were just as strong now as they were the night before. For a heartbeat, they locked eyes, and then he lowered his lips to hers. With the touch of her lips, Tucker could swear fireworks were going off somewhere in the building. His heart raced, and his breathing became shallow. He'd never experienced such a physical reaction to a kiss before. Had their past kisses been that intense? But before he could really understand what was happening, Callie pulled away. Maybe she wasn't sensing the same thing he was. That bothered him more than he liked, and he frowned at the thought. Maybe it was a good thing. He didn't need this to get complicated. The last thing he needed was a relationship, or at least a real relationship. The fake one was as close as he was willing to get. We'll just need you two to sign the certificate and take a few pictures, and then you're free to start your life together in wedded bliss, the minister said. Stacy sidled up next to him and leaned in. That was good. Even I bought it. I am a performer, he said as he looked at Callie. When he'd first pulled back, she'd looked a little flushed, but now all her color was gone. He studied her face. You okay? Yeah, 
I'm fine. But she didn't sound fine. You sure? She waved him off and smiled. Oh, yeah. I'm great. I mean, we sure showed that minister. No way she didn't believe we were the real deal. That's what I was going for. Why did it bother him that she seemed unaffected by the kiss? It shouldn't. This was a good thing. It meant he could get his career back without any emotional entanglements. But as he held her gaze, he had a feeling things had just gotten complicated. As brief as it was, he'd enjoyed kissing her, and now he was even more tempted to find out what a real kiss would be like. Wait. No. His crazy thoughts needed to stop. Whatever they had was over. She was getting paid to be his wife. Of course she'd make the kiss look and feel real. That's what Petra had done, pretending to be one thing while she was another. Why should Callie be any different? Chapter 5 Married Callie was no longer a Chapman, but a Hawk. Mrs. Callie Hawk. It had been so surreal to exchange vows and rings. Then they'd kissed. It took the whole flight to Wilmington before her lips stopped tingling like they'd been hit with a live wire. She'd taken her ring off before they left the chapel, but that little gold band tucked away in her wallet made her feel like she was carrying a pair of hundred-pound weights in her purse. She was just glad she'd have the next seven days to prepare herself for the real world. Hey. Tucker's voice cut through her thoughts. Callie's vision cleared, and her family's vacation home loomed in front of her. Good thing she put the address into Tucker's phone, otherwise, they could be anywhere with as lost in thought as she'd been. Why had the word loomed popped into her thoughts? It sounded so ominous. Her family loved her. Well, they loved the fictionalized version Callie gave them. No one knew who the real Callie was, but maybe they would after this year was over. You okay? he asked. She smiled as she looked at him. Yeah. It's just, you know, family. He chuckled. Oh, I know. No, you really don't. My mom, she has expectations, and I never live up to them. If she knew, Callie clamped her lips together. She'd almost spilled that she was a reporter. If she did that, Tucker would be furious, the contract would be void, and the hospital would lose out on half a million dollars. At best, she'd be fired, and at worst, she'd be sued. Knew what? That I hate being an accountant. That was the truth. She tried being an accountant, and she'd hated it with such a passion that she'd cried herself to sleep for months before quitting the accounting firm. One test. She was one test away from getting her CPA license when she couldn't do it anymore. So, she quit and started freelance writing. Over time, one thing led to another, and before she knew it, she was a reporter. A popular one too, except no one knew it was her. Tucker nodded and turned his gaze to the house. I'm sorry. She loves me, but she can be a little controlling. Ah. Well, I don't have a mom like that, but Stacy's pretty close. Callie laughed. Yeah. I suspect a talent manager would be rather controlling. That's a nice way of putting it. He brought his gaze back to her. Do they know I'm coming? No, I was told not to let them know. When she'd read that little clause, she was relieved. She dreaded the idea of calling her mom and telling her a famous singer would be coming to George's wedding. He tilted his head. Did they expect you to come with someone? Callie nearly laughed out loud. Her with a date. It's not that she didn't want to bring someone, but there'd never been anyone she was interested in enough. However, that was something Tucker didn't need to know. No, and knowing my mom, she's invited someone for me. His eyebrows hit his hairline. Really? More than likely, she'd invited Edmund Richards. Yeah, his parents are friends with mine. He's been chasing me since we were kids. 
For a brief second in high school, she almost considered it until Edmund spread a rumor she was his girlfriend. He apologized, and while they were still friends, they'd never be more than that. Should I be worried? Tucker smiled. She shook her head. No, I've never been interested, and he knows it. Good to know, he said and grinned wider. You ready to go in? She nodded. Yeah, let's rip this band-aid off. We're already late for lunch. Tucker nodded pushed out of the car, and ran around the front to Callie's side to pull open her door. Thanks, she said as she got out. You didn't have to do that. My mom raised a gentleman. He smiled. Callie held in the smile. The first time he said those same words was at the beginning, when they first went out. They weren't quite dating, but the spark dancing between them had been so fierce that it was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. She remembered him jumping from the car and running around to open her door. He'd been a little lankier then, but she thought he was the next best thing to Captain America. If she was honest with herself, that same spark was still there, at least for her. They walked to the trunk, but before she could retrieve her luggage, he beat her to it. Nope, doting boyfriend until we get to LA, he said. And after we get there? Doting husband. She grinned. Doesn't that mean I get to be the doting girlfriend then wife? Sure, but I handle the heavy lifting, okay? He smiled as he used his elbow to shut the trunk. Okay, she said as they walked to the front door of the house. She placed her hand on his arm and took a deep breath. Everything will be fine. His gaze caught hers. We've got each other's back, right? His words paired with the way he held her gaze sent a tickle down her spine. Right. She pulled the door open, and Tucker followed her inside. Salty air carried the voices of her family in from the deck on the back of the house. We'll take care of the luggage later. That band-aid is only partway off, and I can already feel the sting getting worse. Sure, he said as took her hand, tangling his fingers with hers. I'm ready when you are. Callie took a deep breath as she pulled Tucker behind her toward the deck. Through the screen, she could see her family sitting around their large farmhouse table under the awning her parents had installed the year prior. As the pair made their way onto the deck, every head popped up. One by one their jaws dropped. Is that Tucker Hawk? Her sister Vivian asked. Holy wow, her sister Michelle said as more murmurs erupted. Callie was so nervous that she was sure if she cupped her hands, sweat would pool in them. Dad, Mom, everyone, this is Tucker Hawk. Tucker, this is my mom, Clementine, and my dad, Francis. The whispers grew louder and louder until her dad said, Settle down, everyone. He stood and stuck his hand out to Tucker. Hello. Tucker shook his hand. Hello, sir. It's nice to meet you. He extended his hand to her mom. And you too, ma'am. It would have been nice to know you were bringing someone, Callie, her mom said as she looked from Tucker to her. I'm sorry, mom. Tucker wasn't sure he was going to be able to come until the last minute, and I didn't want to say anything before we knew for certain. Georgia laughed. She was afraid we wouldn't believe her. Rachel snorted and bumped her husband, Denver, with her shoulder. She's crushed on Tucker Hawk since she was a college senior. She leaned forward and tapped Michelle's hand. You remember when we visited and she drug us to that little music bar? We just had to hear this guy sing. Heat blistered Callie's cheeks as it made its way to her ears. Why did her sisters have to make this so hard? Could you guys please stop? Callie asked. Tucker leaned down. You're very cute when you blush, he whispered. When he leaned back, his eyes sparkled. If Callie could have, she'd have dug a hole to hide in. It was silly, she knew. After all, he remembered her to some degree, but the way her sisters were talking, they made it sound like she was some kind of stalker. 
Her mom clapped her hands together. Okay, let Callie and Tucker take a seat and fix a plate. We can talk after they've eaten. Thanks, Mom, Callie said, truly grateful for the momentary reprieve. The we can talk after they've eaten wasn't so great, but it was better than being pounced on. They walked to the end of the table and took seats next to each other across from her sister Georgia. Well, Cal, you sure know how to surprise people. Callie shrugged. I wasn't trying to surprise anyone. Until last night, I really didn't know if he was going to be able to come. Her sister leveled her eyes at Tucker. You do realize you'll be singing at my wedding, right? He laughed and locked eyes with Callie. I believe that was one of the conditions of me coming. Callie smiled. I told you so. Yes, you did. Rachel, who was sitting next to Georgia, glanced at Callie. How long have you two been seeing each other? They'd worked part of this out on the plane. About six months, said Callie. And how did you meet? Tucker took a drink of water and said, I was being chased by some paparazzi in Vegas after a concert. I ducked into a coffee shop and kind of took a seat at the table she was sitting at. I wanted to look like I wasn't alone. We struck up a conversation, and the rest is history. The fact that he left out the part where they dated her last year in college only reconfirmed that he didn't totally remember her. Rachel's eyebrows knitted together as her gaze locked on Callie. You were in Vegas? When? Yeah, the, um, CPA firm was having a retreat. We had a little bit of free time, and in one of Guy Fieri's diners, drive-ins, and dives shows, he featured the cafe I was in. They had excellent muffins. Callie smiled. That's interesting. And Tucker was there for a concert? George's lips twitched up. You sure there was a retreat and it wasn't just a thin excuse to go to one of his concerts? Callie rolled her eyes. Yes, there was a retreat. I didn't even know he was having a concert in Vegas. If you say so, Georgia said. Are you going to be in the talent contest? asked Vivian. She was sandwiched between her two little girls, Mary and Tabitha. He knows about it, Callie said. Tucker shrugged. I'm down for a talent contest. Vivian and Michelle exchanged a glance. You'd have to come up with a new song, Vivian said. That's not a rule, Callie said. Rachel laughed. Hey, if we're going to have professional talent to compete against, we need to level the field. Georgia nodded. Yep, I agree. Tucker shrugged. It's fine. I've been wanting to work on new material. If I can't, I won't compete. You don't have to worry about it, Callie said. You're here to relax. If you want to write a song, great, and if you don't, don't stress about it. They're just giving you a hard time. Right? She gave each of her sisters a pointed look. Ethan, Vivian's husband smiled. Don't let them get to you. They're all bark. Her brother-in-law winked at her and then looked at Tucker. We're going jet skiing in a little while. You want to come with? Tucker's eyes lit up. I'd love that. He caught Callie gaze and held it. If that's okay with you. Callie nodded. Of course that's fine with me. Then I'm in, he said and began chatting with Ethan while they finished their lunch. This was good. Her sisters had embarrassed her, but it wasn't anything she couldn't handle. Ethan had invited Tucker to go with the rest of the guys. This was as smooth as it could have been. Callie was a little apprehensive about bringing Tucker with her, but if the week went this smoothly, everything would be fine. She sighed and let herself relax. Yep. This was good. Chapter 6 Being on the water had always relaxed Tucker, and getting an invite from one of Callie's family members made him feel like he'd won on more than one front. Lunch went better than he thought it would. 
Callie's parents were pleasant, even if her mom was a little scary. Her sisters, he chuckled as the scene replayed in his mind. Callie's sisters had embarrassed her, and he smiled as her pink cheeks came to mind. She'd had a crush on him when she was younger. Having her sisters tease her meant she must have mentioned him more than just a little. It went a long way toward helping him trust her again. After they finished lunch, he helped take in the dishes until then the women shooed the guys from the kitchen. Not because they didn't want the guys to help, but as Vivian put it, there was girl talk to be had. Poor Callie. He knew an interrogation was in her future, but his marching orders were to put their luggage upstairs making sure to put hers in the room across from his per the instructions given to him by her mom, and then quickly change into his swim trunks. Before he could get out of his room, Clementine stopped in the door with her arms crossed over her chest. I believe you and I need to have a little talk. That was Southern Mama speak for you ambushed me, and now you're gonna get it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Whoa. He hadn't felt this nervous in a long time. She lifted her nose and looked down at him like she was sizing up a Christmas ham. Tell me why you think you're good enough for my Callie. Gulp. No, double gulp. Good enough? He nearly snorted, but the woman scared the daylights out of him, and as he was already on her bad side. He didn't want to make it worse. I'm not. Mama, one of Callie's sisters yelled. Where are you? Narrowing her eyes, she said, George's wedding is this week. Any foolishness that'll draw the attention of the press, and you'll meet my not-so-nice side. His eyes went wide. He'd meet her not-so-nice side? Then what side was this? His gut said he needed to check the house for cauldrons and brooms. No, ma'am. He slashed a finger over his heart. On my honor, no foolishness. With a nod of her head, she left him standing there, feeling like he just had an encounter with the female version of the boogeyman. Once he had his wits back, he set out for the beach. Tucker was the first one out there. As the hot August sun beat down on him, he looked out over the horizon with his arms crossed. His feet sank farther into the sand as the waves rushed in and out. Getting married hadn't been high on his list of things to do, but he had to admit, if he was going to be in a fake relationship, this was the way to start one. He'd been anxious about meeting Callie's family, and her mom was downright terrifying, but the rest of them weren't too bad. Hi. Tucker looked down, and a little girl, Vivian's oldest, stood next to him in a princess swimsuit. Her blonde hair was pulled back into a braid, and freckles dusted her cheeks and nose. Hi. You're Mary, right? When she smiled, her two missing front teeth made her even cuter. Uh-huh. Mary was nine, and she'd been one of the nieces he'd caught staring more than once. Are you having a good time so far? he asked. Yep, she said and towed the sand. Can I ask you a question? He smiled. You bet. I know you're a famous country singer. My mom listens to your music in the car all the time. Yeah, I guess I am. Do you ever get scared to sing in front of people? Tucker chuckled. Not as much anymore, but when I started out, I'd get so scared I'd throw up. She scrunched up her face and smiled. But you don't anymore? No, but I still get nervous. How did you get over it? He went down to one knee so he could be eye level. Over time, I just got used to it. I want to dance for the talent contest, but I get so scared. I've tried, but I just can't do it. Oh, Tucker said. Why are you so scared? Mary shrugged. I don't know. All those people looking at me. What if I mess up? But they're your family. If you're going to mess up, it's better to do it in front of people who love you. They sometimes make fun of people. I don't think they'd make fun of you. I bet your grandma would love to see you dance. Clementine struck him as the type of grandma that wouldn't only love it, she'd take video to relive it. 
Even though she was tough on Tucker, he figured she was only protecting her daughter because she loved her so much. Yeah, that's what she says, but I'm just afraid the others will make fun of me. Tucker nodded. Mary, do you love to dance? Her smile lit up her entire cute little face. With all my heart. Do you want to share that love with other people? Mary nodded. Then don't be afraid to dance in front of people. Give it all of your heart and let people see how much you love it. He paused. And if they laugh, take it as a compliment. You made them happy. Maybe not in the way you intended, but you did, and that's all that matters. Her little eyes sparkled. You really believe that? I really do. Plus, you'll have me in the audience, and if you struggle, you just look my way, and I'll be cheering you on. The little girl smiled. Thanks, Mr. Hawk. You call me Tuck, he said with a wink. Thanks, Tuck. She giggled and ran off. Making fans everywhere you go, huh? Callie's soft voice came from behind him. Tucker looked up, and his mouth went dry. Callie was gorgeous, and in a tank tankini, she made his heart pound against his ribs. It was modest, but it hugged her in all the very best ways. The woman could fill out a swimsuit better than any woman he'd ever seen. Wow, you look amazing. In a faded swimsuit? My family isn't here. You don't have to keep up pretenses. I'm not. You look great. She eyed him as her cheeks took on a rosy tint, and then she dropped her gaze to the sand. Uh, well, thanks. She pulled her bottom lip between her teeth. And thanks for what you said to Mary. She's tried so many times to participate in the talent contest, and right before she's supposed to perform, she gets scared. I hope that pep talk helps her. I hope so too. She's really cute. I look forward to seeing her dance. He smiled. Me too. She laughed and tucked a piece of hair behind her ear. Thanks for taking my luggage to my room. Not sure I had a choice about that. Your mom can be a little intimidating. Callie laughed. Imagine living with her. No thanks. Based on just the short interaction he'd had with her, he couldn't imagine living with her. I. Ethan jogged to a stop next to Tucker. Hey, we're all ready to go. You ready? Tucker glanced at Callie. Still okay? Go have fun. She narrowed her eyes at Ethan. He comes back in one piece, or I'm feeding all of you to the sharks. Ethan Mock saluted. Yes, ma'am. Tucker dropped a kiss to her lips like it was the most natural thing in the world. I'll be back. In one piece. He winked. You'd better. She lifted on her toes and kissed him, and he found himself liking that. His spotty memory of them was getting clearer with every moment he was around her. If he recalled correctly, the zings racing through his body from her kiss was something that happened back then too. He and Ethan took off for the pier jutting out from the house where a boathouse sat at the end. Near it, three jet skis were already out. Ethan, Vivian's husband, Rachel's husband, Denver, and Michelle's husband, Will, were already working with Callie's dad to pull out the remaining jet skis. You know how to ride? Denver asked. Tucker grinned. Yeah, I've ridden a time or two. Will clasped a hand on Tucker's shoulder with a smile. Great. We won't have to go easy on you. Like you'd go easy on him even if he was new, Denver said with a chuckle. Don't listen to them. They're all talk, Ethan said. Once on the water, the smack talk never wavered. Tucker found that Will and Ethan were especially good at it too. Tuck was sure if they weren't good friends, they'd be throwing punches. Before long, Tucker was jumping waves, doing twists and flips. He wasn't trying to impress anyone, he was simply enjoying himself. 
When he stopped to watch the others, he smiled to himself, amused by watching them try some of his tricks. It was then that he noticed another guy approaching on a jet ski. Ethan sidled up next to Tucker and patted him on the back. Those were cool stunts. Thanks. He glanced in the new guy's direction. Who's the guy that joined us? Ethan followed his line of sight. Oh, that's Edmund Richards. So that was Edmund? The built guy with the thick, wavy dark hair? Why did Tucker suddenly feel inferior? And why did it matter what the guy looked like? Callie had made it clear she wasn't interested in him. Was there a chance she actually was and just wanted to bring along another guy to make this Edmund guy jealous? He and Callie go way back, don't they? asked Tucker. Yeah. Rumor is that they dated in high school, but I don't know. That's just what Edmund says. Ethan continued when Tucker didn't say anything. I wouldn't worry about him, though. Clementine invited him, and since I've been in the family, which is 12 years now, Callie hasn't shown him even the slightest interest. Which is why I'm not sure I believe they were ever involved. Tucker nodded. She said they weren't. There you go. Edmund is known to exaggerate. Ethan threw up a hand and waved. Oh, hey, Heath's here. That was George's fiancé. He'd arrived late because of a real estate deal that kept him in Wilmington. Tucker waved, and he and Ethan sped over to the dock. Ethan lifted off his jet ski and shook the man's hand. Hey, about time you made it. Heath grinned. Gotta get the deal, right? Yeah, Ethan said and tipped his head in Tucker's direction. This is Callie's boyfriend. Heath's eyebrows went up. Wow. I thought Georgia was pulling my chain. He shook Tucker's hand. Nice to meet you, and welcome to this crazy family. Thanks, Tucker said and smiled. I'm told I'm singing at your wedding. Heath and Ethan laughed. Vivian may have us renew our vows just so you can sing. My wife is a huge fan, Ethan said. Tucker snorted. You do what you have to do for family, right? Exactly, Ethan said and grinned. I like this guy. A familiar ringtone filtered from the boathouse. Tucker pointed to his jet ski. Uh, hey, Heath, if you want my jet ski, you can take it. I've got a call coming in. Yeah, that'd be great. Tucker sidled the jet ski next to the deck and pulled himself up. He jogged to the boathouse and grabbed his phone, noticing the caller ID as he put it to his ear. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Tuck. Um. He'd heard that tone before. It was the one she'd used when Reckless pulled his contract. What? Somehow, your marriage has been leaked. It's everywhere. The only thing they don't know is where you are, and we're doing our best to keep that information from slipping out. Slipped out? How did it slip out? He asked, his tone clipped. Derek says he doesn't know. Tucker swore under his breath and raked his hand through his hair. He didn't believe Derek for a second. The control freak doesn't know how it got out. I'm supposed to believe that? Callie didn't want this out before her sister was married. I know, but there's nothing I can do now. We're just going to have to handle this the best way we can. Do you think her family will be okay? Stacy asked. Her brothers-in-law seemed okay, but he wasn't sure about her mom and sisters. He was especially worried about her mom. How bad is it? It's everywhere. They're already beginning to dig into Callie. Tucker groaned. Great. I know she signed up for this, but she wasn't expecting it so soon. Is she with you right now? No, I was out on the water. If I were you, I'd find her and tell her. Tucker raked his hand through his hair. My parents. I have to go. I'll call them, and then I'll tell Callie. 
He paused a second. Have security on standby in case the paparazzi find out where I am, okay? I don't want them disrupting George's wedding. I've already taken care of it. I've got some on the way. They'll be close in case you need them. Thanks. They said their goodbyes as Tucker ended the call, and then he phoned his parents. Hey, bud, his dad said. Hey, dad. Can you put it on speaker and let me talk to you and mom together? Even Tucker could hear the doom in his voice. Is this about you being married? His mom asked. Apparently, his dad had answered with the phone on speaker. Yeah, mom. I'm sorry you found out like this. What were you thinking? Getting married? She asked, the hurt in her voice breaking his heart. Tucker squeezed his eyes shut. I'm sorry. I wanted to call you, but it happened so fast. He hated lying to them, and now that he was, rehab would have been better. Nothing ever happens so fast you can't call us, his dad said. Who is she? How long have you known her? What's her name? What? His dad cut her off. Honey, slow down so he can tell us. Her name is Callie Chapman. She's a CPA. She's sweet, kind, and she's been a fan of mine since Texas. He paused, debating whether to tell them he dated her when he was in Nashville. I dated her before I got my first recording contract. You did? His mom's voice pitched a little higher. Yeah, and she's down to earth, beautiful, and I enjoy spending time with her. At least he could be honest about that. Are we going to get to meet her? Yeah, you are. We're staying at her parents' vacation home until her sister gets married, and then we'll stop by for a visit. Tucker could hear Derek objecting now, but the man would have to deal, especially since Tucker was sure he was behind the leak. His parents needed to meet Callie. Hopefully, his mom wouldn't see right through what he was doing. And she's nothing like that Petra girl? His mom asked. It was like a knife to his heart. No, she's nothing like Petra. Callie had never been like Petra. Listen, I need to go. Callie doesn't know our marriage has been leaked, and we weren't going to let it out until after her sister's wedding. I need to tell her what's going on. All right, his dad said. You take care of that and make sure you drop by for a visit. You hear me? Oh, Tucker heard him, and his dad meant business. He take Callie home, or else. Yeah, dad, I heard you. I'll see you soon. Once they said their goodbyes, Tucker walked down the beach to find Callie. With the way his heart was racing and his palms were sweating, it was almost like he was giving his first big concert, the one that made him throw up. How was he supposed to explain what happened when he had no idea himself? Would Callie believe him? How angry would her parents be when they found out and realized they'd been planning on keeping it from them? On top of that, he hadn't been prepared to pretend to be married to Callie while they were at her family's vacation home. The plan had been to make it through the week, and when they went to L.A., she'd have her own room in his home. That way it would be easy on both of them. Nothing about this so-called plan was going according to plan. If it was already going sideways, what hope did Tucker have that it would straighten itself out and work like he was assured it would? If nothing else, when he got back to L.A., he'd have a long talk with Derek. The man had some serious explaining to do, and Tucker was going to get some answers. Yeah, this was supposed to help his career, but if something went wrong, Tucker stopped, unable to allow his thoughts to go down that path. No, this was going to work. This was just a momentary hiccup. Besides, now that they knew, his image could be fixed. This was what he wanted, and Callie was a nice woman. Of all the things that could have gone wrong, this was the best worst thing. For that, he needed to be thankful. Chapter 7 With her eyes closed, Callie stretched out on a towel on the beach, baking in the late afternoon sun. She was so glad the introductions were over. 
Not that the awkwardness was gone. No, that was very much alive. Why did they have to make such a big deal about her bringing someone? Yeah, it was someone famous, but he was a person, and they made it sound like she was some stalker. At least he'd somewhat remembered her and hadn't heard it from her crazy sisters. She smiled as his conversation with her niece came to mind. Her heart melted as she'd overheard. Especially since Tucker had no idea what he'd done for her niece or what it meant to have someone like him give her advice. I'll be cheering you on. Her heart melted all over again as the words replayed through her mind. Uh, Callie, Tucker's voice pulled her from her thoughts. She opened her eyes and blinked at the sudden brightness. Hey, back already? Yeah. Something in his voice made her sit up. What's wrong? He took a seat on the towel next to her. Our marriage was leaked. It was a good thing she was sitting down. W what? Leaked. How? I don't know. I just got off the phone with Stacy. All I know is that it's been picked up and the press is digging into you. Digging into her? Callie felt the color drain from her face. What if they found out she wasn't an accountant? As quick as she thought it, she shook it off. No, they wouldn't find that. Not only did she have a pen name, but Gil and Derek had taken precautions against anyone finding out she worked as a reporter. She sure wanted to tell Tucker, though. It felt so wrong to keep it from him. Wouldn't he eventually find out? And if he found out after being lied to for a year, wouldn't that make it worse? But she had a contract. Was it still enforceable since their marriage was leaked before her sister's wedding? She thought for a second. Yeah, it was, because she hadn't thought to include that detail in the contract. Ugh. She was so stupid. At the time, she had no reason to think it'd be leaked, but she should have known. Are you okay? Tucker asked. I don't know. Are you? I don't know. Your mom isn't going to be happy, I do know that. Callie snorted. Her mom? Oh, this was going to be fun. That's if Georgia didn't kill her. She touched her fingers to her temple and sucked in a deep breath. Why did this have to happen? We just needed a few days. Just until after my sister's wedding. I don't understand why anyone would leak it. My best guess is that it was Derek. He wanted to get the ball rolling. They want to get a tour set up, and he wants my fans to buy this relationship. The best way to do that is to have enough space that people don't connect it with the tour. Callie's jaw dropped. A tour? Yeah. I didn't know about that. That's amazing news. He shrugged. Thanks, but what do you want to do about your family? Why didn't Tucker seem happier about touring? Wasn't that what he wanted? But that wasn't the current problem. Her family was. Let me tell them. I can take the heat. No way. He held up a hand. There's no way I'm letting you take this on alone. I'm the other half of this thing, and that's not how I operate. Her heart did a little dance. She knew he was a good guy. He'd always been sweet and never backed down. During one of their dates, he caught a guy roughing up his girlfriend and stepped in. Callie was pretty sure she could pinpoint that moment as when she fell for him. Really? Of course, this is part of having each other's backs. I mean, we're friends, right? She nodded. Right. He took her hand in his. Good. Let's go find everyone and rip the band-aid off. Wait, we're going to have to share a room. Her heart hit triple digits and rocketed toward four. Tucker took a deep breath. I'll sleep on the floor. Callie shook her head. No, that's not why I mentioned it. You won't have any privacy. I'm so sorry. 
he tilted his head. I'll be okay. Like I said, I can sleep on the floor. It's a big bed, and we're adults. You don't have to sleep on the floor. Why did she say that? Sharing a bed with him? Just sitting next to him had her brain scrambled. But what had she said? They were adults. She could handle it. He stood and held out his hand to her once more. Come on, Mrs. Hawk. Let's go tell your family. She let him pull her up. Okay, she said and gathered her towel. As they walked to the house, the dread began building in her stomach as she looked for her parents. She could have sworn they'd been on the beach not long ago. When they got to the house, she stopped at the back door, took a deep breath, and stepped through. Mom? Dad? Their voices drifted from the living room, and she stopped just out of sight, motioning for Tucker to stay quiet. She can't be serious about dating that man, her mom said. Fury flooded Callie. Serious about dating Tucker? Why did her mom have to be like that? Part of the reason Callie didn't fight harder to be with him when they first dated was because of her mom. Tucker wasn't a lawyer or a CPA or something else equally wonderful. If Heath wasn't so successful, he wouldn't be good enough for Georgia. For some reason, though, no matter how successful Tucker was, he'd never measure up. Her dad took her mom's hands in his. Honey, if she likes the boy, what does it matter? As I recall, we weren't exactly the apple of your mom's eye either. But, Francis, you proved yourself. He's a singer. What happens when he's no longer popular? How will he take care of her? Callie is a successful woman. She can take care of him. Isn't that what we've taught our girls? That they don't need men to take care of them? I know, but Tucker Hawk? He's just. Callie had heard enough. She stepped into the living room, her face flushed, followed by Tucker. He's just what, mom? Her mom and dad startled. I just meant, he's not exactly, her mom stuttered. He's perfect. Have you heard him sing? His voice is beautiful. It's rich and deep and wonderful. His lyrics are soulful, and they take you on a journey. He's a fantastic singer. And it doesn't matter. I married him this morning, so there. Well, that wasn't how she'd planned to deliver the news, but there it was. Her mom gasped. You're married? Just before your sister? This is her week. Callie straightened her shoulders. And it's still Georgia's wedding week. I don't want anyone fussing over me. That's why I eloped. I didn't need anything fancy or planned or week-long. All I needed was the man I love and a minister. I'm perfectly happy with the way I got married. It was mostly true. Although, she had envisioned her family being present when she got married. But she didn't need all the frills that her sisters needed and wanted. How did you meet? Her mom asked. You mean you didn't overhear us at lunch? Callie asked. Clementine lifted her chin. I want to hear it again. Tucker and Callie locked gazes, and she was glad they'd come up with a convincing story. We met six months ago. He was in Vegas doing a show. Tucker put his arm around her waist. I was taking a walk on the strip, and paparazzi began following me, so I ducked into a little cafe. Callie tore her gaze from Tucker and looked at her parents. We started talking, and the rest is history. Why haven't we heard anything about you dating someone? Her dad asked. She shrugged. I don't know. I guess I was afraid if I told anyone, it'd mess things up. What about his drinking? Her mom asked. Callie sighed. Mom, I followed him all through my senior year of college. Every little dive bar, cafe, honky-tonk, you name it, and I never saw him pick up a drink. 
He, well, something happened, and while he didn't handle it the way I would have, he did his best. He's not drinking anymore, she said, turning her gaze back to him. He's done with all of that. Tucker squeezed her like he was saying thank you. And I won't let Callie down. Her mom's gaze swept from her to Tucker and back. I can't believe you do this to Georgia. Do what to Georgia? Georgia asked as she walked up behind Callie. Callie whirled around, but before she could say a word, her mom said, apparently, Callie got married this morning. Georgia blinked. What? It wasn't supposed to come out yet. I was going to wait until after you were married to tell everyone, Callie said. Her sister's eyes widened as her mouth formed an O. You're married? Tucker moved his arm to around her shoulder, almost like a protective gesture, as he looked at Georgia. This is my fault. I don't know what happened, but someone on my management team let it leak that I got married. But they don't know where we are. We should be okay, Callie added. And I've got security close by in case they do find us. No one will be getting into the wedding. You have my word on that, Tucker said. A smile grew on Georgia's face. You are definitely singing at my wedding, and I'm putting the video on YouTube. Their mom gaped. Georgia, you're okay with this? Georgia shrugged. Are you kidding? Of course I'm okay. I'm the only one who will have had a famous singer perform at my wedding. She grinned. Let Rachel take that and stick it. Tucker's eyebrows knitted together. Rachel? Oh, she thought having the president show up in Carolina Beach during her wedding was the bee's knees. But you? You blow that out of the water. The president didn't even come to her wedding. He just caused a traffic jam, making her wedding late. Georgia wiggled like she was dancing for joy. Callie took her hand. Are you really okay? I'm truly sorry. I had no idea it would get leaked. Georgia hugged her. I'm fine. She smiled softly. Are you happy? How did Callie answer that? The marriage was fake, but so far, things had been good. Yeah, I'm great. Tucker, she said and looked at him, is a great guy. Then that's all that matters, Georgia said. Hey! What about your honeymoon? We'll take one later. I wasn't going to miss your wedding week. Callie smiled. Can I tell everyone? Georgia wiggled her eyebrows. Uh, yeah, I'm fine with that. Are you okay with it? Callie asked Tucker. He nodded. Yeah, I'm good. Georgia bounced on her toes. Awesome. She whirled around and skipped out of the house. Callie breathed a sigh of relief. At least she's not mad. But I'm not thrilled. Were you going to lie to us the whole time about being married? Her mom asked. Callie's shoulders sagged. I didn't want to overshadow Georgia's wedding. The best way to have done that would have been to not get married this morning. You didn't even come talk to your dad or me. That's my fault, Mr. and Mrs. Chapman. Callie wanted to tell you, but I really didn't want it leaked. I thought someone would overhear it. I should have insisted she call you the moment she said yes. Please, blame me. Her mom pursed her lips and shook her head. I would never have believed you'd rush to get married. What on earth were you thinking? Tears pooled in Callie's eyes. I was thinking I was in love and that I wanted to marry him. I was thinking my mom and dad would be happy for me. Weren't you just saying the other day how much you wished I'd find someone and settle down? Well, I did. But this was so fast, Clementine said. Francis draped his arm around her mom's shoulder. Clementine, at this point, what's done is done. This gives us a few days to get to know the young man. Let's just take a step back and not get too excited, okay? 
But, honey, she's made her choice. What we need to do now is find a way to support her. But Edmund will be attending the wedding. Her dad lifted an eyebrow and shot Callie a glance. Yes, well, he'll just have to find his own date, now, won't he? Callie rolled her lips inward to keep from smiling. Her dad knew how she felt about Edmund. With a sniff, Clementine eyed Callie one more time. I guess, but I'm so disappointed in you, Callie. You should have told us. She narrowed her gaze at Tucker. No matter what someone else told you to do. And that's why telling her mom she wasn't a CPA was so hard, that look of disappointment. Callie hated it. She wanted her mom's approval, but nothing she ever did was good enough. Yes, she should have, Mrs. Chapman. That's all on me, Tucker said. Callie touched his arm. He was being downright wonderful. No, that's not the whole truth. I didn't want to call you because I was afraid you'd try to talk me out of it, and I didn't want to argue with you right before I got married. Tucker's being sweet by trying to make it sound like it was all him. Tucker pulled her tighter against him. We'll both take the blame, but I do hope you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. Just give your mom a little time to adjust, Francis said as he stuck his hand out and shook Tucker's. Welcome to the family, son. Thanks. Callie smiled, but she knew her mom wasn't done. As soon as the chance presented itself, her mom would give her an earful about her choices, timing, and Tucker. By the look on her mom's face, Tucker would have to literally rescue a litter of kittens from a burning house before he got her approval. She didn't really want to put kittens in danger, but she sure wanted her mom to like Tucker. There was no way she could handle a year of her mom hating him. Nope, it was better for everyone if her family believed the relationship was real. Chapter 8 With a click, the door shut behind Tucker as he set Callie's luggage down. They'd spent the rest of the day hanging out with her family until the sun went down. And now that they had no excuse for staying in separate rooms, they were sharing the one Tucker had taken. I was serious about sleeping on the floor, Tucker said. Callie shook her head. No, the bed is big enough. We'll be fine. She smiled, but he could see weariness in her eyes. That's how he'd felt since he'd spoken to Stacy, and he'd only felt worse after talking to their parents. He sat down hard on the bed and put his head in his hands. I'm so sorry this leaked. I don't know why or how. When the bed next to him moved, he lifted his head. I knew this was a possibility when I signed the contract. She took his hand in hers. You're famous, and everyone wants to know everything about you. It's okay. My mom is never happy with me. It wouldn't have mattered if I called or not. If it wasn't her making the decision for me, she'd have had something to say. How did your parents take it? Had you already told them? He was the one who messed everything up, and here she was, trying to comfort him. I called, but they already knew. They weren't happy, that's for sure. I told them we'd stop by on our way to L.A. Her lips quirked up. Well, of course we'd have to stop by. I'm sure they want to meet me. If I was your mom, I'd be wanting to make sure you didn't marry a complete nut job. Although, I kinda am, but I'm a good nut, like Brazil or Cashew. She chuckled, and he couldn't stop himself from chuckling with her. Thanks, he said and straightened. I'm so sorry. She shrugged and let go of his hand. It's okay. Honestly, I think I like this better. Now that it's out, my mom has time to digest it. Maybe before we leave, she'll even be a little happy for me. Is she always this tough on you? Callie nodded. Always. I'm the only one of her daughters to take up accounting. Georgia and Michelle are both lawyers, Rachel is a doctor, and Vivian is a physicist. All professions that are respectable, but I'm the only who can take over her accounting firm when she retires. 
Oh, so it's more like legacy. That kind of thing. Yeah, and my mom isn't a bad person. She loves me, but I think that for her, when she looks at me, it's her only chance of keeping her accounting firm alive. She sees me through that filter instead of just seeing me and what I want. My mom and dad were always supportive of me. Shoot, my dad bought my first guitar. Took me to my first gig. My mom worked two jobs just to afford my guitar and singing lessons until I got old enough to work. Without them, I wouldn't be where I am. He sighed. Part of why it hurt not to tell them the truth about what I was doing. Her eyes widened. They don't know it's a fake either? For some reason, I thought they'd be in on the secret. Nope, Derek put that in the contract. I couldn't tell them and can't tell them anything. Although, my mom can sniff out a lie like no one's business. If we're able to keep this from her, I'll be taking her to the doctor. When Callie chewed her bottom lip, he had to stop himself from staring at her full lips. Thinking about kissing her may not have been the last thing he wanted, but it was the last thing he needed. It would only lead to problems, and he had enough of those. I haven't met Derek, but I don't think he's a good guy. Tucker tilted his head. Why would you say that? Uh, well, I just have a feeling. The way she said it, it gave him a weird vibe. What feeling? Well, he's the only one who would have leaked it, right? Or could it have been Stacy? No, it wasn't Stacy. She signed a contract too. Tucker had considered that too but dismissed it. Stacy wouldn't have leaked the marriage. If the contract she signed was as aggressive as the one he did, she wouldn't have risked it. Derek's really the only one it could have been, but there's no way to prove it was him. He'll just blame some office underling and fire them. And now that it's out, there's no way to put the cat back in the bag. Callie nodded. Okay, so we know it's Derek, or we have a good suspicion. Now that we know what kind of person he is, we just watch our backs. He's really underhanded. Why did you sign with him in the first place? Tucker ran his hand through his hair. The first label I signed with was bought out by Reckless. The first president was a guy named Harris Freeman. He was a good guy, treated his artists well, and was well-respected too. The label was making decent money, but the board of directors wanted more, so they fired Harris and brought in Derek. So I didn't sign with him, I got stuck with him. But you renewed your contract with him? Yeah, because no other label would take me at the time. I didn't want to stop singing, and Derek offered a good deal. I just had to keep the drinking on the down low. But that last night of drinking, the one where they got a picture of me face down on the sidewalk, that's when they cut me. Tucker paused as he thought about how things were during the worst part of his drinking. Had Derek used that as a way to push him so far down that his only choice was to sign with Reckless again? A sick feeling gurgled in his stomach. It wasn't beneath Derek to do something like that. I remember that picture, she said softly as she leaned her head against his shoulder. I have no idea what the whole story is, but I know you were hurting. I'm so sorry no one was there for you. Tucker flinched. Why did that hit him so hard? He had people who were there for him. Okay, not a lot, but when that picture was taken, he had tons of friends. It wasn't their fault he acted like that. He pulled away from her. What makes you think I didn't have anyone who cared about me? Callie's face was a mix of surprise and confusion. I just meant, if you had people who cared, maybe you could have talked to someone instead of drinking. I can't imagine what. You're right. You can't imagine, and you don't know my life. Just because you read something on a fan website doesn't mean you know me. He knew that wasn't true, but he didn't care. What right did she have to judge him or his friends? Tears pooled in her eyes. That's not. Tucker stood and held his hand up, stopping her. I don't want to talk about this anymore. 
You don't know me, and I don't know you. We're faking a relationship to get my career back on track, and you're getting a good payday. That's all. Callie stood and turned her back on him. Right. That's what we are. It's good to be reminded. There was a slight tremble in her voice. He dropped his head out of shame. Part of him wanted to apologize right then, but maybe this was a good thing. This way, her anger would help him keep his distance. Clearly, he wasn't ready for a relationship or he wouldn't be such a jerk. Callie quietly gathered her pajamas and slipped out of the room without saying a word. Tucker sank down onto the bed. Is this really how he wanted things to be for the next year? His fake wife angry with him? How would they pull off being in love that way? Why couldn't he just get his act together? He planned to apologize when she returned, but he needed to make sure she understood they were just friends who needed clearer boundaries, including a rule that kept them from offering advice or being sorry for the other. All he had to do was survive 12 months with her. With enough rules, he could do that. Once his life was back on track, then he'd think about a relationship. Chapter 9 For the second night in a row, Callie decided to go for a walk on the beach after she changed for bed. Rubbing her arms, she sat and searched the sky as the sun lowered. Dusk brought vivid colors that danced along the horizon. It was beautiful. This was her favorite spot for reflection, except right now all her thoughts were filled with anger. She still wasn't in the mood to talk to Tucker. When she'd returned the night before, she'd found him on the floor asleep. For a second, her anger subsided as she realized how sweet it was that he decided on his own to give her the bed. In a way, it was like an apology, but he'd hurt her so badly. As sweet as the gesture was, she'd spent the day avoiding him. They'd had a few wedding things to take care of like final fittings and making sure the flowers, caterer, and music were all set to go. Thankfully, now that Tucker would be singing, he'd been added to the schedule, which would keep him busy. Tucker had used his words like knives. For the first time, she regretted signing that contract. Yeah, it would be a considerable windfall for the hospital, but it wasn't turning out that great for her. Not when her heart ached like it did. He'd relegated her to fan. He may as well have called her a stalker. Now she knew there was no way he remembered dating her. If he had, he never would have said anything so hurtful. He would have known she cared about him as a person. But the moment the words left his mouth, it was proof that their short relationship in Nashville had been one-sided. Callie, however, remembered everything, holding hands, his sweet nature, and how much she enjoyed being around him. All of that was gone now. The Tucker she married was nothing like the man she knew in college. Maybe she hadn't known him as well as she thought. Had he been playing a part back then too? Hey! George's bright voice pulled her out of her thoughts. Callie looked up, and all her sisters were standing there. What's up? Vivian grinned. You're having a bachelorette party. Oh, no, I don't want one. I'm good. Michelle raised a single eyebrow. I told you she'd say no. Rachel crossed her arms over her chest. And we aren't taking no for an answer. We're going into Wilmington, and you're going to have a good time. Callie shook her head. Really, I'm fine. Besides, George's party is on Friday. That'd be two trips to Wilmington. So what, Michelle said. Really? It's okay. Plus, I don't want to deal with the press. What about not taking no for answer are you not grasping? Rachel asked. Besides we're Chapmans. We can handle the reporters. Georgia touched her arm. The guys are grabbing Tucker at this very minute for a bachelor party on the beach. You two lovebirds will be fine for one night alone. Besides, you can't spring being married on us and not expect a little partying. You're married. Let's celebrate, Vivian said. 
There was no way Callie was going to get her sisters to back down. It was either have a bachelorette party or tell them the truth, and since she couldn't do that, the party was the only option. All right. Can I change? Georgia snorted. I would hope so. Bathrobe and pajamas aren't what we'd call dance attire. She took Callie's hand and pulled her up. Forty-five minutes later, Callie was squeezed into Vivian's SUV and zooming toward Wilmington. Vivian glanced at Callie as she sat in the front passenger seat. So, I have to ask. Does Tucker not remember dating you in college? Callie gulped. She didn't remember telling them that. What are you talking about? Please, you may not have outright said it, but we all knew you two were dating. When we came to visit you, we could see it. You were totally into him, and by the way he looked at you, the feeling was mutual, Vivian said. Mmmmhmm, Rachel said, and the rest of her sisters responded in chorus. We didn't date, she said, mustering every ounce of confidence she had and putting it into the words. Vivian scoffed. Please, you really expect us to believe that? Look, it was a long time ago. I barely remember it. Phew, that was a big honking lie. Even she could smell it. Georgia laughed. Yeah, right. You still look at him in that gooey-eyed way. Did she? Well, not after last night. He'd put the brakes on anything remotely gooey, but she couldn't tell her sisters that. Whatever. Can we talk about something else? There is nothing better to talk about than Tucker Hawk, Vivian said. You're the reason I'm such a huge fan of his. Do you know what happened to make him go all crazy last year? asked Rachel. No more than the rest of the public. That was before we reconnected, and he has a hard time talking about it. Now, that was some truth. The way he'd prickled when she said he had no one to support him was a clear indication he wasn't ready to talk about it. So, you've never discussed it at all? Michelle asked. Well, a little, but it's hard for him. I mean, his career crashed at his feet. What if that happened to you? Would you want to rehash it all the time? Callie needed the line of questioning to move away from Tucker's hot mess. Besides, all that's in the past. They're even working on a tour for him. A new tour? Vivian asked. Please tell me he's coming to North Carolina. Callie laughed. I don't know yet. The details are still being hashed out, but if he does, I'll make sure you have a backstage pass. Vivian let go of the wheel long enough to clap. Yes. The rest of the drive, the conversation went from details about her meeting Tucker to all sorts of things. Once they reached Wilmington, they found a club and danced for most of the night. When they got home, it was just after midnight, and her mom was waiting for them as they returned. Girls, I need to talk to Callie a moment, her mom said as she leaned against the stair railing. Callie had been a little groggy until that moment. It was too late to have it out with her. Mom, does it have to be right now? Can't we do this when I've had a little sleep? I think now is as good as any time. Her mom eyed each of her sisters. Good night, girls. Her sisters quickly raced up the stairs, and one by one their doors shut, leaving Callie alone with their mom. Okay, what did you need to talk about? What are you doing with your life, Callie? Marrying some country music singer? We had a plan. You were going finish working for the no-name firm in Nashville, and then you were coming home. You were going to take over for me when I retire. We? What was this we business? That was your plan. I don't recall you ever asking for my input. Her mom rolled her eyes. We both know you would never be happy staying at that little firm. You were destined to take over for me. I have one of the top firms in the country. Edmund and I have even been talking about working together. Did you know he's doing contract law now? 
That's great for Edmund, but I'm not interested in taking over for you, Mom. I like my life in Nashville. I love the shops, the music scene, the people, I don't want to live in Wilmington. Don't be ridiculous. I'm offering you a great opportunity. You're 28. Most people your age would think you'd won the lottery. Callie shook her head. Yeah, if the lottery was rigged. Having success handed to me isn't success. It's just walking in your footsteps. Her mom looked at her as though she'd thrown water in her face. Is there something wrong with my footsteps? No, but they're your footsteps. I want to walk my own path. You are. I'm just lending a little support. When George's wedding is over, you'll go back to Nashville, put in your notice, and you'll come work with me. We'll be partners. That way when you take over, you'll have a stake in it. No, I won't. Besides, I'll be living with Tucker. Her mom crossed her arms over her chest. And he's not progressive enough to know you need your own career? He can live anywhere and sing. I won't do it, mom. I can't, Callie said and brushed past her mom into the kitchen. Her mom followed her. Yes, you can. No, I can't. I don't have my CPA. The words rushed out before Callie knew what she was saying, but there was no denying her mom had heard each one. Her mom's jaw dropped. What do you mean you don't have your CPA? You were one section away from having it. I didn't take it because I didn't want to be a CPA. So you're just an accountant? That can be rectified. You'll just take the test. Problem solved. I don't want to take it. And she wouldn't. Being an accountant had made her insane. She was good at it, but there was no joy in the work. Her mom let out a heavy sigh. I just don't understand you. You have a great opportunity. If Tucker can't stand behind you while you have your own career, then maybe he isn't the man for you. But Edmund is, right? His family has been friends with our family for ages. They're a good solid family. He's doing well in his father's law firm. Last I heard, he was even close to making partner. Certainly better than some country singer whose career blew up. I can't even believe you married someone like that. Callie braced her hands on the counter as her shoulders slumped forward. You're just never going to accept me for me, are you? I'm never going to be worthy of your approval if I live my life the way I choose. The only way you'd be pleased is if I take over your firm. That's not true. Callie looked up, unable to hide the tears in her eyes. You pushed me to take those classes in college, even after you knew I wanted to do something else. So I took them, hoping and praying I'd love it, but I don't. I hate it. I hate the work. Are you saying you've hated it this whole time? Yes. Why didn't you tell me? Callie wiped away a tear from her cheek. I tried, but every time, you never listened. I love you, sweetheart. I just want good things for you. For you to be able to provide for yourself. To have a good life with a solid footing. I know, and I appreciate you. I'm so proud that you're my mom. You're this successful, brilliant, intelligent woman. You're the kind of woman any girl would look up to, but your plan for my life doesn't work. Who will take over for me when I retire? You're perfect and capable, and you'd be the best choice. Callie shook her head. Not if I hate it. How long would your firm last when the head of it is miserable? I just can't believe you've felt this way all this time and you've been lying to me. I'm sorry. Callie felt a sharp pain in her heart. I didn't want to lie. You were so set on me taking over your firm that you never heard me. I heard you, I just thought you'd change your mind. Her mom exhaled sharply. 
that still doesn't explain showing up with a musician for a husband. Tucker is a brilliant singer and musician. He's successful, wealthy, known worldwide, and has millions of fans but you call him that musician. He writes songs that will make you cry. He sings with all his heart and soul, and his performances are amazing. But beyond that, he's a sweet, kind man. Someone you haven't even given a chance because he doesn't measure up to your impossible standards. If he was all that successful, he wouldn't have been drinking. Has he told you why he was drinking? Well, no, but I don't need to know. But she wanted to know. She wanted him to trust her and let her in. Then how do you know it won't happen again? Her mom crossed her arms over her chest. How well do you even know him? Callie squared her jaw. I know him well enough. What's his favorite color? What was his favorite color? She searched her memory. Green. Does he want to have children? We haven't talked about that. Her mom gaped at her. You married a man, and you haven't even talked about children? What if he doesn't want to have children? He tours for a living. Can you imagine trying to raise a family in that environment? It had gone from interrogation to torture. It's something on our list of things to discuss, and when we do, we'll be mature enough to compromise. What if he won't? He will, Callie said and walked to her mom. She took her hands in hers. Mom, I'm happy. Would you, for me, at least give him a chance? He's a good man. Her mom held her gaze a second. I don't know if I can, but I'll try. After George's wedding, you and I are discussing the firm and your lack of a CPA license, do you understand? You've been lying to me, and I want to know why, because I think there's more to this. I know you, Callie, and you wouldn't have quit midstream if you didn't have something else going on. Callie let her mom's hands go. She wished she could come clean now, but she couldn't. I'll make you a deal. You give Tucker a chance, and we'll talk, okay? Her mom shook her head. No, I'll make you a deal. I'll give Tucker a chance, and you'll reconsider taking your CPA test and taking over the firm. I'm depending on you, Callie. You're the only who can. This is my legacy, and you're all I have. Way to twist the knife. Jeez. Until she could really tell her mom the whole truth, this was the best deal she was going to get. All right, I accept. But you make an effort to give him a chance. Then we have a deal. Her mom brightened and pulled her into a hug. I love you. I just want the best for you. Callie softened. I know you do. I love you too. Her mom released her and smiled. Well, we should get to bed. That sandcastle contest is tomorrow. Don't want to snooze through it. Yeah, I'll go up in a minute. With one last glance, her mom left the kitchen, leaving Callie alone. She braced her hands against the kitchen counter and let her chin fall to her chest. Her mom knew she wasn't a CPA, and she needed to tell Tucker. If he found out from her mom that she'd lied, their friendship would be over. He'd hate her, and she'd spend the next year living with an enemy. Chapter 10 Tucker had tried to talk to Callie all day, but every time he got close enough to try, she'd tuck tail and run. He knew he'd messed up the night before, but he had no idea how bad until that morning. She'd taken so long to return to the room the night before that he hadn't been sure she was even coming back. He'd finally fallen asleep on the floor, only to wake up that morning to find she'd slept in the bed and had already left again. Now he hoped to have a chance when they were alone in their room, even going so far as to wait on her in the room, until he looked out the window and saw her on the beach. As he pulled open the door, Ethan, Will, and Denver were standing there. Hey! Great timing. We were just coming to get you. Yeah, hey, I need to talk to Callie. Denver shrugged. Too late. 
Her sisters are going after her too. They're taking her into Wilmington for a bachelorette party. So, it's either stay up here all alone or hang with us. Inwardly, Tucker groaned. He needed to apologize, but it was like the universe was against him. Come on, man, Ethan said. No point in just sitting in here. No, there wasn't. If he did stay in the room, he'd just end up obsessing over things. He may as well go and keep his mind occupied until he could talk to Callie. All right, sounds like a plan. Will rubbed his hands together. Awesome. But where are the kids? asked Tucker. Denver smiled. Grandparents. Ah, Tucker said as he followed them out of the room. As they made their way to the bonfire, there wasn't a soul in sight. The salty sea air was so thick Tucker could taste it. He dragged in a breath, wishing he could talk to Callie, but couldn't help but grin when he saw Heath's cheesy grin as he manned the bonfire. Ah, man, I was hoping there'd be fighting and dragging. You ruined it, dude, Heath said. Tucker laughed. Sorry, I'm not much of a fighter. Ethan tapped Tucker on the shoulder. Uh, hey, we don't want to bring up a sore subject, but we thought you might not want alcohol here. If we're wrong, we'll go get some beer or something. We weren't trying to say anything. We just figured it was easier to get drinks than it was to get rid of them. Tucker didn't know what to say. He couldn't remember a time when someone had thought about him enough to think about what they were doing around him. Uh, actually, I don't want any. It may be hard to believe, but I'm not a drinker. Will nodded. The only reason we know anything is because our wives are huge fans. And from the bottom of our hearts, let us say thanks to your nuptials, Denver said with a laugh. Tucker grinned. You're welcome. Seriously, Heath said. We just want you to know it's cool with us if you do want something. I mean, it's okay to celebrate. Tucker waved him off. Nah, I'm good with some sweet iced tea or lemonade. Denver cleared his throat. My uncle was an alcoholic, so I know it can be hard. There's no judgment here, man. Thanks, I appreciate that, Tucker said. They'd been considerate of him, and it was a good feeling. Will pulled open the cooler. You want tea or lemonade? Tea, Tucker said and took a filled mason jar from him. He sat in one of the chairs around the fire. Ethan sat in a chair next to him. Are you going to be touring again soon? Tucker nodded and took a sip. It was good. Not too sweet and no bitter aftertaste. My manager tells me there's a tour in the works. Denver grinned and sat in the chair next to Ethan. That's awesome. You excited? Was he? The idea of a tour sure sounded great, but he knew it'd be barely controlled chaos. Yeah, and nervous. Heath snorted and took a seat on the other side of Denver. Man, I can't even imagine. I mean, that many people? No way. Thanks for talking to Mary, by the way, Ethan said. Tucker took another sip of his tea and shrugged. No problem. Your daughter is cute. Ethan grinned wide. Yep, that's my girl. How's she doing? Denver asked Ethan. Better, now that we have her on some ADHD medicine. She can focus more. She's still super forgetful sometimes. Tucker must have looked confused because Ethan said, Mary was a preemie. Well, a micro preemie. She was in the hospital for months. I'm sorry, Tucker said. And here he was thinking another chore would be hard. He couldn't fathom having a child and the helplessness Ethan would have felt. That must have been hard. I can't describe the feeling of walking out of the hospital without my child. And there was nothing I could do to fix her or make her better. We were just super blessed that the children's hospital had good facilities and excellent doctors. Wow. No, 
Tucker couldn't begin to understand what that was like. I had no idea. Ethan shrugged. Most people don't, and it can be hard to make people understand that she's different because they can't see it. If she had a broken arm or something, it'd be easier to explain. But the brain? Even telling people she had a grade 4 brain bleed, it just doesn't click. Or telling them she was less than 2 pounds or as long as a sheet of regular paper. They don't get it. Tucker didn't have many friends with kids, but he knew that was tiny. Less than two pounds? Yeah, but enough about kids, Ethan said. This is a bachelor party. What else is in that cooler? Tucker smiled. Yeah, this is what friendship was. Sitting around a fire, talking, and people who cared enough to bring up the past just long enough to make sure he was okay without dwelling on it. Back to the tour, Denver said. Have you written any new songs lately? No, he'd felt so empty that nothing came out, but he couldn't let anyone know that. So, he did what he did best, he covered for himself. I've been working on a few things. That's great. Do you know what cities you'll be in? Vivian will die if you don't come to North Carolina, Ethan said. Tucker laughed. I have no idea yet. The last time I spoke to my manager, she was still putting everything together. Hey, guys, Edmund said as he strolled to a stop. I saw the bonfire and thought I'd come find out what's happening. Denver glanced at Tucker and tipped his chin to him. We're having a bachelor party for our buddy Tucker. This is a bachelor party? Edmund asked. It's my idea of one, Tucker replied. Edmund tilted his head. Really? I pictured you in a loud club, lights flashing and drinks for everyone. Will stood. Come on, man. If you want to hang out, you'll need to park the digs. Tucker shrugged. It's okay, Will. Ethan touched his shoulder. No, it's not. Denver stood with Will. I agree. You mess with him, you mess with us. Callie married him, he's family. We like him. Tucker was floored. These guys didn't know him at all. The fact that they stood there defending him felt good. Callie was so right. He didn't have a single friend who would have stood up for him, not like these guys. He was glad he was sitting. In fact, he couldn't remember a time in the past when anyone had taken up for him or asked him how he was doing. Stacy had asked, but he'd never seen her as someone to confide in. Chris was too busy touring. The past year, he'd been completely alone. Thinking back to those months when he was drinking and partying, he knew he had another reason to apologize to Callie. He'd had no one who cared about him. They'd only cared about what they could get out of Tucker Hawk. Not what Tucker, the person, needed. Edmund put up his hands. Okay, sorry. No more digs. He looked at Tucker. I'm sorry. That was uncalled for. He stuck out his hand in a show of contrition. Tucker shook his hand and said, apology accepted. Will took his seat again, and Denver pulled the cooler open. Want a drink, Edmund? Denver asked. We've got sweet tea and lemonade. I'll take a lemonade. Edmund took the drink Denver handed him and took a seat in the sand. So, married in Vegas. What made you get married so quickly? Tucker knew this was coming, but he suddenly felt ten degrees hotter. Callie and I were dating for a while, and I just popped the question. I hadn't planned it, but when you meet the right person, why wait? Edmund took a drink. I guess so. I can't see myself doing it, but if it works for you. It did. Ethan says you dated Callie in high school, but she never mentioned that. Tucker took a drink while he waited for Edmund to answer. The man took a deep breath. Eh, well, it didn't end well. My fault. 
Seems she's happy with you, though. I hope so. Happy with him? That's not the word he'd use. He'd been a jerk to her. She'd pegged his relationships for what they were, and he'd lost his temper. Denver took his seat again. Will Callie go with you when you tour? Tucker hadn't thought about that. She can if she wants. Will whistled. I bet that tour bus is awesome. Tucker exhaled heavily. It is for about a week. After that, not so much. It's always moving, so even when I'm standing on land, it feels like I'm still on the bus. My life isn't as glamorous as you think. Will snorted. Oh yeah, cause five-star hotels and the finest food is just terrible. Tucker grinned. Okay, it does have its perks. There's this burger joint in Texas that can't be beat. From there, the guys discussed everything from what it was like the first time he performed on stage to if the minister they'd used looked like Elvis. The guys were easy to talk to and hang out with, well, minus Edmund. For some reason, he rubbed Tucker the wrong way. Not that Edmund did anything outright, but it was little things, like trying to find a problem. Or make one. And Tucker couldn't remember the details. Like her favorite food, flour, and whether they were planning to have kids. That question nearly made him choke. He wanted kids, but he had no idea if Callie did. He also felt an increasing urgency to apologize to Callie. Every question Edmund asked increased Tucker's desire to talk to her. He determined he would put his heart into the apology. He wanted her to know she was right. He wasn't ready to tell her everything, but he was ready to put his arm down a little. Let her stand a little closer. Finally, the party was over when Ethan got a text from Vivian. They put out the fire, grabbed the cooler, and went back to the house. When they walked into the kitchen, Callie was sitting at the kitchen table, looking like she'd been in a fight with a bear. Hey, did you guys have fun? She asked. Ethan laughed. We had a great time. Edmund even stopped by. Callie rolled her eyes. Great. I'm sure that was awesome. Tucker approached and squatted in front of her. You okay? I'm just tired. If it helps, you look great. He smiled. Tucker. You think we could go to the room? I need to talk to you. She held his gaze a heartbeat, nodded, and pushed out of the chair. Night, guys, she said as they walked out of the kitchen. They reached the room, and the moment the door was shut, Tucker said, I'm so sorry for being such a jerk. You were right, and facing the truth hurt. So instead of being honest, I got mad and said something stupid. He stepped closer. I really am sorry. And you think that fixes it? She crossed her arms over her chest. You acted like I stalked some stupid gossip website, but I didn't need to read on a website how Petra hurt you. It's obvious she hurt you. I know, and it was wrong to say that. I was upset, and you hit a nerve. Do you think I like looking back and knowing no one cared about me? It, his voice cracked. It hurts almost as bad as finding out Petra was using me. Callie dropped her arms and stepped to him. You're right. I can't begin to imagine that. She ran her fingers through his hair and down his cheek. I'm so sorry you've been hurt. But I'm your friend, and I do care. He covered her hand with his. I know in my head that's true, but... She took his hand and held it to her chest. It'd be hard to trust people after what Petra did. I get it, and it's okay. It'd be a lie if I said I didn't want to know what happened, but when or if you're ever ready, I'm here, okay? For some reason, he did believe her. Thanks. He held her gaze for a heartbeat, and it was like his heart forgot he'd been hurt. Without even thinking, he leaned in to kiss her, but she turned away. I think it's probably for the best if we just get some sleep, she said and stepped back. 
I'm going to get dressed for bed. I'll be back in a minute. And I appreciate the respect you showed me last night, but you don't have to sleep on the floor. She picked up some clothes and left the room. When was the last time a woman had turned down a kiss from him? And when was the last time he felt desperate for a kiss from a woman? And now he had to sleep next to her. What was he going to do? He'd put his arm down to close some of the distance, and she'd put hers up with a pull on the end. He deserved it. Did he really think he could just say he was sorry, and they'd kiss and make up? They weren't married, and he hadn't even been honest enough to tell her he remembered dating her. Or that he was falling for her all over again. Even as he thought to dismiss it, he knew he couldn't. The universe had a large boot, and his behind was getting sore. Maybe he needed to get the message before the boot became permanently implanted. Chapter 11 Pounding on the door brought Callie out of a deep sleep. Callie? Vivian called through the door. It's time to get up. The sandcastle contest starts in an hour. Callie yawned and called back, I'm up. It was then that she realized her back was pressed against Tucker's chest. His arm was draped across her stomach, and his breath grazed her neck. Had her sister's big mouth not woke him up? When she tried to slip out of his grasp, he tightened his hold and groaned, I don't want to get up. I don't think we get a choice. He was so warm, and she needed to tell him that she wasn't a CPA. That would be sure to wake him up. Five more minutes, he moaned. His husky voice was far from being woke up. His nearness made her body go on the fritz. Her nerves tingled. She tried to free herself again, and he still wouldn't let go. Please, he pleaded. She smiled, but dread built in her belly. Telling him was necessary, but what if it just ruined his ability to trust her with other things? You want my mom waking us up? She finally asked. He took a deep breath. I'm up. When she twisted to face him, he smiled. I haven't slept that good in years. Wow, he looked good. No, she couldn't tell him right the second. Things between them felt nice, and she didn't want to ruin it. It's a good bed. I'm not giving the bed credit. Oh, she wanted to squeal like a girl talking to her crush on the phone, but she needed to keep her head. He tried to kiss her last night, and she'd had enough wits to dodge it. That was a win in her book. We should get up. He grimaced. Morning breath. She gasped and slapped her hand over her mouth. I'm so sorry. Like I don't have it? I bet it's worse than dragon fire. Callie threw her head back and laughed, trying to keep her breath from hitting him in the face. Then let's get up. Besides, they'll just keep coming. Come on, lovebirds, let's go, Vivian yelled through the door. See? Callie pulled her lips in. Fine, but you should know that I think you look pretty great first thing in the morning. He grinned and loosened his hold on her. She rolled her eyes and hopped out of bed. You are nothing but a big flirt. I'm not. I was being sincere, he said as he swung his legs over the bed and stood. His t-shirt had ridden up during the night, and she could see his muscled stomach. Phew, it was time for a shower. Callie picked up some clothes and, stopping at the door, narrowed her eyes. I'm going to brush my teeth and grab a quick shower, Charmer. She didn't mean to flirt back, but she couldn't stop herself. He was so cute, and the little torch she had for him refused to be tamped out. How was she supposed to protect him from herself if she couldn't control herself? That's what she decided last night before he came home. She might be lying to him, but that didn't mean she had to flirt or act like she was interested. That way when the truth came out, she could have a clear conscience. So much for that. Stupid heart. Stupid torch. Stupid everything. Maybe she'd have a gallon of cookie dough for breakfast. No, she should eat a pound of garlic. 
then Tucker wouldn't want to kiss her. He'd probably try to hold her out the window just to keep the stink out. Giggling to herself, she stepped into the bathroom and shut the door. Once showered and dressed, she let Tucker know it was free and went down for breakfast. This morning was casual, and there were muffins and fruit to pick from. Sadly, garlic or cookie dough seemed to be missing from the menu. She was finishing off the rest of her muffin when Tucker stopped at the door and leaned against the frame, smiling like his picture was being taken. The temperature in the kitchen seemed to boil. His shirt pulled tight against his muscles, and the board shorts showed off his dark skin so well. Phew, yeah, he was hotter than fresh jelly. And she knew he tasted just as sweet too. I see something good on the menu, he said as he winked at her. That goofball was flirting with her again. She leveled her gaze at him. Yeah, they're called blueberry muffins. What had gotten into him? He'd bitten her head off, then apologized, and now he was acting like they were a real couple. He was making her head spin. He pushed off the frame and walked to her. You have a bee in your bonnet, Mrs. Hawk. No, I do not. She sighed and was grateful they were the only two in the kitchen. Why are you flirting like this with me? Maybe I like to flirt. Well, I don't like you flirting. So stop. He leaned his hip against the counter and tucked a piece of her hair behind her ear. What's really got you so upset? I'm not a CPA. He straightened, and his eyes turned cloudy. What do you mean you aren't a CPA? His sharp tone nearly sliced her in two. I don't have my CPA. I lied because I didn't want to fight with my mom. She's wanted me to return to Wilmington and take over her firm when she retires. I told her I was a CPA because, Callie's lip trembled. Because I was a chicken. I've always been the biggest disappointment, and I couldn't handle her being disappointed in me yet again. But you are an accountant, right? Well, she was, just not practicing. Oh, she hated lying. What if he found out? But Gil had assured her that they buried her life as a reporter. Still, she felt icky for not being completely honest. I am. I just don't have the CPA license. I don't want it, but we made a deal last night. She clamped her lips shut and turned away from him. What kind of deal? She wiped her eyes and sniffed. Nothing. He turned her to face him. What deal? I told her if she gave you a chance that I'd reconsidered taking over the practice. His eyebrows knitted together. Why would you do that? Because if she gives you half a chance, she'll love you. And, she leaned in to whisper, we won't spend the next year with her working against us. If she likes you, she'll go to bat for you. I want you to have people who care about you. I want you to remember what that's like. He held her gaze for what seemed like forever. I'm beginning to recall. She pressed her hand to his chest. I know it's been a long time, but I want good things for you. You probably don't remember this, but I wanted you to share your talent with the world. They needed someone like you singing for them. His Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed. You're something special, you know that? You'd better eat something. My family will be discussing the contest in a bit, and trust me, you'll need a full stomach for that. He smiled and picked up a muffin. Yes, ma'am. He winked again. I'm gonna go see where everyone is. I'll be back, she said as she darted out the back door. Holy cow, it had taken Arctic tour of the South Pole to cool her down. What was he doing to her? Last night, she'd been determined to keep her distance, but with those electric blue eyes, that smile, and, oh, that voice. Goodness help her. How was she not a hot puddle on the floor? Callie took a deep cleansing breath, letting the air out slowly through her nose. No, she could do this. She could keep him at a distance, and it would all be just fine. 
her heart would get on board or get left. At least, that's what she told herself. Chapter 12 Leaning against the wall, Tucker watched Callie from across the living room as she sat next to her sister Vivian on the couch. Callie had always looked good, but today he saw her in a different light. With her colorful sundress, her dark hair pulled up in a messy bun, and those little sandals with her cute little toes poking out, she was irresistible. The night before, he'd spend hours splitting his attention between the ceiling and watching Callie sleep. His favorite part of the night? When she'd snuggled against him, stretched her arm across his chest, and sighed like she'd found peace. His pulse had jumped so high he felt lightheaded. For a brief moment, she'd woken up and asked him if he was okay. He'd brushed the back of his hand along her cheek as she tilted her head up and smiled. He'd wondered if that was what real marriage was like. If that's what it meant. Someone waking up to make sure you were okay? A warm body to make you feel grounded and wanted? Next thing he knew, lyrics were pouring out of him. At night, I think of you. I think of all the things I'd want to give you. My heart, my past, my future, a song. Words to a song had come to him, and he'd nearly bolted out of bed until he remembered Callie sleeping peacefully in his arms. He'd carefully untangled himself and quietly retrieved his notebook and pencil out of his suitcase. He'd spend the next few hours writing. When he couldn't keep his eyes open any longer, he'd lain back down, and Callie had immediately pressed herself against him again. After that, he drifted off too, feeling more at home than he had in a long time. Had he felt that way when they dated? He couldn't remember, and he couldn't understand why. No, that was a lie. He knew why. Back then, he was so fixated on making it that everything else was pushed to the side. That's why it was so easy for his first manager to convince him he needed to be single. Callie had taken it well, and they'd ended things amicably. She'd seemed fine back then, telling him that it was okay and she knew the world needed to hear his music. Plus, she had her own life goals to chase. How had things changed so fast? In just 48 hours, he'd gone from wanting to keep her at arm's length to wondering what it would be like to tell her he remembered. To maybe, keep her close. It made no sense to him at all, but there he was, thinking those crazy thoughts as he stood in the living room while her entire family held a lively discussion on sandcastle rules. Apparently, there had been confusion the last time they had a contest, and because the rule was so vague, well one, even though he'd used imported sand. But Tucker didn't care about any of it. That shared moment in the kitchen earlier had added to the growing list of things he liked about Callie. She'd lied about being a CPA, but for some unknown reason, it didn't bother him, and it didn't change the growing trust he felt toward her. Making a deal with her mom to do something he could see she hated, just so her mom would like him? When was the last time someone had cared that much about him? Enough to sacrifice for him? She lifted her head just then and caught him staring. With a little smile, she stood and walked to him. Do I have something in my teeth? What? He chuckled. You were staring at me. I'm a guy, and you're gorgeous. Pretty simple math there, Mrs. Hawk. Callie Hawk had a ring to it. Wait. What was he thinking? She'd signed a contract, and he just wanted his career back. But man, those perfectly apple-like cheeks blossomed, and he found himself wishing he could be the source of all her reasons to blush. She lightly smacked him on the arm. Charmer. He slipped his arm around her waist and pulled her closer. They were married after all, and soon they'd be pretending in front of the world. Wouldn't they need to practice? You are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. She rolled her eyes. Oh, we know that's not true. I'm a world traveler. I should know. She lifted an eyebrow and scoffed. Whatever. He brought his mouth down her ear and inhaled her fruity scent. He'd noticed it again last night, and since then, he'd wanted to breathe it in. It made him lightheaded to have to her so close. 
You are, inside and out. Callie leaned back, her eyes wide. We should probably go build our sand castle. We're trying to get my mom to like you, remember? Is there a prize for the winner? An all-expenses-paid date tonight and babysitting if needed. And most important, bragging rights until the next one, of course. Have you ever won? She shook her head. No, I never win. I think I just found my incentive to win. He asked Neptune, Poseidon, or whoever was in charge for help if it meant they'd win. He wanted her to win, and he found himself wanting her. What? What had gotten into him? Just two days ago, he was thinking he didn't want anything to do with any woman, and here he was, flirting. It was wrong to lead her on. You can't fall for her, his head screamed, but it felt like his heart had on noise-canceling headphones, because he couldn't seem to stop himself from leaning into her. She smiled. Me too. Come on, you two lovebirds. We have sandcastles to build, Michelle said through a giggle as her husband curled around her. Vivian stood nearby, brushing Mary's hair. Now that both mother and daughter were side by side, he could see the resemblance right away. Both had round cheeks, coal black hair, and creamy white skin. Of the sisters, she was the one who stood out. I have to tell you guys, Mary and I have been practicing, Vivian almost sang. We're going to beat all of you. Will scoffed. Michelle and I don't need practice. We have natural talent. Reigning champions, baby. They high-fived and quickly kissed. Georgia and Heath looked at each other. Not going to happen, Georgia said. Francis cleared his throat. You kids trash talk all you want, he said, taking Clementine's hand. The missus and I will be wiping the beach with all of you. Clementine waved him off, but her face had turned pink. Oh, Francis, we aren't even competing. Yes, but I got you to blush, didn't I? Francis touched her face and smiled. That's my girl, and still the prettiest in the world. Oh, you. She leaned over and kissed him. We're off to the beach. Come on, kids. Tucker knitted his eyebrows together. Who judges? My grandma has the final say, Callie said. She's here? Callie grinned. Yeah, she got in early this morning. I can't wait to meet her. Oh, you say that now, she said as she tried to pull away. Tucker held her in place, unwilling to let her go. If we don't win, can I offer you a runner-up? Go out with me tonight, my treat? She placed the flat of her hand against his chest, lifted on her toes, and kissed his cheek. I'd love to, but you don't have to do that. Right. What was he doing? He was out of his mind, but he wanted a minute alone with her. A second to figure out what he was really feeling without anyone around. Wouldn't it be nice to get a minute? He should have just let it go. He didn't want a relationship. Uh, sure. I'd like that. A few minutes without my entire family might give me the strength to make it through the rest of this week. He could have leaped over a tall building. Instead, he kept his cool. Good. I hope we win just so you have bragging rights. Then let's get out there. That's when he noticed they were the only two left in the house. His gaze dropped to her lips, and an intense desire to kiss her hit him with such a force it nearly rocked him back on his heels. Didn't they need the practice? Wouldn't the press expect two people who just married and were in love to be lovey-dovey? They'd shared a couple of kisses, and the last one he'd attempted had been right after he'd been a jerk. He wanted to know what a real full-blown kiss would be like. One where he let everything go and just concentrated on her. She tilted her head and smiled. Is everything okay? His lips had a mind of their own and so did his hands, apparently. He took her face and quickly brushed his lips across hers. 
Pulling back slightly, he tried to gauge if he'd made the wrong decision. Practice, right? Yeah, practice, she said just above a whisper. He dropped his hands to her arms and slid them down until their fingers were tangled together. For a moment, they held each other's gaze, their noses touching and breath mingling, until Tucker softly kissed her. Just a gentle touch and then another. Slow, tender, sweet, and savoring. Callie's lips parted with the last kiss, and when he brought his lips back to hers, he deepened it. It was an explosion of need that hit him all at once. He untangled his hands from hers, desperate to be closer, and pulled her flush against him. She circled her arms around his neck, and it felt like she wanted him just as much. Never in his life had he experienced a kiss like this. Not one so consuming. Nothing mattered except tasting her, and he didn't want it to end. When she pulled back, he groaned, eyes still closed, and leaned in, unwilling to let her go. She pulled back again and, gasping for air, said, We really need to build our sandcastle. His breathing was as ragged as hers, and the last thing he cared about was building a sandcastle. You sure? No, but if we don't, my family will come looking for us. He opened his eyes and found her staring at him. Her lips were plump and dark pink from kissing, and it took a strength he didn't know he possessed to not kiss her again. Okay. She wove her fingers through his. As the pair walked to the door, Tucker's mind was whirling with questions, leaving him unable to process the mind-blowing kiss they just shared. No, it was just practice, he assured himself. This way, if they had to kiss when they got to LA, it would look real. Only, it had felt real too. Man, he was in so much trouble. Chapter 13 Callie stole another glance at Tucker. He'd kissed her. Really kissed her. She'd even checked her sandals to make sure they were still on. Holy smokes, that kiss had been life-altering. For the rest of her life, she'd be comparing every kiss to that one. What was she going to do when her year was up? How was she going to kiss another man and not feel a complete letdown? Even the thought of a kissing another man left a hole in her heart. No, it was okay. It was a good, great kiss, but it'd be okay. It wasn't like he was really kissing her. They were just making sure people bought their act when they got to LA. When his manager made whatever announcement about them, she was sure they'd have to play it up good. The only way to do that was to get comfortable with each other. She touched her fingers to her lips. Well, she was definitely comfortable now, and she wanted more. Callie shook her head. What had happened to her resolve? Tucker's gorgeous face floated to mind. Yeah, that'd do it. Those piercing blue eyes gazing into hers were enough, and just where on earth did he learn to kiss like that? She didn't remember his kisses being like that. Did she want to know? Nope. That was a mystery that could stay a mystery. Callie? Are you listening? Clementine's voice broke her train of thought. Callie jerked and spun to face her attention on her mom. Uh, yes, I'm listening. Callie felt Tucker's gaze on her, and when she glanced at him, he smiled. Oh, why did he have to be so good-looking? Why did she have to crush on him? She felt like a kid having a tantrum. Okay, the rules are simple, Clementine said. You've got two hours to build your sculpture. There will be no imported sand. She gave Will a pointed look. Once your two hours are up, Grandma will judge, and then we'll announce the winners. Francis put his arm around his wife's shoulders. And then we'll have the Chapman bonfire tonight. Tucker leaned down. Chapman Bonfire? Yeah, it started when the grandkids got old enough to know they didn't win, so it's like a runner-up prize. We build a big fire, roast hot dogs, and make esmores. It sounds like a good time. Tucker smiled. I'm not sure I want that date night now. She laughed. Honestly? 
Most of the time the winners don't go on their date because it is fun. His phone rang and he pulled it out of his pocket. The smile he'd been wearing dropped as he looked at it. It's Stacy. Let me get this. Callie nodded. Sure. Thanks, he said, answering it as he walked away. She couldn't help but think the man looked gorgeous coming and going. The way the shirt strained against his broad shoulders and how it clung to his muscle back, was it suddenly hotter than it was a second ago? She fanned herself and tried to shake his cute butt from her mind. Hey, Callie, a deep male voice said behind her. She whipped around. Edmund? He'd shown up and jet skied with the guys the first day they arrived, but he'd left her alone. Why was he hovering now? I was invited. But I'm married. But I'm married? What kind of lame response was that? She was a writer, for goodness sake. It was like her vocabulary went poof. Edmund shrugged. So I hear. The way he said it made her pause. What did that mean? They'd never dated. Kissed once, yes, but never dated. Whatever. What do you want? Nothing, I just wanted to see how you were doing. What was his game? Edmund never just wanted anything, but there was one way to find out. I'm fine. How are you? His lips quirked up, and all Callie could think was that it wasn't nearly as dazzling as Tucker's smile. I've been doing okay. I made partner two months ago. She knew he'd wanted that for a long time. Working to put a little enthusiasm in it, she said, that's great. More than likely, his dad helped him with that promotion. His smile widened. Yeah, I was pretty stoked. Hey, I'm back, Tucker said as he slipped his arm around Callie's waist. What was the call about? Callie asked. We'll talk later. He winked. Hopefully, it was good news. She so wanted good things for him. Okay. Tucker stuck his free hand out to Edmund. Hello, again. Whoa. Tucker's jaw was tight, and his tone was firm. Where was that coming from? It wasn't like he wanted a real relationship. Maybe he was just playing the jealous husband in case something like this happened when they got to L.A. Yeah, that made sense. Not that she was such a hottie that he'd need to be, but it was nice to know he could. Hey, some party last night, Edmund said as he shook Tucker's hand. I liked it, and since it was my bachelor party, I think that's all that matters, Tucker said. Edmund caught Callie's gaze and held it. Guess the fun gets curtailed when you've been caught face down on a sidewalk. But, you've had it pretty rough all around. Callie crossed her arms over her chest. Don't start, Edmund. Tucker pulled her closer. For a while, but now I have her, and things couldn't be better. She had to give it to him. He was good at this. She'd have to up her game if this was how things were supposed to be. She smiled up at him and leaned into him. He's so sweet, but I had nothing to do with it. I'm writing again. I'd say you had plenty to do with it. Writing again? Oh, that was amazing news. In her excitement, Callie lifted up on her toes without even realizing. Really? Last night I wrote a whole new song. That's fantastic. She kissed his cheek. I'm so proud of you. It'll be wonderful, I just know it. His lips quirked up in a wide grin. Oh yeah. And all I get is a kiss on the cheek. Holy cow, his flirt game was off the charts. She playfully popped him on the chest. Stop flirting. Absolutely not. He winked. Uh, still here, Edmund said. Tucker pulled his gaze from Callie's, and as he opened his mouth, Callie's mom clapped her hands, getting everyone's attention. Dad had a great idea. We're going to mix it up this time. 
We're putting all the names in a hat, and then we're drawing partners. This way, no one has an advantage, her mom said. This should be interesting, Edmund said and smiled. There's an odd man out, now that Edmund's in the game, Ethan said to the group, like he had some hand in what was coming. Rachel raised her hand. And what about the kids? Her mom and dad whispered to each other. Dad will be on a team, and the kids will have their choice of which team they want to be on, her mom said. That seems as fair as it can be, said Denver. And since no one ever goes on these supposed dates, we're competing for bragging rights only. Her dad smiled and winked at her. Callie rolled her lips in to keep from showing the huge grin on her face. Heath, Michelle, and Georgia nodded in agreement. Once everyone finished writing their names down, the little pieces of paper were dropped into one of her dad's old snapbacks. When it came time for Callie to pick a name, dread pooled in her gut. Of course, with her luck, she picked Edmund. And her dad drew Tucker's name. What would her dad talk to Tucker about? Thank goodness her mom wasn't participating too. If she'd been on a team with Tucker, it could have been a disaster. When the kids got to pick, Mary picked Tucker's. Unfortunately, none of the kids picked Callie and Edmund's team, which meant she'd be stuck with him all by herself for the next couple of hours. Are you going to be okay having him as a teammate? Tucker asked quietly as he pulled her aside. I'll be fine. He's harmless. Mostly. She didn't want to tell Tucker how relentlessly Edmund had pursued her. It was silly. Edmund didn't really want to be with her, he just didn't like losing. It made him a great lawyer but a lousy person sometimes. Tucker cupped her cheek and held her gaze. If you're sure. The way he was staring at her made her brain feel like mush. Forming words was beyond her ability, so she just nodded. I was serious when I said you'd inspired my writing. If she didn't know better, she'd almost believe him. He seemed so sincere, but she'd read the contract. She knew what the deal was, and she needed to put the brakes on this before her heart galloped out of her chest. Tucker, no one's here. You don't have to lay it on so thick. He blinked as his hand dropped from her cheek, and he got the strangest look on his face. Yeah, you're right, he said and stepped back. I guess I got carried away. I. Hey, Tucker, you ready to build a sandcastle? Her dad asked as he and Mary stopped next to her. Yes, sir. Tucker grinned as he looked at Mary. You ready to stomp these losers? He asked and winked. Mary jumped up and down. Yes. I knew I picked the best team. Then let's get M. Tucker quickly kissed Callie on the cheek and walked a few hundred feet down the beach, nodding as he passed Edmund on the way. Edmund rubbed his hands together and smiled. You ready to have some fun? Callie didn't know what she was ready for. She'd gotten the craziest vibe from Tucker, like he actually might really like her, but that couldn't be. He saw her as a fan, someone he knew back before he was famous, and they weren't meant to be. The moment he found out what she did for a living, he'd have nothing to do with her. Ever. Which was another reason to keep her heart on lockdown. Tucker was a heartbreak waiting to happen, and she knew it. Chapter 14 Tucker worked on the arm of the mermaid they were building, letting his mind drift back to Callie. It had to be his lack of sleep messing with his head. That was the only explanation for kissing her the way he had and for the flirting. She'd sure brought him down to earth quickly. He had been laying it on thick, but he'd been so caught up with her that he hadn't even realized it. From the moment his pencil touched the notepad, something had changed for him. Holding her close the night before, kissing her, and he could still feel the zaps of electricity from that kiss. Being with her fulfilled something he didn't even know he was missing. Yeah, he'd known he was lonely, but not how empty. And as much as he wanted to keep his distance, there was something irresistible about Callie. Something that kept pulling him to her. 
Had it been like that before and he'd been so focused on his music that he didn't see it? He liked her smile and the way her eyes lit up when she was excited. The sway of her hips when she walked had his heart beating double time. He sighed, thinking how soft and delicate her shoulders looked in a simple colorful sundress. The fact that her lips were so plump and kissable didn't hurt either. There was something between them. He felt it. Didn't she? So, I heard the short version of how you met Callie, but why don't you tell me the long version? Francis asked, interrupting the silence that had lingered for about an hour. Most of their talking had been concentrated on the sandcastle and what they were going to build, and when they'd figured that out, they'd fallen into a comfortable silence while they worked, minus the nine-year-old who talked a mile a minute. She was cute, though. Tucker had fallen in love with her. She was quirky and sweet and funny. And knowing what she'd been through, he admired her. He glanced at Mary who was working on the tail part of their mermaid. It was what Mary wanted to build, and neither of the men had wanted to fight her about it. Who argues with a cute little girl about a mermaid? He was comfortable enough in his manhood that a mermaid wouldn't mess with his confidence. Mary grinned up at him. Yeah, how did you meet Aunt Callie? Crud. He needed to keep it as generic as possible. Too many details, and there was no way he'd be able to give Callie the rundown of what he'd told them. Um, well, like we said, we met while I was on tour. In Vegas, right? Yes, sir. I was doing a show there. The next day, I was taking a walk and ducked into a little cafe. There she was, pretty as a picture. I'll give you that. All my girls are pretty as a picture, her dad said. How long ago was this? Ah, shoot. How long had they said? Ah, uh, six months, give or take. With touring, it's hard to remember what city I'm in, much less the date. Her last year in college, she sure did talk about you a lot. To the point that I wondered if you two were dating. Tucker's heart pounded double speed. She did? Her dad chuckled. Believe me, as much as she talked about you, it's not something I'd forget. Did you two date back then? He wasn't a deer in headlights, he was a deer hitting the windshield. Did he lie to her dad? If he told the truth, would Callie find out? Her dad stopped working on the mermaid and narrowed his eyes. I'm taking your silence as a yes. Uh. Callie did tell you I started my law career as a prosecutor, didn't she? Her dad grinned like he was a cheetah clamping its jaws on an antelope. Tucker swallowed hard as beads of sweat rolled down the sides of his face and back. Uh, no, sir, she didn't mention that. I was known for being able to spot a lie a mile away. At the time, I had the highest rate of conviction in the state of North Carolina. They called me Daredevil cause I could tell when someone wasn't being truthful. And he thought Clementine was scary. Callie's dad? He wasn't Daredevil. He was the very definition of a wolf in sheep's clothing with his Tim Conway looks and his Pennywise demeanor. All the man needed was a sewer and a few balloons. Yes, sir, we dated. The words rushed out. He smiled and went back to work. That's what I thought. She never would admit it, but I always knew. Can I ask what happened? Well, we were both concentrating on our futures and decided it was best to break it off. It was mutual, I swear. Is that so? Yes, sir. He nodded. Interesting. She said the same thing, only I could tell she didn't quite have her whole heart in it. Tucker stopped working and let his gaze drift down the beach to Callie. She and Edmund were working together. They even seemed to be getting along. Just then, she laughed and slapped Edmund on the arm. He'd spied on them several times, and each time it seemed they were cozier than the last. Really? If you think I'm good with complete strangers, imagine how much better I am with the people I'm close to. 
The man finished the spot on the torso he was working on and moved down to the tail. Plus, she said she wasn't sure she'd ever care about anyone the way she cared about you. Tucker whipped his gaze back to Francis. She said that? Francis nodded. Not in so many words. I'm paraphrasing. Callie cared about him back then? More than cared. She'd fallen for him? Whoa. That was a lot to take in, but at the same time, he felt a warmth spread through him. Callie cared about him. Had he broken her heart when they broke up? It had been mutual, hadn't it? I do want to ask about the partying. You're done with that, right? His smile faded. Absolutely, sir. I'm done. That's not the life I want for myself or my family. Do you? Want a family? That wasn't a question he was used to being asked. Did he want a family? He'd always thought he did until Petra had soured him on all things relationship. How did he answer the man? Yeah, I do. I want the kids, house, and the white picket fence. And he did, too. Despite what had happened with his ex, he knew in his heart that it was what he wanted more than anything. Maybe even more than his career, which seemed less important the more time he spent with Callie. Spending time with her had breathed a little life into him, and it felt good to see the future as something to look forward to. How about your singing career? To be honest, I don't know if I could ever stop singing. I love it. Her dad lifted his gaze to Tucker just slightly while he kept sculpting. You think you'd keep touring? That was a good question. He wasn't sure he wanted the tour being planned at the moment. I'm not sure. It gets old. Honesty is good. Francis paused and then added, a word of advice, for what's it worth. Do you mind some? Tucker chuckled. Sir, I'll take all the advice I can get. Since I didn't get to say this prior to the wedding, I'll tell you now. Marriage is the hardest thing you'll ever do. Nothing is ever 50-50. You have to give it your all, all the time. You have to decide that you love the person no matter how angry, hurt, or let down you feel. Love isn't a feeling, it's an action. Remember that, and you'll do just fine. Tucker nodded. He could almost hear his dad saying those same words. It struck him as funny that their parents would like each other and get along. I'll take those words to heart, sir. And stop calling me sir. My name is Francis. Or you can call me Frank. These boys here even call me dad or grandpa at times. Yes, S. Francis. Thanks. He smiled. Good. Now that the formal stuff is out of the way, we can get down to the fun. Let's get this mermaid finished. Mary jumped up. Grandpa, did you give that advice to my daddy and mama? Yeah, sweetheart, I gave it to all my kids and extra kids. Francis winked. And now you've heard it early, so you can keep it with you when you start dating. Mary wrinkled her nose. Ew, Grandpa. Boys are gross. All boys? Tucker asked with a chuckle. She rolled her eyes. Well, most of them. Tucker snorted. You just keep thinking that until you're about 30, okay? Frances ruffled her hair. Now, back to the mermaid. Tucker stole a glance in Callie's direction, and he caught her staring at him. Even from where he stood, he could see a bit of a blush on her cheeks. Edmund followed her line of sight and threw a wave in Tucker's direction. Tucker tipped his chin to them and watched as Callie and Edmund went back to working on their sandcastle. What Tucker wouldn't give to be a little closer and hear what they were talking about. Learning that Edmund told people he dated Callie in high school made Tucker anxious. Although, he wasn't sure why. Callie hadn't said anything of the sort and he'd shrugged it off when Ethan first told him. But seeing them together made Tucker wonder if she hadn't been forthcoming. 
If they dated in high school, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like they were still together. Something about Edmund bugged him. Callie deserved better than some smarmy lawyer with a greasy smile. Don't worry about him, Francis said. I'm that obvious, replied Tucker. Her dad laughed. Edmund has pursued Callie for years, and Clementine encouraged it. I don't know why, because Callie never showed the slightest interest. Oh, well, a small one, once in high school, but that was mostly due to her mom's pushing. I don't know why my wife likes the guy. He's always come across as slimy. His dad has been after me for years to join his law firm, and I won't do it because I have such an uneasy feeling about his family. A burst of relief flooded Tucker. I'm glad at least one of her parents doesn't like him. Do yourself a favor. If Edmund tells you anything, make sure you double-check him. He tends to inflate his success. Good to know. Time's up. Callie's mom called out. Your two hours are up, and judging will begin. Everyone stand next to their sculpture, and Grandma and I will be around to check them. As she finished her announcement, an elderly woman came strolling on the beach, heading straight to Tucker. She stopped when they got to him, and the woman pinched his cheek. I was right. He is better looking in person. She smiled as Clementine walked up. Mama! Clementine chastised the woman as her cheeks reddened. What? He is, and he has a cute but too, the woman said. Clementine rolled her eyes. Mama, stop that. What? You telling me you don't think he's good looking? You're not blind, either. Sure is better than that Edmund fella you've been pushing on Callie since boys no longer had cooties. Inwardly, Tucker was dying with laughter. Outwardly, he just smiled as the elderly woman sparred with Clementine. Callie's dad interrupted them. This is my mother-in-law, Loretta Thames. She's known for speaking her mind. He could have sworn Clementine said what she has left of it, but it was so quiet he couldn't be sure. Tucker grinned. Hi, Mrs. Thames, it's nice to meet you. He liked this spry woman. You call me Loretta, okay? Okay, Loretta, he said, letting his voice dip low. Loretta squealed. You big flirt. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Honey, you flirt all you want. I got no problem with it. Okay. Tucker laughed, instantly adoring her for her feisty personality. Mama, we need to start the judging. Let's start at the other end and come back. Okay? The lines around Loretta's mouth deepened as her lips turned down. Fine, fine. We'll come back. She patted his cheek and walked away with Callie's mom. It had been a long time since he experienced a sense of home. When was the last time he'd been home? Now that he was thinking about it, it had been more than a year. Guilt coursed through his veins. What had kept him away? Maybe he'd have an answer by the time he went home. If not, maybe he'd stay long enough to figure it out. Chapter 15 Winning the Sandcastle Contest had come as a shock to Callie, especially since she'd never won anything, ever. She was sure her grandma would pick Tucker's team because her grandma had an even bigger crush on him than she did, but when her mom announced the winner and her name was called, it floored her. Although, her grandma had given her mom a hard look. Callie wasn't sure what that meant, but she still wasn't inclined to fight her mom, so she kept her mouth shut. So, that was fun, huh? asked Edmund. Finally winning must feel good. Once the winners had been announced, everyone had decided to hang out on the beach, including Edmund, and he'd waited until Tucker and the rest of the guys went out on the jet skis to approach her as she sat in the shade of her umbrella. Yeah, I guess, Callie said. You sound disappointed. She shrugged. I'm not. Yeah, she was. 
she was pretty sure her mom had announced her and Edmund as the winners so he'd stick to her, even after coming to an agreement that her mom would give Tucker a chance. Have you told your face that? Cause it looks like you've eaten dirt. I thought it would feel different. I thought, I don't know what I thought. Callie shook her head. Edmund bumped her shoulder with his. Talk to me, Cal. We used to be good friends. And whose fault was it that we stopped being friends? I know. I shouldn't have spread that rumor, but Hugh Browden was talking about you, and I wanted him to shut up. Hugh? He nodded. Yeah, that jerk was telling the guys on the soccer team that you and he were. Callie's eyes widened. He was not. He was, and I wanted to shut him up. He said you'd gone on a date with him, and I knew you hadn't. I knew you were studying for that math test on the night he was talking about. I thought if I told him we were dating and I knew for a fact you weren't with him then he'd shut up. Had she pegged Edmund wrong this whole time? Why didn't you tell me that when I confronted you? I tried, but you wouldn't even let me talk. You were so mad that I couldn't get a word in to explain myself. She thought back to that day. Oh, she'd been furious after finding out that Edmund was running around telling everyone that they were dating. She'd confronted him blast style, her mouth working so fast it was a wonder she talked straight. But after, when I'd calmed down, you could have said something. Why wait until now? I don't know. I figured, what was the point? You made it clear you had no feelings for me whatsoever. But seeing you with someone else, I never thought I'd actually lose you. We were so close. I shared everything with you. Callie softened. That was true. They had spent hours talking, and before he started thinking they could be more than friends, they'd actually been pretty close. Why couldn't we just stay friends, then? Why did you have to try to make us into something we weren't? Because I fell in love with you. I love your eyes and how they sparkle when you're excited about something. I love your smile, your hair, your wit and intelligence. I've tried dating other women, Cal, but none of them hold a candle to you. He'd never said anything like that to her before. You know, if you'd come to me like this when we were in high school, things might have been different. I know. I was a stupid kid, and I should have backed off the moment you said you weren't interested, but I loved, love you so much. It breaks my heart to see you with him. Edmund, let me go. I want you to find someone to love and who loves you with the same passion you give. You're a good guy when you want to be. Be the man I know you can be, and find someone to be happy with. He nodded, and when he spoke, his voice was soft. Do you know him well enough to know with absolute certainty that he's the one for you? When did Edmund ask such heavy questions? Yeah, I do. Okay, if you're happy, I'm happy for you, he said and smiled. That's all I've ever wanted. For you to be happy. I want you to be happy too. I told you before that I was made partner. Callie nodded. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. I know that's what you've wanted for a long time. It is, and I moved out of divorce proceedings and into contract law. It's so much better without all the fighting and bickering and negotiating. Although, with contract law, there's negotiating, there's just no who gets the dog negotiating. That sounds interesting. It is, it is. I've had some very interesting contracts hit my desk, he said and held her gaze. A weird feeling settled over her, but she dismissed it. Edmund was just being Edmund. I'm sure you do. She smiled. Anyway, I need to go. I've got a few things to wrap up before tonight's bonfire. He stood as Tucker approached. See you guys later. Tucker tipped his chin. Later. He took a seat next to Callie and waited until Edmund was out of earshot. What did he want? Just to clear the air, I think. 
Tucker draped his arms over his bent knees. Is that all? Did she mention the weird feeling? Nah, what was the point? Weird feeling about what? There was no explanation, so she decided to keep it to herself. Yep, that's all. His phone started ringing, and he answered, motioning for her to be quiet as he put it on speaker. Hey, Stace, what's up? Oh, just the largest American tour you've ever done before. Really? His eyes twinkled as he locked gazes with Callie. Yep, Stacy said. All the details are worked out. The tour starts a month after you get back. You'll be back Sunday, right? No, I have to stop at my parents' place. They want to meet Callie. Stacy groaned. You don't have time for that. I'll make time. She sighed. Fine, but you've only got Sunday. Once you get back, I've got a press junket set up. You'll be hitting all the morning and evening shows to talk about the tour and your new marriage. The press is dying to know more. Callie's eyes widened. A press tour? Would she be with him? She didn't want to be in front of all those cameras. Another part of his life that she hadn't considered before jumping in and signing that contract. Gil had assured her that Derek had buried her ties to the paper, but what if someone found out? What if they confronted her on live television in front Tucker? Her heart beat wildly, and she whispered, I don't want to be on TV. Tucker nodded to show he'd heard her. Will Callie have to go on the shows with me? Well, if she wants to, I'm sure they wouldn't care. But, no, they aren't expecting her, Stacy said. Relief flooded Callie, and she patted the spot over her heart. Phew. Bullet dodged. Anything else, Stace? No, just continue your sober streak, and we'll be right as rain. Callie could see how the statement hit him. The sparkle in his eyes dimmed a little. I'll keep it up. Good. Anyway, gotta go. There are a few more details I need to take care of. Tucker and Stacy said goodbye, and Tucker ended the call. Largest American tour. Callie bounced in the sand. I'm so happy for you. Yeah. He shrugged. I mean, I'm totally stoked about it, but at the same time, I miss home. Tours are hard. The last tour I was on, I was a mess. But you won't be this time. No, not this time. Callie chewed her lip, debating whether to ask him what happened with Petra. No, it was too soon, and she didn't want to be the one who instigated it. When he told her, she wanted him to want to tell her because he trusted her. Trust. That five-letter word was feeling more like a four-letter word lately. She was lying to him, and Gil would be expecting an article about him soon, full of details about Tucker and his life. She might have to write an article, but that didn't mean she had to divulge everything. Hey! Will called with his hands cupped around his mouth. We're getting some ice cream. Wanna come? Talk about magic words, Callie said. Tucker nodded. It sounds pretty good to me too. He threw Will a thumbs up, and Will ran toward the house, leaving them alone on the beach. Callie went to stand, and Tucker stopped her. Hold on just a second. He cupped her cheek and held her gaze. Without another word, he bent down and brushed his lips across hers. What was he doing? The beach was empty. Why are you kissing me? No one's watching. No one was watching this morning either. Are you saying you don't want to kiss me? That wasn't what she was saying at all. No, she said softly. Are you going to tell me not to kiss you? Her vocabulary had taken a flying leap, so she shook her head. He pressed his lips to hers again and nipped her bottom lip. I won't kiss you if you tell me to stop. She circled her arms around his neck in response, and that was all he needed to deepen the kiss. 
This morning could have been a fluke, a crazy weird haven't been really kissed lately thing, but now he was kissing her for the second time, and her heart and head were buzzing like she was high on a bucket of energy drink laced coffee. When a call came from the house, they broke apart, leaving Callie dizzy. I guess that means they're waiting on us, Callie said, trying to catch her breath. Tucker nodded. I guess so. He stood and helped her up. As she started to walk to the house, he tangled his fingers in hers, and she could have floated on air. It made things so confusing. He'd been clear that he didn't want a relationship, so why was he kissing her like that? And why was she letting him? What was wrong with her? She was lying to him. Their time together had an expiration date, and if she wasn't careful, not only would their relationship be over, but she'd have a broken heart too. She needed to be stronger. The next time he tried to kiss her, she'd stop him. This was a business deal. The hospital needed money, and he needed his image fixed. Nothing more, nothing less. Their careers were the only thing that mattered, and if she was the one that needed to remind them of that, then that's what she'd do. Chapter 16 Another night, and another outpouring of lyrics. The ocean breeze floated through the open window as Tucker sat on the floor with his back against the wall, using the moonlight to write. Two nights in a row now, he'd felt like an overflowing cup. And just like the night before, he held Callie after she'd fallen asleep. Her body fit, and he loved the warmth she gave him, the way her hair would tickle his arm, and the peaceful look on her face when she'd finally roll over and stretch her arm across his chest. Everything about it was intimate and sweet and all the things he knew were missing but didn't know how to find. And after talking with her dad and admitting out loud that they dated, it had been freeing. He'd planned on telling her, but seeing Edmund talking to her had painted his vision green. Then Stacy called. After that, it was ice cream, bragging rights and teasing about the sandcastles, and then the bonfire, which was just as fun as Callie had made it sound. They'd cooked hot dogs and had esmores. It was lively and fun. He hadn't laughed so much and so hard in forever. It felt like he was slowly coming alive. Hey, Callie said as she leaned up on her elbow. Is everything okay? She rubbed her eyes and yawned. Yeah, everything's fine. Go back to sleep. She pushed out of bed, her feet dragging on the floor as she walked, and sat beside him. Are you writing? He nodded. I'm so proud of you. I haven't done anything. She leaned her head on his shoulder. You're trying. That's something. He chuckled. Lifting her head, she caught his gaze and held it. I'm proud of you because you're Tucker. Not Tucker Hawk or the famous singer or any of that. I'm proud of you for the man you are. You have a good heart, Tucker. I don't feel like I have a good heart. Then I'll keep saying it until you do. She smiled as she looked down, a thoughtful expression on her face. Back before you were famous, you'd tell little kids that they could do it too. That there was a big enough pool of people you didn't need to compete with them. You'd help them with their finger positions on the guitar. You'd stay late and work with them on their songs. When she looked back up, a sheen of water covered her eyes. You are so much more than some singer. Tucker fought back his own tears. No one had ever said anything like that to him. Sure, his mom and dad, maybe, not in an eloquent way, but it had been years since someone saw him as something more than just a voice. You really believe that, don't you? With all my heart. She cupped his cheek. One of these days, when your heart's had time enough to mend, I think we'll be really good friends. Just friends, he said, his voice thick and low. She nodded. I think we should stick with that for a while. At least until this contract isn't looming over us. Maybe after that, we can see where things go. She laid her head back on his shoulder. But he didn't want to be just friends. What? As soon as the words floated to mind, he nearly choked. 
When did that happen? He didn't have an answer, and he wasn't sure he cared. Over the course of the last few days, things had changed. He was falling for her. I remember us dating. I remember that you liked Reese's in your popcorn. I didn't remember the movies and television, but I remember you being beautiful and sweet and feeling like a million bucks every time one of our dates ended. I should have told you, but I was scared. A soft snore answered him, and he sighed. Of course he was telling her he knew and she'd fallen asleep. But he'd told her. It was a first step in opening up when he thought he'd never open up again. This was good. If he could take a small step, maybe he could take bigger steps. Steps like telling her about Petra, about how she'd used him, and about how he thought Derek was behind it. Tucker set his pencil and paper down and picked up Callie. He carried her to the bed and tucked her back under the covers, kissing her forehead before going back to his place on the floor. He wasn't sure how he'd gotten so lucky to reconnect with her, but whoever was looking out for him deserved a big thank you. Chapter 17 Friday was spent preparing for the talent contest. With all the work that went into it, Callie would have thought they were preparing for America's Got Talent or something similar. Her family was normally serious about it, but because Tucker Hawk was participating, they took it to a new level of competitiveness that she'd never seen before. Callie picked up another strand of tea lights and began stringing them around the back deck. Half of it had been sectioned off as the stage. It was a good thing her parents had the forethought to make it extra big. She decided to stay out of the show. Winning the sandcastle contest was enough for her, and after feeling let down, she just didn't care about winning anymore. Along with her mom and dad, she'd worked all afternoon to get the deck stage ready, and Callie had to admit it did look pretty snazzy. The tea lights do add something, Mom, Callie said. They'd gone into town earlier in the day for another fitting and stopped by a little shop to pick up a few things. They'd been on clearance. Her mom beamed. Well, thank you. I like the soft light. The glow makes it feel like we're surrounded by lightning bugs. Callie smiled. You're right, it does. Okay, I'm going to go check on Grandma. You two finish up, and when we get back, it'll be time for the show, Clementine said, wiping her hands down her jeans before kissing Francis and stepping into the house. Her dad smiled after her and then resumed his duties of sweeping off sand and debris that had gathered over the last couple of days. Your mom tells me you don't have your CPA license. He didn't waste time, did he? She stopped and faced her dad. I don't. I didn't want it. You know how I feel about lying, Callie. He pierced her with a quick look without stopping his work. She nodded. I know, but every time I tried to tell her, she'd talk over me. She wouldn't listen. According to her, I was going to move home and take over the firm. It didn't matter what I said or how I said it, it was like she was deaf. I thought the only way to fix it was to not get my license. I'll give you that. Once your mom gets a notion in her head, she's not easily changed. But lying? You're better than that, Cal. He stopped sweeping and leaned on the broom handle. This is what you got when your dad was a prosecutor. He could make a seal cry. I know. I shouldn't have done it. She also tells me you made a deal. I just wanted her to give Tucker a chance. I really am thinking about it, though. Thinking you don't want to be a CPA and take over your mom's firm. He laughed. Callie laughed with him. I didn't say I'd think about it as in doing it. It wasn't a lie. He rolled his eyes. You really love him, don't you? But you've loved him since college, am I right? Seriously? Her dad was a sneaky thing. Talking about lying and that she was better than that and then leading her to this? Oh, he was underhanded. Dad. Tell me I'm wrong. He held her gaze. Tell me I'm wrong, and I'll never speak of it again. 
Her shoulders sagged. She was in a snare, and she knew it. Yes, I cared about him back in college, she said. She wasn't even willing to admit how she felt about him to herself, much less her dad. Our lives were on different paths. He was so focused on his singing, and mom was pushing me to be a CPA. It wasn't the right time. Does he know how you felt about him back then? Gulp. Uh, well, that's the past. We're building a future. Her dad lifted a single eyebrow, telling her that answer wouldn't fly. No, he doesn't know. I didn't want to hold him back. Did he tell you that you would? She shook her head. No, I felt that way. Tell the truth. She bit her lower lip and debated. I've never, ever, told anyone this, but his manager came to visit me one evening right after Tucker signed with him. He told me that if I really cared about him, I'd let him go. The world needed him, and it would be selfish to hold on to him. His songs were going to help a lot of people. He asked if I really wanted to stand in the way of that. And he doesn't know any of that? No, and I don't want him to. It would only make him feel bad, and we're together now. Those years apart gave us time to grow as people. I wasn't ready for a serious relationship back then, and neither was he. Why didn't you tell me? Tucker asked as he stepped out of the kitchen and onto the deck. Callie jumped and looked from him to her dad. How long have you been standing there? She asked Tucker. Long enough. Her dad cleared his throat. Seems I'm finished here. Deck looks pretty good, if I do say so myself. I'm going to get cleaned up. See you two in a bit. He smiled and nearly jogged into the house. Oh, she was so having a talk with him later. The Batinsky. My manager came to you? She fidgeted with her hands, trying to decide how much she should tell him. Yeah, but it was okay. He thought we were dating. I assured him I wouldn't hold you back. Callie, I. Mary, Tabitha, and Vivian came running onto the deck, out of breath. The deck looks great. Uh, could I talk to Callie, please? Tucker asked, keeping his eyes locked with Callie's. Callie pulled her gaze away and smiled. It's about showtime, huh? Yep, Mary said. And I'm going to dance this time for sure. She tugged on Tucker's hand. And he'll be cheering me on. Tucker nodded and smiled. Yep, I'll be cheering you on. Callie started to dart into the house, and he caught her, putting his mouth to her ear. This conversation isn't over. I remember us dating. Her mouth slowly opened, but before she could respond, Vivian grabbed her and pulled her into the house. Come on. Help me get Mary and Tabitha ready. They dragged her along with them as her mind raced. He'd remembered? And he hadn't told her? Why? The only conclusion she could come to was that he'd never felt the same way about her, but he'd wanted to spare her feelings. But he'd been flirting with her. Kissing her. What was all that? Just his way of making sure she'd step in line and perform like she was supposed to? Her heart pounded and ached. She'd been so stupid, letting herself get swept away by him. That flickering ember felt doused with ice water. Well, if he could use her, then she could use him. If that's all she was, so be it. Chapter 18 Tucker was so desperate to talk to Callie that it felt like time was moving at a snail's pace. Each performance felt like it moved in slow motion. His manager had talked to her? Why didn't she tell him then? Would he have listened? At the time, anything and everything was pushed to the side for his singing career. After he broke ties with his first manager, Stacy had come into the picture. She'd been driven and focused too. With her guiding hand, he'd found fame and success, on stage. She wasn't a bad person, but Tucker was a brand that needed expanding. 
He wasn't a human being, he was a thing that needed promoting, and he'd gone right along with it. To the point that all he felt was emptiness. Thoughts plagued him through his performance, but despite the chaos in his mind, he'd done well, singing one of the new songs he practiced during the day. One he'd written specifically for Georgia and Heath. It would need some more tweaking before it was good, but it must have been okay, because Georgia had begged him to sing it at her wedding when he was done. Callie pulled him to the side and hugged him. I can't believe you wrote that for my sister. It was incredible. It had been a long time since he cared what someone thought of one of his songs, but her appraisal and bright smile meant the world to him. Yeah. You liked it? I always thought you were great, and your voice has only gotten better. Thanks, he said as his gaze landed on Mary. He would have loved to try to talk to Callie right then, but Mary looked like she needed him. Mary was supposed to go first, but each time, she'd shy away. Finally, her sister, the last act, finished her flute routine to a huge round of applause, and Tucker caught Vivian and Ethan trying to coax Mary to dance. I think I should go check on her. Callie followed his line of sight and squeezed his hand. Me too. He kissed her cheek and then walked to Mary and her parents. I'm sorry, I don't mean to intrude. Vivian and Ethan sighed. It's okay. She doesn't think she can do it. Ethan's even offered to dance with her, but she won't. What if I dance with you? Tucker asked Mary. Mary looked up at him with her sweet little freckled face. You'd dance with me? How about this? You pretend like no one is here and teach me. The little girl grinned. Okay. She put her tiny hand in his and squeezed it. I'll do it. They walked onto the stage and Mary froze. Tucker kneeled down and placed his hands on her arms. Mary, look at me. For a second, her pale face stared at her onlooking family before turning her gaze to him. Keep your eyes on me. Don't think about them or anything else. Just look at me. What do I do first? Her wide eyes stared at him a little longer before she said, You stand like this. She positioned herself in a typical ballerina-style stance. With a little maneuvering and few chuckles from Mary, he mimicked her. Next. As the music started, Mary slowly started dancing, giving him instructions as she went. With each move, her confidence increased and her moves grew bolder. Without even realizing it, she began forgetting to teach Tucker, and she danced as he carefully slipped off stage. As the music ended, Mary finished with a flourish and stood with her shoulders straight and her head high, smiling like she'd won a gold medal. When the whole family erupted in cheers and applause, the little girl giggled. Her smile was so wide he was surprised her cheeks didn't hurt. Her mom and dad gathered her in a hug and Ethan ruffled her hair, getting a smack to the hand because he was messing up her ballerina hair. Tucker loved it. Thank you so much, Ethan said as he approached Tucker and shook his hand. You made my little girl's year. Hey, it was all her. She's a cutie. Vivian came over and hugged him, squeezing him before letting him go. That was incredible. We've tried to dance with her, and she wouldn't do it. She wiped her eyes. I can't tell you what that meant to me. Tucker's cheeks burned. They needed to stop. Really, it's okay. I enjoyed it. You've got a talented, cute little girl. Both girls are. You're a good guy, Tucker, and I'm glad you're a part of this family now, Vivian said. He was too, and the longer he stayed, the more he wanted to be a real member of the family. Thanks. Clementine, after loving on Mary, stood to the side and caught his gaze ever so often. He couldn't gauge what she was thinking. Her face was a blank mask. The talent show ended, and the vote to crown Mary winner was unanimous. Tucker hoped that it would help boost her confidence for next time. And while he was happy for Mary, he was glad the contest was over. 
Once the celebrating, which included Fix Your Own Sundays, and the wedding rehearsal were over, Tucker went up to the room in the hopes that Callie would follow him. Every time he tried to get her alone, either she'd duck away or someone would interrupt them. A light knock came from the door, and he figured Callie just wanted to make sure he was decent. He went to the door and opened it, saying, Callie, we only it wasn't Callie. Mrs. Chapman? Is everything okay? Clementine stood at the door, looking every bit the prim southern lady she was. Everything's fine, but I'd like to talk a minute while everyone's distracted. Yes, ma'am. Tucker waved her into the room, leaving the door ajar just an inch. What would you like to talk about? She held her head high, and her nose tilted ever so slightly toward the ceiling. What you did for my granddaughter tonight, she paused as she worked her jaw. There aren't enough words I can use to say thank you. It was selfless and sweet, and I've never been happier in my life to see my little Mary grin so wide. Tucker smiled. It was my pleasure. Mary is a sweet little thing, and I hate to see her not happy. Did Ethan tell you she was a preemie? Yes, ma'am. When she was born, I could put my wedding band on her arm, like a cuff, and it was loose. There were weeks we thought she'd never make it out of the hospital. She struggled to fit in because she thinks different. People write her off sometimes because of that. So, to see her thriving tonight, well, I never thought I'd ever see her do that. And you gave that to her. Really, Mrs. Chapman, it was nothing. I enjoyed doing it. She crossed the room and stopped in front of him. I was wrong about you, and I owe you my deepest and sincerest apology. I thought Callie could do better, but you proved tonight that I was wrong. You're the best she could have found, and I'm proud to welcome you to my family. Tucker was floored. Ah, uh, well. She suddenly hugged him. Welcome to the family, sweetheart. She let go and stepped back. I don't know what happened to you last year, but if something like that comes up again, you tell me. Her lips pressed together tight, and a cold look crossed her features. And I'll take care of them for you. Tucker smiled. I was told that once you liked me, you'd beat a preacher with a club if he messed with me. And something Tucker thought he'd never see happened. Clementine Chapman genuinely smiled. Anyone messes with my family, and they'll be lucky if all I use is a club. Mom? Callie walked through the door. I was telling Tucker thank you for helping Mary, her mom said and walked to the door. And about our deal? Don't worry about it. I'm sure I'll find someone good enough to take over. Callie jaw dropped. What? We'll talk again later. For now. Spend some time with your husband. Oh, I was just coming in to tell him that Georgia wants all of us girls to go to Wilmington to a hotel so we can start her bachelorette party, Callie said as she stuffed her clothes into her suitcase. She's got us nail, hair, and massage appointments, and she's booked the juniper for breakfast tomorrow for all the bridesmaids. We'll be driving back before the wedding. Clementine huffed. When did she do all that? And here everyone was giving me grief about my scheduling things. Now I need to hurry and pack. I always forget things when I'm in hurry. I could really use a moment alone with you, Callie, Tucker said. She was doing her best to avoid him, and he wasn't going to let her. Callie's gaze moved from her mom to him and back. I really should help my mom. Clementine waved her off. Take five minutes and then come help me. She smiled in Tucker's direction. I'm happy you found him. With that, she floated out of the room, leaving them alone. The tension in the room thickened as the silence drew out. Callie tucked a piece of hair behind her ear and laughed nervously. I really should go help my mom. This last-minute stuff isn't her strength. Why are you running from me? Tucker said. I told you I remember us dating, and you've run ever since. We were friends back then. We hung out. 
That's all, she said, her gaze landing everywhere but his face. In two steps, he was standing directly in front of her. Look me in the eyes and tell me that. Her chin tipped up, and their eyes locked. Tucker, we have a contract, remember? We said we'd visit this after it wasn't between us. What if I don't want to visit this after? What if I want to see what this is now? Trust me, Tucker, you don't. Something flashed in her eyes, and she stepped back. Let's wait. He closed the gap, took her face in his hands, and pressed his lips to hers. At first she stood stone still, and then she melted into him, circling her arms around his neck and threading her fingers through his hair. A soft sigh escaped as he deepened the kiss. His hands left her face, trailing down her arms, and then he wrapped his arms around her, holding her as tightly as he could. A fire built in his gut and spread through his limbs. Her nearness, her lips, her skin, he wanted all of her. She broke the kiss and touched her fingers to her lips as she stepped back. I'm sorry. I have to go, she said as she grabbed her suitcase and raced out of the room. He rushed to the door, but he knew there was no reason to follow her. Didn't she feel the chemistry? She was pressed against him so hard that there was no way she didn't feel how fast his heart was beating. Was he wrong to think there was something between them? Tucker shut the door, walked to the bed, and dropped onto the edge. He knew he had a contract, and he knew Derek would enforce it. But his heart? His heart was close to the cliff. How could he spend a year with someone he wanted to kiss and hold when the feeling wasn't mutual? He put his head in his hands as the words to a song flitted into his mind. Was he glad he was able to write again? Yeah, but the cost to his heart was a high price. Chapter 19 The drive into Wilmington seemed to fly. Callie felt numb and tingly all at once. Tucker had kissed her like she was the only woman he'd ever want, and she'd run. Not because she wanted to, but because she was trying to keep from hurting him. Once the contract was over, he'd know everything, and then he could decide if they could be something or not. If he wasn't too angry with her. The talk with her dad had shaken her, and the more she thought about it, the more she didn't want to be that person anymore. The one lying and hiding who she was. Not from her mom, her sisters, or anyone. She was who she was, and she needed to be happy with herself and for herself. Striving to be happy for someone else was never going to work. Callie, what has you so deep in thought? Her mom asked. Her sisters paused their gabbing and looked in her direction. They decided to stay in and play cards since George's friends wouldn't be in for her bachelorette party until later that night. Upsy slash Downsy was a favorite in the Chapman household, and it had been too long since they'd played. Callie licked her lips as her gaze went from Vivian to Georgia to Rachel to Michelle and landed on her mom. Nothing. I'm sorry. What's been played? Georgie laid her cards down and said, uh. Spill. Yeah, you need to talk, Michelle said, putting her cards down too. What should she do? Could they keep this big of a secret? You can't tell anyone. Ever. Do you understand? No one. Her sisters looked at each other and then nodded. Okay, they said in unison along with her mom. Callie's heart pounded. Once she told them, it would be out. There'd be no going back. It would be done and over. But the weight of lying was too much anymore. I don't work at an accounting firm. I'm a reporter with Country Music Weekly. My pen name is Jamie Pearson. The words rushed out, and she waited for it to sink in. All of a sudden, an eruption of gasps made it sound like a breeze rushing through trees. Oh, my stars, Cal, Vivian said. You're famous. Georgia smiled. You always did like writing. Are you doing fiction too? You remembered I liked to write? Callie asked Georgia. Her sister nodded. Michelle snorted. 
Who didn't know? I didn't, her mom said, shutting down the conversation. I didn't know at all. You've been writing this whole time? Not practicing accounting? Lying? Callie felt like dirt as she slumped against the table. I've wanted to tell you, but you've always been so disappointed in me. Nothing I've ever done has been good enough. But lying? Her mom's voice held such a deep level of hurt that it broke Callie's heart. Michelle touched their mom's arm. Mom, Callie was a writer in high school. She won poetry and short fiction contests all the time. And every time she showed you one, you'd brush it off, Georgia said. Her mom looked around the group. I did that. Vivian leaned forward. It wasn't on purpose. You loved us, but you had dreams for each of us. I mean, for the four of us, she said waving her hand at Michelle, Rachel, and Georgia, it was just good that we liked what you were pushing us to do, but Callie never liked accounting. Was I really like that? Her mom asked as her face seemed to fall. Almost as though she was horrified by the revelation. Each of Callie's sisters nodded. When Clementine turned her wounded eyes to her, Callie's heart filled with empathy. It's okay, mom. I just wanted to make you proud. Silence filled the air as Clementine took each of her daughters in, as if seeing them for the first time. That's when it dawned on Callie too. Her mom really had no idea how pushy and opinionated she'd been. She hadn't meant to be so demanding. She only wanted her girls to be successful, and in her mind, she'd pushed them to professions considered solid and respectable. Clementine lifted out of her seat and rounded the table for Callie with open arms. When Clementine pulled Callie from her chair and hugged her, she said, I am proud of you, sweetheart. I am so sorry for the way I've made you feel. I really had no idea I was like that. Callie let herself relax into the hug. I'm just glad you know now. Me too. Clementine leaned back. And you are a brilliant reporter. I've read many of your articles. You're gifted, sweetheart. Callie's heart was so light she thought she might float away. Thanks. She paused. Just keep it to yourselves, okay? But Tucker knows, right? Her mom asked. This was the next big part, telling them the truth about what was going on with her and Tucker, but she was done lying to them. Over the next hour, she spilled everything, pausing to answer questions and take the heat for doing something so crazy. I just can't believe you did that. Vivian shook her head. Michelle snorted. I'm not. She's in love with him. Always has been. I'll put money on the table that she never even intended to write those exclusives. Callie rolled her lips in to hide her smile. Rachel gasped. She does love him. The moment Gil said they were talking to Petra, I was in. I wasn't letting that woman get near him again, Callie said. Do you know what happened? asked Vivian. No. Her mom let out a heavy sigh. This is all just too much. And he doesn't know who you are. Your pen name? I could get sued just for telling you this. If it gets out to the press, Tucker's fans will crucify him. Georgia touched Callie's arm. But you do love him, don't you? Well, Callie had decided she wasn't lying anymore. That included herself, right? Callie nodded, saying, I followed him around for several months before we started dating. It started off as hanging back after his concerts. It was a big group at first, and over time it led to me and him dating. How long did you date him? Really? asked her mom. A couple months. Georgia grinned. I knew it. We all knew it, Michelle said. Her mom gasped. That's why you wanted to stay in Nashville after college. You were dating him. Her mom paused. But he wasn't at your graduation. He was already getting kind of famous. 
He was in California that day, meeting with the president of a record label. I didn't want him to miss that. Callie hadn't felt so good in years. It was as if she'd taken a flashlight and aimed it at her life. Why didn't you tell us? asked Vivian. Callie shrugged. He was a musician, and I knew how that would have gone over. And I knew he was going places. I never thought it would last, and I was right. Keeping it from you just kept me from having to explain it when it was over. Ah, Callie, Rachel said. You should have told us. We could have been there for you. I know, and I promise I won't keep anything from you again. Callie smiled. Rachel crossed her arms over her chest. You know you have to tell him, right? It's not okay to keep this from him. I can't. If I do, they'll sue me, and Tucker's fans will be furious if they think he's duped them. They're working on a tour for him. His manager says it's the largest tour ever. If I tell him, he'll be angry, and there will be no way we can fake this long enough to get his singing career back on track. Callie looked from sister to sister, hoping they could hear how desperate she was. Vivian nodded. She's right. I follow him on Twitter. His fans were ticked with his drinking and womanizing and partying. There's even a few that already believe it's a stunt. If this gets out, it'll kill his tour. What are you going to do? asked her mom. For now, I'm going to support him the best I can. Georgia sat back. And tell him you love him? Callie vehemently shook her head. No. No, I won't tell him that. Not while he doesn't know the whole truth. I've decided I'm not going to let him tell me any details about what happened, just so I can't write about it. When it comes time for me to turn in an exclusive, I'll have nothing of substance to write. Yep, it'd be one short article if they wanted Tucker's life story. She wasn't giving them anything. Not without Tucker's willing participation. His record label president could take a flying leap. If he wanted a spy to get the inside scoop, he'd have to hire someone else. The rest of the night, she and her sisters and mom discussed her situation. Before long, they were all in agreement with keeping it from Tucker, and she was grateful. It felt like one of those trust exercises where someone falls back and is caught by a group. For once, Callie had people ready to keep her from falling, and it felt amazing. Chapter 20 Tucker's phone rang, and he ducked away from the rest of the guys and went to the back deck. Hey, Stacy, he said as he put the phone to his ear. The guys were gathered in the living room for the final check for the wedding. Then, the rest of the evening would be spent hanging out on the water. Heath's idea of a bachelor party wasn't much different than Tucker's, except Heath wanted a cookout without staying up all night. Georgia had given him marching orders. There would be no dark circles pointing to new husband dead on his feet ruining her wedding photos. How's it going? Stacy asked. Actually, it's going well. I like her family. They're all pretty welcoming. I even won over her mom. He was still trying to let that soak in. When he'd helped Mary, it was because he liked seeing her smile. Not to get something out of it. Stacy laughed. Like your charm wouldn't work on someone? Tucker grunted and smiled. He did have a little bit of charm. What are you calling about? The tour is almost set. Your largest ever, and you'll be on the road for the next year. A year? Does it have to be a year? I didn't think it'd be a problem. It is a problem. I don't want to be on the road that much. It's exhausting. Plus, how will I be able to maintain my fake marriage if I'm never with my fake wife? Although, the fake was feeling less and less lately. He enjoyed being with Callie, even if she seemed determined to keep him at arm's length. It sounded like Stacy shuffled the phone to her other ear. I can take a few dates off. Take half off. I can maybe handle six months, but a year? 
Stacy, I want to be successful, and I want to sing, but the way we've been doing things has me burnt out. Why didn't you say something? Because I didn't know what the problem was until, until he'd landed at a vacation home with a woman he cared about and who cared about him. Since being with Callie and her family, I've realized that I want to slow things down. I'm writing songs again, and it's because I don't feel rushed. Stacy stayed quiet a little longer than Tucker liked. He pulled at his collar and leaned his hip against the railing. What? he asked. Nothing, but I'm getting a weird vibe that it's more than the house and the beach. Tucker hated how well she could read a situation, even over the phone. What makes you think that? There's something in your voice. You sound different. He pushed off the railing and walked to the farm table, taking a seat on the bench. I dated her before I was famous. He heard a gasp. You did? Yeah, and I found out that Trent talked to her. Your first manager? Tucker nodded. Yeah, and I haven't been able to talk to her about it yet. I overheard her telling her dad. Trent told her that if she really cared about me, she'd let me go. All this time, I never knew. Is she the one who got away? What? Tucker chuckled. Stacy scoffed. The first few months we were working together, you talked nonstop about a girl that got away. Don't you remember? I did. He sure didn't remember that before now, but after hearing it, more memories flooded back. I did, didn't I? What is wrong with me, Stacy? It's like I've blocked things out. She laughed. Darling, you were in love with her, and your heart broke when it ended. You may have said you were focused on your career, but deep down, you felt something missing. We all have coping mechanisms to protect ourselves. I'd say you shoved those memories down so you could move on because you thought she had. Plus, you were so driven back then. Trent may have gone about it the wrong way, but you didn't have time for a relationship, and you know it. His pulse jumped. Stacy had said that so many times back then that it became his mantra. At the time, she'd felt no different than Trent. The only difference was the way she approached Tucker. Where were all these thoughts coming from? Stacy had just done what he wanted, right? I remembered us dating the moment I heard her name. I just didn't let her know it. It was like seeing a ghost from my past. That thing with Petra messed you up. I think once you tell someone what happened, you'll be a lot happier and lighter. Tucker hated what happened. That he'd been used. He hated the idea that Derek might have been behind it too. Hey, Stacy, you think you could do me a favor? Depends on the favor, she said with a chuckle. Find out who invited Petra to that party. That I can recall, no one remembered inviting her, and it was an exclusive party hosted by Derek. And we know how controlling he is. There's no way she got into that party just by showing up and being pretty. Stacy coughed. Sorry, that water went down the wrong way. Sure, I can do that. What's going on in that head of yours? Should he tell Stacy his theory? A weird sensation tickled deep in his gut. They'd been working together a long time, but did he trust her enough to divulge that he thought Derek had staged it so that Petra would be at the party? Stacy signed a contract with Tucker that included confidentiality, but Tucker never saw Stacy's contract with Derek. Why would Derek need her to sign something else? Nothing, just trying to find some closure, he said. Well, it's about time. I'll get right on that. She paused. Oh. Another thing. I managed to convince Derek to let you have a day with your parents. Good thing. I was going anyway. I know, but it's nice not to be at war with the president. The label already has a press conference set up for the moment the plane lands. You'll be doing it from home, and you'd better be prepared to lather it on thick. Derek's words, not mine. 
Tucker exhaled heavily. Okay. I'll tell Callie. You really like her, don't you? Again, something in his gut told him to keep his mouth shut. Yeah, but that's a good thing. It'll make it easier to lay it on thick like Derek wants. True. I have to give it to Derek. He put this together pretty well. Yeah, he did. Thanks for calling, Stacy. See you in LA Monday. They said their goodbyes, and Tucker remained seated at the table. So many things just didn't add up anymore. While he was in his haze, drinking and partying, he never took the time to really think about anything. It hurt too much, but now, away from Stacy and Derek and everyone else who seemed to put their interests ahead of his, he wondered just how long he'd been blind. Hey, Tuck, Will said, sticking his head out of the door. Francis got Heath a deep-sea fishing adventure. We're leaving in 30. Okay, sounds fun. Tucker smiled. Will started to duck back inside when Tucker said, Hey, Will. He peeked his head out again. Yeah. You're a lawyer, right? Will walked onto the patio and stopped at the table. Yeah, why? You think you could look over a contract for me? I'm family law. Not sure I'd be of any use. Tucker knitted his eyebrows together. But you can speak legalese, right? Well, I can, and if I can't, I have some guys at my firm that I trust. What's going on? I don't know, but I'm hoping that with a little help, maybe I can find out. Will grinned. Whatever it is, we'll tackle it. He nodded his head in the direction of the kitchen. Come on. We're getting changed. If we mess up these tuxes, Georgia will kill us dead. Tucker laughed as he stood. This family. It felt like he'd been waiting for something like this to feel welcomed and seen for more than his fame. Will, Ethan, Denver, and Heath, and even Callie's dad, were great guys. People he could see spending holidays and vacations with. How many other things had he missed? Now that he had his eyes open, he wanted to make sure nothing else was missed. And the things that were missed, he wanted fixed. Chapter 21 If it weren't for the makeup, the entire wedding party would have looked like actors in an apocalyptic thriller. They danced late into the night and stayed up entirely too late, and Callie felt about as good as the poor skunk they'd passed on their way back to Carolina Beach. The church her sister had rented on Carolina Beach was familiar. It was the one all her sisters had used, and nothing in Carolina Beach changed much except the dunes. Even the number of homes stayed the same because of a city resolution passed a few decades before. The city council didn't want the landscape to be filled with anything but homes and buildings. Tucker had tried to talk to her again, but she wasn't going to give him the opportunity. His secrets were his until she could figure out a way to get out of that stupid contract. She told her sisters she'd just deal, but she was done with just dealing. She had to figure out how to do it. Maybe she'd get Will to look at it. If she hired him as her lawyer, he'd have to keep it confidential. Although, she could already hear him musing aloud that she was crazy to have gone along with the plan in the first place, and she wouldn't argue. But the second Gil said Petra's name, Callie was in. It was as though her heart knew what she wasn't willing to admit even then. That she loved Tucker. A knock came at the door. As her sister Vivian answered, she heard from behind, Wow, don't you look nice. When Callie spun around, there stood Tucker in all his Tuckerly glory. Could tucks be made for a man that fit any better than it did for Tucker Hawk? There wasn't an inch of him that wasn't perfect. Hi. Callie said. He smiled, and the world fell away. Hey, mind if we have a minute? Yeah, she minded. He was going to try to talk again. She didn't want him doing that. Not yet. No, she said as her feet propelled her forward. It was like she was mesmerized and on autopilot, his gorgeousness like a wispy finger pulling her by the nose. 
When she reached him, he took her hand and led her out of the room and into an empty room down the hall where no one would overhear them. Callie, you look amazing, he said as he shut the door. Says the walking Gucci model. Tucker laughed and leaned in closer, holding her gaze. His smell made her brain melt, and she fought the urge to take a deep breath. Want to know what I like most about you? What? she whispered. Your humor. You're smart and beautiful and sweet. If I'd known my manager spoke to you, I'd have done just what I did because I was too focused on myself to see anything outside of my bubble. I shouldn't have been, but I was. My manager talked to me too and convinced me that I needed to move on to be successful. Callie held up her hand. Don't, Tucker. Please, don't. I want to tell you. She shook her head. Please. Petra never loved me. She pretended to like me from the get-go to further her career. I was stupid and didn't see it because she was really good at acting. And because I'd surrounded myself with people who didn't give two nickels about me, I didn't have anyone to call her out on it or set me straight. Callie's jaw dropped. She should tell him to stop, but he looked so earnest and vulnerable that she couldn't. Oh, Tucker. That's awful. Why would anyone do that? I think Derek was behind it. Why? Tucker rubbed his mouth with his fingers and leaned even further in. I think he wanted something bad to happen so he could sign me again. I'd been thinking of going with a different label. I've never liked Derek. I've been civil with him, but it's never been a secret that, given the opportunity, I'd leave reckless. Without Harris, the former president, it's not a place I want to be. I can't believe he'd do that to you. What a creep! And I think, I think Stacy might have helped him. Dumbstruck, Callie gasped. What makes you think that? He took a deep breath and let it slowly. She said she signed a contract too, for this whole fake marriage thing, but now that I think about it, it doesn't make sense. When I signed her as my agent, there was a confidentiality agreement. Why would she have needed to sign another contract? Other than my skin, that's all she has in this game. Callie pulled her bottom lip in as her thoughts ran wild. Maybe Derek wanted her to be under his thumb too. I don't think so. She was part of that party where I met Petra. I think they worked together to have Petra there at the right time because after that, wherever I was, Petra was there too. That's why it was so easy to be with her. Most of the time, those parties were boring. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I had no interest in either. I wasn't even interested in the women they'd invite to those things. So, when she was there, I had nothing better to do than talk to her. And you didn't think that was odd at the time? Those endless pools of blue staring her down turned pensive. I was so full of myself that I didn't take the time. I was on top of the world. All I had to do was ask my friends, and they'd agree. To have no one love him enough to look out for him? Callie's heart ached for him. I'm so sorry. I should have known. We had so many things in common, and now that I've taken a hard look at her, there's no way she was into the things she said she was. Plus, she was always pushing me to drink and smoke to have fun. I was a boring guy because I never did anything. He said the last sentence in a mocking tone. I started drinking here and there. By the time I found out who Petra really was, I was drinking anything and everything. Finding out she'd used me just fueled that. I lost myself because I didn't have anyone. Callie took one of his hands in hers and used her free hand to cup his cheek. Well, you have me now. She held his gaze. And I want to talk more, but if I don't get back in there and finish getting ready, Georgia will murder me. After the wedding, though? We can talk more, right? Tucker's pleading eyes searched hers. Yeah, we can talk then. 
she was going to tell him even if he did hate her and never trusted her again. At least one person in the world would be putting his interest above their own. Yeah, it was scary to think she'd never write another article because of how much she loved it, but she loved him more. If she got sued, she got sued. So be it. He smiled and bent down, quickly brushing his lips across hers. Okay. Oh, she wanted to wrap her arms around him and kiss him, but after, after they talked. If he didn't throw her out. Once they exited the room and parted ways, she found herself back at the dressing room door. She bit her lips with worry. The second Tucker was out of sight, she rested her forehead against the door, taking a deep breath. The hospital, she wanted that money to go to them, but Tucker needed her, and she wasn't lying to him any longer. Nope. Her mind was made up. On the plane ride to LA, she'd come clean. If he was mad, then he was mad, but she'd be free. Maybe he'd even see it as a good thing that she broke the contract. He'd see that she cared about him, loved him. Maybe that would be enough. Chapter 22 With a sigh, Callie shifted as she slept with her head leaned against Tucker. His plan to talk had failed the moment Callie sat down. Apparently, George's rule about going to bed at a decent time had only applied to the men because the bridesmaids were exhausted by the time the reception was over. He had to admit Georgia was a beautiful bride and the wedding was a nice affair. He'd even had time to tweak the song she'd requested, and her smile at the end of it was the best thank you he'd had in a while. All in all, it was one of the best weddings he'd ever attended. Even the food at the reception was enjoyable. They'd reached the plane at nearly midnight, and he couldn't say he wasn't feeling the day's activities too. He should be asleep, but he was so wired about seeing his parents that he couldn't. Most of his worry was concentrated on being back home, not introducing Callie, which was weird. It should have been the other way around. His phone rang, and he quickly answered it to keep it from waking Callie. Hello, he asked in a low voice. Tucker, there's a problem, Stacy said. I know you want to see your parents and introduce Callie, but you can't. Tucker growled. Yes, I can. Derek wants you in LA tonight. He doesn't want to risk something happening and you not being here for the press conference. Furious, Tucker pulled his hand away from Callie and balled his fist. Look, I know how important all of this is, but I need to see my parents. I know, and I get it, but this press conference is a big deal. If you give us tomorrow, you can visit them and not be on a time crunch. No, I'll make sure I'm there. Derek isn't going to be happy if you don't change directions. Let him be angry. I've bent over backward at this point to do whatever he's asked. I'm seeing my parents, and I'll be at the press conference on Monday. Stacy sighed. I know you're upset. Are you listening to me? I'm going to see my mom and dad. I'm not arguing about this with you. You're my manager. You're supposed to be fighting for me. I am fighting for you. Who do you think got you this chance? He scrubbed his face with his free hand. How much did he trust her? He softened his tone and checked his anger. You're right. I'm just tired. I miss home, and it feels like there's nothing but chaos right now. Just let me see my mom and dad, and you'll get the best performance out of me you've ever seen. She stayed quiet a minute. All right. I'll tell him I couldn't reach you, but you'd better be here. If you aren't, Derek won't be happy. I will. I promise. Okay, enjoy your visit. It was just like Derek to try something like that, but Tucker wasn't falling for it anymore. Tucker was the name. They needed him, not the other way around, and he was done taking orders. Life was about building something with someone he loved, and he intended to tell her he loved her as soon as he could. An idea sparked. He'd take her back to his parents' place in Kentucky and plan something special. 
Then he'd tell her he loved her and hope she loved him in return. It was a risk, but it was one he was willing to take, with her. A few hours later, the plane touched down in Owensboro, Kentucky, and Callie sat up, bleary-eyed. No, he wouldn't be talking to her yet. She'd be asleep again the second the car was moving. And he was right, once they were on the road, she was out. The truck he'd rented at the airport was nice, but her head would bounce from time to time. Eventually, she leaned over and curled up on the bench seat, using his thigh as a pillow. The sun peeking through the trees gave him a view of the scenery he'd missed. He should have come back home before now. A sense of peace filled him as he stroked Callie's hair with one hand and stared with the other. This is what he wanted from life. Peace, comfort, and someone who loved him. What was the point of singing if he was miserable? And now that he knew he'd been miserable, he didn't want that feeling again. By the time he pulled into his parents' driveway, he made up his mind that once this current tour was over, he was taking a break. Whether for a short time or not, he wasn't sure. But he needed balance, and that wasn't going to be found on the road. Their modest home showed a humility he missed. The homes in his neighborhood back in L.A. were opulent and oversized. Hey, Callie, we're here, he said, gently shaking her. Callie yawned as she pushed herself up. Oh, I slept the whole time. I don't even remember getting in the truck. He grinned. That's because you were mostly asleep. She touched his arm. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Let's go meet my parents. You think they'll like me? The early morning sun filtered through the tinted windows, giving her an angelic look. Even mused from sleep, she was beautiful. Tucker nodded. I think they'll love you. As he said it, he realized they weren't the only ones. Over the course of a week, his feelings had done a 180, and he was thinking his fake marriage didn't have to be so fake anymore. He got out of the truck, jogged around the front, and opened her door, helping her out. She yawned and fussed with her hair. Oh, I'm so nervous. Don't be. Everything will be fine, he said as he took her hand and kissed the back of it. Before they could get to the door, his mom was flinging it wide open and running down the steps, furiously hugging him. His mom took his face in her hands. I'm so glad you're home. I've missed you so much. I've missed you too, Mom. His dad stood in the doorway. Elise, at least let the boy get inside. His mom ignored him and shook Callie's hand. Hi, I'm Elise Hawk. It's so nice to meet you. Hi, I'm glad to meet you too, Callie said. His mom smiled wide. Well, come on. Tucker and Callie decided to get their luggage later and followed his parents into the house. He wished he'd fought harder to stay longer than just an overnight. Once inside, he looked around his house. Nothing's changed, except the carpet and the paint. Wasn't that couch on its last legs the last time I was home? His dad smacked him on the arm. And that's the first thing you can think of to say? Betsy is a member of the family. You better not have hurt her feelings. It'll be a week before I can get her to recline again. You named it? After ten years, I felt obligated. His dad grinned and then pulled Tucker into a hug. It's good to see you, boy. You too, dad. They let each other go, and Tucker promised himself he'd never stay gone so long ever again. Tucker laughed. Dad, this is Callie Chapman Hawk, he said, motioning to her. Callie, this is my dad, David. He's weird but harmless. Hey! Who you calling harmless? Callie shook hands with his dad. Hi, it's nice to meet you. His mom looked from him to Callie. Are you too hungry? If I say yes, will I get blueberry pancakes? Tucker asked. I got blueberries just in case, she replied. 
Callie lifted on her toes, her eyes twinkling. I'm in for blueberry pancakes. Her stomach growled, and her cheeks turned pink. You might need a double batch. She laughed as she flattened her hand against her stomach. Great! His mom seemed to glow. They talked as they followed his parents into the kitchen. Callie took a seat at the kitchen island along with his dad as Tucker pulled on an apron. You cook? Callie asked. His mom was so animated. Oh, he cooks, he cleans, all of it. He's even done windows. Callie held his gaze and smiled. Well, if I'd known I was marrying a domestic god, I'd have said yes quicker. Tucker rolled his eyes and laughed. You hush and get ready to eat the best blueberry pancakes you've ever put in your mouth. Callie chuckled as he and his mom got to work. And while it had been some time since he'd made pancakes with her, it came back quickly. He loved cooking with her and the ease in which they talked and how they teased each other here and there. Once the food was cooked, they took it to the table and plated it. Man, he'd missed his mom's cooking well, their cooking. This is so good. Thank you, Callie said. No problem, his mom said and eyed him. Callie, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself? His mom asked. Callie set her fork down. I'm from Wilmington, North Carolina. I studied accounting at Vanderbilt in Nashville. I have four sisters, each of them in a professional field. My dad is a lawyer, and my mom is a CPA. Wow, a whole family of professionals. I bet holidays are filled with interesting discussions, his dad said after taking a drink of juice. Tucker said your sister got married? Yes, sir. She was married yesterday in Carolina Beach. We have a vacation home there that the family is free to use whenever we want. You both will have to go with us someday. I bet you'd love it, Callie said and caught Tucker's gaze. A small smile spread on his lips. The way she talked, she didn't see their marriage as fake any more than he did. I bet you guys would love that. There's a boathouse full of jet skis, and her parents are great people. Well, her whole family is. Callie touched his mom's arm. I have to brag on him. She went on to tell his mom about their talent contest and how he danced on stage with Mary. By the time she was done, his neck and face flushed from embarrassment. The smile on his mom's face looked almost painful. He was always a sweet boy. Last year, all those, things. Well, that wasn't really him. Callie touched his mom's arm. Oh, I know it wasn't. He's a good man. Always has been. Did you ever see him play in Nashville? His dad asked Callie. Tucker was interested in how she was going to answer this too, so he set his elbows on the table and steepled his fingers, laying them against his lips and waiting for her answer. Callie chewed her bottom lip a second, and he could see the debate raging. Inwardly, he chuckled a little. I followed him from the first time I heard him sing at Texan song. He was, she lifted her gaze to his, incredible. He had the most beautifully written, soul-touching songs I'd ever heard. Tucker felt the heat in his face rise a little more. From that moment on, I was hooked. I'd stay for the entire show. When he had early evening shows, kids would come in, and he'd help them, if not with their guitar playing then with their songwriting. He was so sweet and generous with his time. She caught Tucker's gaze and held it. You raised an incredible man. Tucker blinked and looked away. There was no way she was talking about him like that and didn't feel something for him. If he loved her, she had to love him. Either that, or her brand of friendship was friendlier than any he'd ever encountered. His dad took a deep breath and said, Tucker, why don't we take our breakfast to the back deck and have a talk? Tucker nodded, knowing by the tone that it wasn't a request but a command. Yes, sir. He and his dad picked up their plates and drink and went outside. 
They each took a seat at the round table off to the corner. His dad had changed so much in the past year. He was a little rounder around the middle, grayer, and a little slower. So, how have you been, Tucker? He asked. Tucker smiled. I've been good, actually. Writing new songs, feeling better. You? His dad took a few bites of his food and washed them down. Wondering why it is that my son won't come see his mom and dad. I didn't mean for so much time to pass. It just got away from me. Yeah, I guess that can happen. You gonna keep letting it happen? Tucker shook his head. No, sir. When I get back to LA, I'm going to tell Stacy that things have to change. That have anything to do with the young lady talking to your mom? A smile quirked on his lips. She's got a lot to do with it. She and her family are really good people. You'd like them. If you say I will, then they must be decent folks. His dad paused and then pierced him with a look. You're done with the drinking, right? Yeah, I'm done. I'd rather drink bathwater than a beer, Tucker said. His dad chuckled. I don't know about that. Depends on who's been in the water. Tucker threw his head back and laughed, his dad joining in. They laughed a few minutes, and when his dad slowly stopped, Tucker could feel a shift in the air. Those people you've surrounded yourself with aren't good people. They don't have your best interest at heart, his dad said. He inhaled deeply. I've been doing a lot of thinking. Once I get back to LA and get Callie settled, I think I'm going to take a harder look at what's been going on. I've got Callie's brother will checking my contract. He's family law, but he has people he trusts if he can't make sense of it. It's about time you woke up. Yeah, I know. It feels like my life has been passing by without my active participation. I think I got too big for my britches. His dad nodded with a smile. I'd say that accurately describes the situation. Tucker grinned back. Man, he'd missed his dad and his honesty. They remained on the porch and continued to talk. For once, Tucker could say he was happy. The only thing that could make him happier would be to get out of his fake marriage contract, his record deal, and cancel the tour. But he knew that was about as likely as pigs flying. Still, it was a year, and as long as he had Callie, he could suffer through anything. Chapter 23 Through the back window, Callie could see Tucker and his dad talking. Tucker looked more at peace than she'd seen him in a while. He'd needed his dad. His mom smiled and cleared her throat. Callie, Elise said. How long have you really known Tucker? Elise held her gaze, and it felt like the woman was a living, breathing lie detector, the same vibe she'd gotten the moment Callie shook hands with her, which confirmed what Tucker said about her. If Callie lied, his mom would know it. Callie also felt comfortable with the woman. His mom and dad both seemed genuine. Her parents would like them. Callie could even envision them becoming great friends. I stumbled across him singing when I was just starting my senior year of college. Elise tilted her head and narrowed her eyes. You're the girl he dated, aren't you? Callie's mouth dropped open. He told you about me? Oh, honey, he was smitten with you, she replied. What happened that you broke up? Callie chewed the inside of her cheek. Um, his manager, the first one, told me that if I cared about Tucker, I'd let him go. And, honestly, I was young and just starting out myself. I wasn't ready for anything long-term either. I cared about Tucker, but I knew he was going places, and I didn't want to be the one to hold him back. I knew that guy was a snake, but that was pretty sleazy. Does Tucker know? Callie nodded. He does now. She wouldn't tell her how Tucker found out. That it was by overhearing a conversation with her dad. What do you think of this current manager? Elise asked as she began clearing the table. 
I don't know. I haven't really gotten to know her, but I don't think she cares about him as a person. Without even thinking, Callie began helping her. I don't think he's had much in the way of people caring about him. Elise let out a slow breath and paused what she was doing. I don't think so either, but the boy was hard-headed. When we left him in Nashville after he signed with his first manager, Trent, we knew things were off, but he needed to learn that for himself. The back door opened, and Tucker and his dad walked in, Tucker closing it behind them. Well, Elise, love, the pancakes were good. No tub of salt in them this time. Tucker groaned. One time. I made a mistake once, and I can't seem to live it down. He yawned and rubbed his hand over his hair. I think I'm getting old. Staying up all night isn't sitting well with me. You could take a nap, Callie said. His mom nodded. Yeah, sweetheart, if you're tired, go lie down. Tucker's eyebrows shot up. So you can keep talking to Callie without me listening in? No thanks. His dad laughed. And what do you think they were doing while you were on the back patio with me? Tucker jerked his gaze to Callie, and she grinned. What can I say, your mom is a treasure chest of stories. Mom, please tell me you didn't. Oh, stop panicking. Elise shooed him out of the kitchen. Go sit down while I clean up the kitchen. Would you mind if I helped? asked Callie. I slept on the way here, so I'm not tired at all. No, I'd love that. Tucker shuffled out of the kitchen and into the living room while Callie and Elise cleaned up. David helped as well until his wife shooed him out. Thirty minutes later, Callie and Elise walked into the modest living room to find Tucker sitting on the couch, asleep. Callie walked over to him and nudged him. You need to lie down. Barely opening his eyes, he lay down and stretched out. She couldn't imagine how tired he was from not sleeping at all the night before. She wasn't sure how he'd not fallen asleep at the wheel while driving from Owensboro to Livermore. His phone began to ring, and she slipped it out of his pocket. The screen display flashed Stacy. The phone stopped and then started ringing again. For her to call twice in a row, there had to be some sort of emergency. Hello? This is Callie. Tucker's asleep. Hi, Callie. Stacy's tone was a little icy. I really need to talk to him. He's just gone to sleep. I doubt he could have a coherent conversation with you. Callie kneeled next to the couch by Tucker's head and ran her fingers through his hair. She wasn't waking him up. Stacy took a deep breath. Fine, but he needs to be up by 7 p.m. because that's when the car will be at his parents' home to pick up the two of you and your rental and take you to the airport. Derek wants to make sure Tucker is at his home, looking refreshed and in love, by 8 in the morning. I thought we had until tomorrow morning. Callie's eyebrows knitted together. I tried to get Derek to back off, but he's afraid Tucker will get a wild hair and want to stay longer. This press conference is a big deal. He needs to be there and be on time. We have makeup, cameras, and press going to be there. He can't miss it, especially since we're announcing his tour. He hasn't seen his family in a long time. I get that his career is important, but not more important than them. Stacy made a small noise that sounded like it came from her throat. Listen, I know you two may have dated way back when, but you're his fake wife. He'll be in that limo by seven, or Derek won't hesitate to sue. And believe me, he won't mind suing you either. Callie bubbled with fury. Fake wife. Yeah, she might be his fake wife, but she was his real friend. She couldn't say that aloud, though. Not with his mom and dad listening in. Fine, I'll make sure he knows. But for the record, I'm on his side and his side alone. Callie punched the end call button and set the phone down hard next to her, grumbling. What's going on? Elise asked. 
Callie turned and sat flat on the floor, crossing her legs at the ankle. Oh, his manager isn't letting him stay overnight. They're sending a car for him, and we'll be leaving tonight at around 7. Those vultures don't care a bit about him. I wish he'd see that, his mom said. I should have stopped this long ago, but it was his dream. David held up his hand. Elise, you couldn't have stopped it. He's the one who's going to have to wake up. He's a grown man. As soon as he's tired of all the malarkey, he'll be done. Elise nodded. I know. Still makes me sad, though. Callie wished she could do something, but they were right. Until Tucker was ready, there wasn't anything any of them could do. They'd just need to be there for him when he was. It would be an adjustment for him for sure. When Tucker woke up a few hours later, Callie gave him the bad news. I'm so sorry, Tucker. It's not your fault. It's mine, he said as they stood outside. They'd taken the conversation to the back patio in case they slipped up about their marriage. She shrugged. I know, but I still feel bad that I had to deliver it. Don't be. I think once this tour is over, I'm taking a break. A long, soul-searching break away from LA and managers and record producers. Okay, well, instead of spending what few hours you have out here with me, how about we go back inside and spend them with your mom and dad? She smiled. Wrapping one arm around her waist, he pulled her close. With his free hand, he pushed back a piece of her hair. Thank you. For what? For still caring about me all these years later. She cupped his cheek. I hate this contract. She pressed a light kiss to his lips. Let's go back inside and spend some time with your folks before we have to leave. His lips quirked up. See, now I'm in a quandary. I want to stay out here, kissing you, and I don't want to miss visiting my parents. You'll have me after we leave here. He released her and tangled his fingers in hers. Fine, but I'm getting that kiss. Oh, she wanted that kiss too, but not until she had a chance to tell him the truth. If she thought he'd handle it well, she'd tell him now. But with the looming press conference, she didn't want him getting upset and refusing to do it. She didn't want him ruining his career because of her. Spending the day with Tucker's parents was good for him. He seemed lighter the longer he was there, and the moment the limo pulled in front of the house, it was like a dark cloud had arrived. They said their sweet and somber goodbyes with promises of returning soon. After a long ride to the airport spent in silence, they spent an even longer flight in silence. By the time they arrived at his home, not only was she exhausted physically, she was exhausted mentally. When they arrived at his home, she took the directions to her room and collapsed. The next morning, for the second time within three days, a makeup artist was fluttering around Callie, getting her ready. They'd been given the five-minute warning, and the tension in the house seemed to reach a crescendo. Nervous energy pulsed through her as she thought about the press conference that was about to begin. Callie had barely made eye contact with Tucker since they got to the house. Okay, you too, let's go, his manager said as she stepped inside his mansion's living room. It had been turned into a mini-dressing studio. It was a gorgeous home. Mission-style Spanish with beautiful landscaping. From the way the living room looked, she could tell the rest of the house would be just as nice. Everything was so neat and tidy, like a store that encouraged you not to touch things. It was obvious from the way things looked so unlived in that Tucker didn't spend much time there. From across the room, she could see Stacy in a deep conversation with Tucker, and she wished she could hear what was being said. He looked so stern, and she seemed taken aback by whatever he was telling her. Finally, Stacy held up her hands and walked away. Before he could catch her staring, Callie turned away. Next thing she knew, he was pulling her close and taking a deep breath as he buried his face in her neck. I love the way you smell. That's an odd thing to say to a person. She had to admit, he smelled fantastic too. 
aftershave and man in the most perfect combination. And, of course, he looked good. Jeans with a wide belt buckle and the button-up check shirt with a cowboy hat to go with it, he was downright yummy. He pulled back. What? You don't think I smell good? Well, sure, but I'm not just gonna blurt it out. She laughed. Too late, he said as he kissed her. Pulling back, their lips barely touching, he said, I brushed my teeth just so I could kiss you. He didn't give her a chance to respond. He pressed his lips to hers again. All thoughts drained from her, and she slid her hands up his chest and into his hair. She loved the feel of him, how her body curved into his in all the right places. Pulling back, he nuzzled her neck. I'd love to keep this up, but I'm not about to put on a show for these people. Did Stacy tell you to kiss me? Callie asked, a tinge of hurt hitting her heart. Tucker pulled back further. No, I kissed you because you have gorgeous lips that are kissable and because I could tell from across the room that they needed to be kissed. Relief flowed through her. Good. She kissed him. Stacy reappeared in the living room. Okay, it's showtime. Tucker held out his hand, and she put hers into his as they walked out the front door and stopped at the top of the stairs. A sea of reporters stood before them, and flashes went off, blinding her. Stacy stepped up to the microphone and said, Thank you all for coming. I'll keep it short and let Tucker take it from here. Tucker and Callie stepped up, and they smiled at the reporters. Hello, I'd like to introduce you to Callie Hawk, my wife. Questions started as reporters pressed forward to have themselves heard. Callie quickly felt overwhelmed. Her heart raced, and her palms became sweaty. It felt like she was in a police interrogation. Not that she knew what that was like in real life, but she'd seen enough crime dramas to compare them. Is it true you dated her before you were famous? asked one female reporter. Callie looked at Tucker, and his eyes reflected her own questions. How did they know that? A camera flashed, no doubt capturing their moment of surprise. Uh, Tucker said. Yes, we met several years ago. How did you reconnect? Another reporter asked. Tucker cleared his throat. We ran into each other after one of my concerts. Question after question flew until Callie felt dizzy. Finally, a male reporter asked, are you going to let your wife write your exclusives? The color drained from Callie's face. No. Not like this. Tucker jerked his gaze to Callie. What? Why would my wife write my exclusives? Her breath hitched as she held his gaze. I wasn't. You do know she's Jamie Pearson, the famous reporter, don't you? The hurt in Tucker's eyes drowned out everything. Callie felt numb as his face fell and turned into a blank mask. We'll talk about this inside, he said in a low, nearly growling tone. He turned his focus back to the press. I think that's all for the day, everyone. I only got back early this morning. I'm sure you understand. He smiled as he took Callie's hand and waved at the reporters as they stepped inside his home. The second the doors shut, Tucker turned on her, narrowing his eyes. All this time, you've been lying to me? All this time you've been planning on letting me spill my guts so you could put it in some article? I've never been more disgusted with someone in my life. I told you something I've never told another living soul. No one. How could you? I wasn't going to write it. She wiped her eyes, wishing she could stop the tears. Tucker laughed. Right, and I'm supposed to believe that? How was she supposed to convince him? What could she say? He'd never believe anything she said. Not now. She should have told him from the beginning. I wasn't. I care about you, Tucker. I always have. He stepped back, his face now unreadable. We're done. Stacy rushed into the house. Tucker, 
you can't. Tucker turned to Stacy. I'm going upstairs. I want her out of my house by the time I come back down. If she's not gone, I'll get a hotel, but this charade is over. I'm done. I wanted to tell you. Callie reached for him, but he jerked away. The world felt like it was collapsing around her. He had to know that she'd never have betrayed him like that. She'd even begged him not to tell her anything. Didn't he remember that? His lips twisted in a snarl. Right, and Petra never meant to betray me either, right? Emptiness filled Callie. She loved Tucker, and she always had. Even if she hadn't been able to admit it back then, she did. She'd loved him the whole time, and she'd never love anyone like she loved him. He stalked to the stairs and paused. I don't know what hurts worse. The fact that I didn't see it, or that I had feelings for you. Don't ever contact me again. Go ahead, publish your article. Everyone else uses me. Why not you? He took the stairs two at a time and disappeared down the hall. Tears continued to run down her face. I want to go home. You have a contract, Stacy said. You and Derek did too, but apparently no one has to abide by them. So you'll get me a flight home, or I'll. Stacy folded her arms over her chest and leaned back. Or you'll what? It's not like you'll ever trace anything to either of us. You'd be surprised what I can find when I want to. You think those facts in my articles came without a little patience and perseverance? Get me a flight home. Now. Derek is going to sue you until you have nothing left. Please, just let me go home. What point is there with having me stay if he won't have anything to do with me? At least this way, maybe he'll calm down enough that he'll be willing to pretend. She hated talking about him like he wasn't a person, but that was the only language Stacy spoke. Fine, she said, dropping her arms and walking into the kitchen as she put her phone to her ear. Callie felt broken. Her heart was in pieces, and she'd lost her chance to talk to Tucker. Things blew up so fast and furious that it was surreal. Just moments ago, he was kissing her and smiling. What she wouldn't give to go back and tell him the truth. But he'd never trust her again, and she knew it. The hollow feeling grew as she wilted onto the couch. She was going to Carolina Beach and hiding for a while. Chapter 24 Tucker stepped into the elevator at Reckless Records, making sure he was early, just as a way to prove a point to Derek that he'd changed in more ways than one. Derek had summoned him to his office. The man was adamant that Tucker needed to continue with the charade of being fake married to Callie, but Tucker refused. Tucker suspected this was Derek's last-ditch effort to try to manipulate him into continuing the farce. Stacy was supposed to meet him, so he'd wait for her before actually speaking to Derek. The past month, Derek and Stacy spent countless hours handling the ensuing PR nightmare that had blown up since he'd found out Callie was a reporter, a famous one at that. Yawning, he covered his mouth. Despite himself, he'd spent many sleepless nights over the past four weeks, thinking about Callie. Trying to figure out how she'd duped him. He'd gone through every conversation, every look, every detail, trying to find the piece of the puzzle that he could use to avoid falling for something like that again. His heart ached, thinking about her. As much as Petra's betrayal hurt, it was nothing compared to the pain he'd felt since finding out Callie was a reporter who intended to use the next year as a way to get close to him and write tell-alls. The elevator door opened with a ding, startling him out of his thoughts. He stepped off, and his phone buzzed in his pocket. He'd set it to vibrate, knowing he was coming to meet with Derek. He frowned when he saw Will's name pop up on his home screen. Surely Callie told him what happened. If she didn't, he would have seen the news. Tucker ducked into the private bathroom across from Derek's office. Hey, he said as he put the phone to his ear, expecting to get chewed out. Tucker couldn't blame the guy. It wasn't like details of the situation were out. 
In Will's mind, Callie was probably innocent. Hey, um, I have some news about that contract, Will said. I didn't think you'd want to talk to me anymore. Will's laugh was tight. Well, I didn't, but Callie told me to call anyway. What did you find? He didn't want to stir a potential hornet's nest, so he didn't address the fact that Callie asked Will to call. Well, from what I can tell, if it's found that either Derek or your manager leaked anything, the contract is void. The problem is proving it. Tucker sighed. Yeah, he figured as much. Thanks, Will. I appreciate confirmation of what I knew. It was beginning to feel like the world was against him. Hold up. What? I've got you some proof. Stunned, Tucker remained quiet. Will had proof? How? Would it be enough to get him away from Derek and potentially get him out of his marriage to Callie? Callie reached out to a few of her journalist friends. There's a guy in LA that's willing to come forward and say he was given the information about your marriage by Derek Underwood. Apparently, Derek said he'd pay the guy two grand, and when it came time to pay up, he stiffed the reporter $1,500. Callie did that? She loves you, Tucker. From what my wife is telling me, she was going to tell you everything. You two were planning on talking after the press conference, but she was ambushed. She never had any intention of writing those articles, and she knew going into it that she wouldn't. The only reason she went along with the ruse was because Gil, her editor, told her that Petra was in talks to be your wife, and Callie didn't want to give Petra the chance to hurt you again. Tucker covered his mouth with his hand. In talks with Petra. Stacy never mentioned that. Thank you for calling me. His heart pounded, and he was gulping air. You're welcome, Will said and paused. And do me a favor, make this right with Callie. I'm not saying you have to stay married to her, but you owe her the chance to explain herself. You don't, and you'll be dealing with me, Ethan, Denver, Heath, and her dad. Don't put it past Clementine to find her club either. You have my word. I'll fix this. You do that. Will ended the call, and Tucker stared at the phone. His mind was a whirl. Callie wasn't going to do an article on him? Hadn't she nearly pleaded with him the day of her sister's wedding to not tell her anything? But as angry as he'd been since finding out, he'd assumed it was her just trying to act innocent. To play the part so she could get his full trust. But if she never planned on writing a tell-all, then that meant, Tucker squeezed his eyes shut. He'd made a huge, possibly unfixable mistake. He stepped out of the bathroom and immediately heard voices. Stacy's being one of them. When had she arrived? He checked the time on his phone. There was still another ten minutes before she was supposed to meet him. Stacy was never late, but she was never early. Tucker stopped at the door to Derek's office and paused, grateful it was left partially open. They expected him to be late as usual. He turned on the video on his phone to record the conversation. Maybe they would condemn themselves. I thought you wanted them to pretend to be married. He'll never go along with it now that you've outed Callie as Jamie Pearson. I mean, I'm good, but I'm not that good, Stacy said. Okay. At least she was sticking up for him. Their relationship had been pretty strained the past month. Maybe he'd been wrong to question her loyalty. She's not willing to continue this either, a man said. It was a voice he wasn't familiar with. The only reason she did it in the first place was because I told her you were in talks with Petra to play the part of his wife. That got her on board faster than anything. Stacy laughed. I knew that would work the moment I found out who she was. They'd known all along who Callie was. It took a strength Tucker didn't know he had to hold his position outside Derek's office. These people, people he thought he could trust, had played him, and he'd let them. Finding out they dated was the best thing to ever hit my desk, Derek said. 
she's going to give me an exclusive, or she's going to find herself penniless. I'm telling you, she's not going to do it. I've tried everything I know. Right down to telling her the hospital won't get their money. The hospital? Callie wasn't getting paid? That 500000 was going to a hospital. On top of not writing the article, she wasn't going to be paid either? Then what was she getting out of it? Tucker sucked in a lungful of air as he braced his hand against the wall and continued to listen. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Derek, you're going to have to figure out something. This whole thing is a mess. Tucker isn't going to give in this time. He's done with her. Why did you want that to slip anyway? Stacy asked. Derek exhaled. Because where there's drama, there's press. Where there's press, there's exposure, and where there's exposure, there's money. I wanted fans to see the hurt look on his face when he found out. Nothing brings the women or tour ticket sales like a wounded man. His female fans will be lining up to offer him comfort. Are you still planning to let it leak about Petra too? asked Stacy. Maybe. It'll depend on how sorry they are for him. If I think it'll help, sure. I mean, that was the best money I've spent so far, Derek said. You paid Petra, the man who Tucker figured was Gil said. Of course. Tucker was threatening to sign with another record label. I couldn't lose him. I had too many other acts threatening to leave if he jumped ship. The board would have fired me. I had to do something. Stacy's the one who found her, though. Tucker felt like his world was crashing around his feet. Yeah, I found her, along with a few other girls, but I'm not the one continuing to pay her to stay quiet. Eventually, she's going to let it out that you paid her, Stacy said. Derek laughed. But I didn't pay her. She has no idea where the funds come from. Tucker felt gut-punched as he stumbled into the room. You paid Petra to come on to me? To get me to drink so I'd destroy my career, just so I'd stay with Reckless Records? I'd never touched a drop of alcohol until she came around. Stacy jumped. Tucker! I'm just as floored as you are. I just got here and found them talking. Tucker looked at her. Was that before or after you found the girls for me to pick from? Or after you said you knew that Callie and I had dated before? Her face paled, but she tried to recover. I don't know what you're talking about. Darling, it's been a long month. You've had your heart broken. Maybe we should do this meeting another time. There won't be another time. Tucker looked at Derek. My business with you is done. He turned his gaze to Stacy. And you're fired. Then he looked at Gil. I don't know who you are, but if you're hanging around with these two, you can't be much better. I'll make sure Callie learns that you manipulated her too. Derek stammered and quickly found his voice. We have a contract, so our business isn't done. You owe me two years. I've got a year-long tour set up. Tucker turned an icy glare toward Stacy. Six months, huh? We were still negotiating, she said. Not anymore. You don't speak for me, and this contract? It became null and void the moment you leaked information, Derek. Tucker's voice rose. Derek worked his jaw. You can't prove anything. Really? Then you should pay your people the agreed-upon amount next time you do something underhanded. Telling someone you'll pay them two grand and then shorting them isn't the way to make your secrets remain hidden. Derek's jaw dropped. How? Turns out, my wife actually cares about me. Something I should have known and trusted. Why I ever thought I could trust either of you is beyond me. My folks warned me, but I defended you. Somehow Tucker kept himself together, even though he felt like he was falling apart. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have an apology to make. 
I just hope I'm not too late. We'll sue. Stacy yelled as Tucker turned to leave. Tucker raised his phone so they could see their faces on the video screen. This is a video of your conversation. He pushed a few buttons. And that was me sending you the name and number of my lawyer. You have anything to say to me, say it to him first. And with that, Tucker stormed out of the office. When he got to the elevator, he stepped in and inhaled, trying to catch his breath. He was going to find Callie and beg her to forgive him. Beg, plead, whatever he needed to do to get her back. He'd been so stupid. He should have known she'd never betray him like that. She cared about him, and he'd been vicious to her. After the hateful, horrible things he'd said, if she actually took him back, it'd be a miracle. Chapter 25 It's Tucker again, Callie, her mom said as she checked the caller ID on Callie's phone. Tucker had been calling for three days almost nonstop, but Callie didn't want to hear from him. Since flying back to North Carolina, she'd hidden from the world at the home in Carolina Beach. It didn't keep reporters from periodically showing up, but the fact that the beach house was private property made it easier to get the police involved. Callie shook her head. I don't want to talk to him. I know he'll just be upset, and I can't face him right now. Her mom silenced the ringing phone and came to sit next to her. You really do need to talk to him. When we talked that night of George's bachelorette party, you knew he'd be upset when he found out who you were. You can't fault him for being upset. Now that he's had a chance to calm down, maybe there's a chance. No, I lied to him, and he's never going to trust me again. Callie squeezed the pillow she sat holding against her chest a little harder. Her mom patted her hand. Perhaps you should read a little news? Turn on the TV and see what's going on? Another thing she'd avoided since arriving in Carolina Beach. She'd made a conscious effort not to watch anything or visit any type of social media. It didn't help her aching heart, but reading anything about Tucker just yet wasn't something she could stomach. She loved him, and that wasn't stopping anytime soon. Well, you're getting out of this house tonight. She looked at her phone. It's three in the afternoon, and you've been in those same pajamas for two days. It's time for a little fresh air. Mom, no. Until this whole thing blows over, I'm sitting here and hiding. I don't want to leave the house. I won't. Her mom lifted one eyebrow, and Callie knew her time on the couch had come to an end. You are coming with me and your sisters tonight, and that's final. I know you're trying to help, but please, mom, don't. I don't want to go anywhere. Tears pooled in her eyes. Please don't make me. Her mom twisted in her seat and held Callie's face in her hands. Sweetheart, staying in this house isn't going to help you get over Tucker. You loved him, and it's going to take a while for that heartache to ease into something manageable. You need to get out for a bit. Just come tonight. Please, I'm asking you to just come with us. Callie held her mom's gaze. All right, but if I go, I get to hide for a while longer without getting grief. If that's the only way I can get you out of this house, I'll take it. Her mom dropped her hands from Callie's face. Have you spoken to your editor again? No, after the last conversation, I told him he could speak to dad. Well, I said lawyer. Gil didn't need to know it was dad. Her mom nodded. Wasn't the contract void the moment it came out that the reporter was given the information by that record label executive? Yeah, but Gil isn't known for his willingness to give up. He's the reason I was able to do exclusives on some of the hardest celebrities and politicians to nail down. He doesn't take no for an answer. Pushing off the couch, her mom stood. Well, when your dad gets done with him, he'll have an education on what the word means for sure. She smiled. Now, you need to get a shower and start getting ready. I'm not saying makeup is required, but the place we're going doesn't allow bathrobes. 
Callie exhaled heavily and took her mom's hand, letting the woman pull her to her feet. Fine. I'll go get ready. I don't understand why you're being so pushy today. Cause it's time. Reluctantly, Callie did as her mom requested. She showered, dressed, and even put on a little mascara just to surprise her mom. Not knowing where they were going, she'd put on a simple sundress and a jean jacket with a pair of sandals. Wherever they went, she wouldn't stand out too bad. Her sisters would meet them in Wilmington, so she and her mom loaded into the car and spent the next hour keeping the chat light and away from anything Tucker-related. Even the thought of his name caused tears to spring to her eyes. Once they reached Wilmington, they met up with her sisters at a small cafe. When they entered, Callie immediately noticed the small stage and smiled. It reminded her of several of the little bars back in Nashville. The kind that welcomed new talent to sing. Just like the one where she'd first heard Tucker sing. Her heart squeezed at the thought, and it took a lot of effort to keep it from showing on her face. A waiter came to the table and took their order, and Callie allowed her gaze to roam over the place. It had such a warm and cozy feel. The place felt intimate, and she could imagine a newcomer sitting on the stool, pouring his heart out and hoping to find a welcoming audience. Their drinks arrived just as a man took the stage. We have a super treat for you folks tonight. Singing? Well, as long it wasn't. Before she could complete the thought, Tucker stepped onto the stage and immediately locked gazes with her. No she said breathlessly. Mom, you didn't. Just listen. Callie felt sick. She didn't want to hear a song about how she'd broken his heart. As she started to bolt, her sisters held her in place. Tucker strummed his guitar and began to sing. Just when I'd given up finding love that gave unselfishly. You walked back into my life and breathed hope into me. I found you, and everything changed. Slowly, Callie stopped trying to break free and listened to the words. You are my star, my lighthouse at sea, when the world is crashing around me. Tucker slipped off the stool, and still singing, he walked to her and stopped, pushing his guitar behind his back and finishing the song a cappella. I promise to love you, hold you, and never let you go. Hi, he said after he'd finished. Callie felt winded. Hi. Her heart was hammering against her ribs, and she could barely hear him above the whoosh of blood in her ears. I've needed to talk to you, but you won't answer your phone. I wasn't taking any calls. He smiled. Yeah, I could tell. You mind if we talk now? No. Slipping his guitar off, he handed it to Vivian and took Callie's hand. He led her to a quiet spot in the back of the cafe. She cast her gaze to the floor. She needed to make him understand just how sorry she was. Tucker, what I did was look out for me, be there for me, and think of me as a person when everyone around me didn't. Even when you knew I wanted nothing to do with you, you were still looking out for me, and for that, I'm so grateful. She lifted her gaze. Was she hearing him right? I was stupid. I should have known you were telling the truth. I should have trusted you. I'm so sorry for all the horrible things I said. For the way I treated you. His shoulders sagged. I love you, and I'm probably too late at this point, but I do. I've loved you since I was nobody. I was just too blind to see it. Too focused on the things that don't matter. But you matter. You're all the matters to me. You love me? With all of my heart, and if you'll find it in yours to forgive me, I'd really like to be your husband again. Callie couldn't believe what she was hearing. I didn't want to lie. I didn't, but they were going to have you marry Petra. I couldn't let her near you again. Not after what she did. I was never going to write any articles. Never. I know. I know all of it. You do? Haven't you been watching the news, 
Callie? She shook her head. I couldn't handle seeing anything about you. Derek and Stacy are going to jail for fraud. Harris has been voted back in as the new president, and that tour they planned has been postponed until I can talk my wife into coming with me. Tears pooled in her eyes, and she smiled. You want me with you? Haven't you been listening? You're the only reason I have to sing. If you aren't there, there's no point for me. All this time, I've been wondering what's missing in my life, and it's always been you. I should have never let my manager convince me otherwise. I love you, Mrs. Callie Hawk. I love you too. I always have. Even back then, I was head over heels for you. So, does that mean I'll bring my wife along for the tour? She grinned and nodded. Yeah. She threw her arms around his neck, and he stumbled back. As long as my husband needs me, I'm there. I'll always need you, he said. When he touched his lips to hers, it was as if time stood still. After the last month of thinking he hated her, having him in her arms was the best feeling in the world. He wrapped one arm around her while he buried his other hand in her hair and deepened the kiss. Time and place disappeared as they continued to kiss, trying to make up for the last month they'd been apart. Finally, Tucker pulled back, and gasping for air, he smiled. I've missed you, Mrs. Hawk. I missed you too. Tucker released her and dropped to one knee, holding up the ring she'd taken off before she left his home. Will you marry me? Again? Will there be an Elvis involved? Only if you want him. I only want you, she said, and he slipped the ring on her finger. I love you. I love you too. They walked back to the dining area, and the crowd cheered. Her sisters clapped and smiled. They'd gotten her good, and she couldn't imagine feeling more grateful that they'd made her leave the house. Epilogue Six months later Callie smoothed down the white satin of her dress. Tucker was serious about getting married again. This time, they'd have their families and friends present. She couldn't deny she'd missed that part. Not that she wanted anything fancy, and she'd made sure to keep things simple this time too. A cheap Vegas wedding had been a bit simple even for her, though. So much had happened in the last six months. Stacy took a plea deal and testified against Derek. He'd spend the next few years in jail. While Stacy was free, she was on probation and forbidden to work as a manager again. Gil, well, Gil was taken to task by her fantastic lawyer. His reputation took a hit, and the magazine fired him. She was now working for Parker James, and he didn't call her before seven and expect her to function without coffee. He didn't prey on people's private lives either, which meant more than anything. You ready, sweetheart? Her dad said as he stopped next to her. Any minute, the march would begin to play, and she'd walk toward the man she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. She peeked through the windows, loving the splashes of yellow lilies everywhere. Her sisters were all wearing simple dresses, and her mom hadn't gone overboard with the activities. Of course, there'd been the talent contest, and this year Mary performed all on her own. She was wonderful and won again. The confidence boost from the previous talent show had carried through to other things, and according to Ethan and Vivian, she was excelling in school. Callie's sisters rushed up and fussed with her dress, veil, and hair one last time until her mom stopped them. They lined up in front of her, the doors opened, and Tucker came into view. One look, and she knew there'd never be a time he didn't take her breath away. With every step forward, her heart swelled, and her life never felt more right. Tucker was the man she was going to spend the rest of her life with him. She was certain that after everything they'd been through, they could overcome anything life threw at them. This has been Marrying the Star. Written by Bree Livingston. Copyright 2018.